All right. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see. We've got just making sure I've got everything up. <clears throat> good morning, Kathy. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> I'm good. How about yourself? Good. Yeah. Everything a little, good. little chilly, a little chilly, but that's it, how it, it is, is right now, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. I we went, we tried to go for a walk this morning, and she went outside and decided she just wanted to sit in the grass in the sun. I was like, I'm with you, except I don't want to sit in the grass, you know. So I just yeah. went and got coffee and sat outside. I was like, okay, uh huh. You know, and I'm just there. Yeah, and my whole thing mm -hmm. is like the the longer you take chilling, the shorter the walk. So feel free to. <laughs> you, know, like, you know take it yeah. i don't because i don't i don't i didn't necessarily want to go on a walk this morning either so uh-huh but <clears throat> you know it's good though we're good everything's good oh, we might yeah. have some um we might have a couple of people jump into class that are uh um that aren't taking the uh the exam this weekend but uh oh, but okay. might because be, i've got like some of the classes are staggered so if somebody comes uh -huh. in i don't think we're I don't think I don't think you know, but I don't think anyone's really going to do that. But we might have a couple of people say, "Wait, I don't have the same page because not everybody mm -hmm. has the same book." And it's like I know, and I I don't have a problem because all the books are pretty covered on what what needs to be covered. But um, mm -hmm. we're we specifically are covering the book we're working on. <clears throat> so, right. but no, it's you all know good. what was funny? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at the beginning of when I first started class, um, I probably I got I think it was three sets until I got my right set. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah because um i actually enrolled um, i don't know if you'd be able to see on your end but um i mm -hmm. actually enrolled back um i believe it was in december and then pam butman i'm mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you know who she is um she sent me the books or they sent me the books and then so i was just kind of like looking at it and i, I was like you know what i'm gonna hold off taking the classes during the holidays right. and wait till after the holidays and then um so i was just looking through the books and then and then I, I remember at the beginning of the class and I said, oh, I think I still have the, same, the wrong books. Yeah. And then they sent me another set of books. And by the time the fourth one I got, the set was the one that I, that was for our class. <laughs> because wow. they, all, they all look the same. You know, it all yeah. looks the same, but you wouldn't know until you're actually doing the courses. Yeah. And then you were going over the reviews. And then I was like, uh, yeah, I think I need to say something because I think there's other students that were in our class too that had the same problem. Because you know there's virtual and then you do it on your own independent yeah, setting direct and yeah then, so uh -huh. now you know what i mean by like there's more mm -hmm. than one set and then also mm -hmm. um because legislation just changed uh -huh. um so you uh and oh and that's another thing is there's more than one platform oh okay so, and then i know when you go over your slides some of your yeah. slides you yeah, know, the you, you, you do it by by accident. It's like, okay, so this is on 270, or you know, and we're like, huh, we're wait, we're on 140. <laughs> you oh, know, no. but it's, yeah, but it's the because last you're book? it's from another um course, like independent right. and studies I didn't even, or something else. I haven't else. gotten, mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm this is me recording on a different, but I don't even have the most recent set of books. That's why when sometimes I'm like, uh, uh, you know, okay. or you guys go, oh, it's on this uh -huh. page, I'm all, uh huh. Okay, the last class told me it's on this page because the class prior uh -huh. to yours is the class that mm -hmm. I um was told they had a new set, and I was like, okay, the outlines uh, are are based uh, on mm -hmm. legislation and law and like just regular mm -hmm. curriculum, and because I've been a teacher uh, and it, I've done real estate and teaching like parallel to each other, if you know what I mean. Like mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. either a side I, my side hustle, hustle was either teaching or my side hustle was real estate, but I always kind of did them. So I mm -hmm. always have always worked for a school where the curriculum is slightly off. I don't know if that makes it maybe all oh, schools are that way. Okay. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. what'll happen is you'll take over from another instructor and they'll have outlines or they'll have like the syllabus. And I'm like, wait, this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is on uh the second edition and we're on the 10th edition. And then I'll re-review uh -huh. and go, oh, okay. So there's only like four things that have been changed. And so I'll go through and change those four things and then everything will be kosher. And then the new most recent edition, I'll peruse the most recent edition of the book and then I'll go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've had students in college at other colleges, students I've had like in preschool, junior high, high school, and now I call mm -hmm. call me and they're like, I can't believe these guys, they like have the wrong page. I'm like, oh, and then I explain to them about the whole curriculum thing when the new editions come out, they might tweak something or they might delete a whole section that's no longer viable. And then it mm -hmm. totally takes out like 40 pages. And they're like, oh, so the the teacher's not being lazy. I'm like, well. You could say they're being lazy, but if they're like me, they haven't received the books yet. So they don't even know. Mm -hmm. So as an they instructor, no, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and as an instructor, I, this contractual law, the state of California, mm -hmm. our state doesn't change very much. 
And when mm -hmm. they do change it, that's highlighted. But all of these prerequisite courses are are fundamental for um, um, for this for this um, area. So the historical stuff, the 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 um, marked um, lawsuits that are like have changed the law. Those kind of things are never going to change because those are the those are the fundamentals. So I know we're good on that. But I really mm -hmm. want the outlines um, to mirror the pages you guys are on because mm -hmm. you're the one that's, that's what we need to know. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I, um, I've been with them for a year and a half, and I have a set of books that came in mm -hmm. in July mm -hmm. of last year, and I don't have the most recent version. Oh, and that's another thing. There's more than one one platform too. So uh, I have, um, yeah, and and so you'll. I got an email that said any of the students that have signed up in January have the new platform. Any of the students uh -huh. prior to that have the old platform, and they or they could have the new platform. But not everything's completely transitioned over. And and it sounds kind of um, backwards, but when you're uh -huh. a, a company that does instruction across the nation, you, uh -huh. like you could, it's we're talking um, six or seven figures in students. You know what I mean? So oh, then you're yeah. like, oh, because there's it's from everywhere, from all yeah. of your courses, your yeah. in, the internet, your virtual studies, and all different ones. Yeah. So then you have the human element, which is, I logged into the wrong. I'm. This doesn't look right. I've logged, and then they're calling customer service, mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, customer service. We're just gonna let you know there are more. There's more than one platform. There's more than one company, and all the companies are going are are now being transition together but prior to last year there was four real estate mm -hmm. companies in california that were online and they were all owned by the company and now they're uh, um they're uh -huh. yeah they're migrating them as they go and so there were points in time when i'd get an email because i've done curriculum which is hey um uh -huh. give us give us kind of a, a feedback on this or on that and i've been very much a clanging symbol like i don't not like i don't have a student mm -hmm. um, platform account i don't have this information it would be amazing if you would get if you guys would send it so then they sent us the new one that's being launched which is awesome mm -hmm. so we we have it per se but we don't it doesn't look like what yours looks like it shows us like hey this was last week's or um last month's training or what's going to happen next year you know so there'll be like little oh snippets it's different uh -huh. yeah so then mm -hmm. if i show that to you you guys are going to be like wait a minute what's changing what is that? Like, <laughs> yeah. and so i looked at that on tuesday evening and i was all Oh, this isn't going to help me instruct them. But the email from the hierarchy or administration is like, oh, hey, guys, this is what's happening new. And this is the direction we're going. So you'll be able to share it with the students. They don't mean literally. They mean, mm -hmm. hey, guys, we've got some new stuff coming down. So if you see a change on your platform or if you see this mm -hmm. or you see that. So um, and like then a I, heads up. Yeah. And then I received uh -huh. a message saying, uh, don't, don't forget to see the recordings. Well, I have because I'm taking my broker's course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a student portal for that, but it's the mm -hmm. old one and it's not oh. the one that you guys have. And so, and because uh -huh. I've been with them for 20 some odd years as a student, uh -huh. like with my continued education and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I received a message saying, Hey, I noticed you didn't check out the recording and I go log in. It's not in there. And then I was like, Hey, I wonder if that recording's under the new platform that was just launched. And sure enough. So now I have two it accounts. Was and, oh. and and yeah so i'm just like oh my gosh and but, then it gets confusing for you too because you have to go with the new one with the old one and then you have students with the old and the new and you have you know it's, yeah. it's a lot of work <laughs> well and and then on top of that i've had a couple students message me i have a couple students that said here i'll let me read mm -hmm. i was going to read it at nine and i, I can read it then. Oh, okay. well how about mm -hmm. well basically like the questions are exactly the same as the outline or at, at the unit reviews, I'm like, okay, I don't mind telling because they've I've actually gotten a couple of messages from people saying I just bit the bullet and I I just took the test. I'm like, okay, and they're like, I got 91. percent I'm like, okay, cool, good, congratulations, that's awesome. And not not because I didn't expect it, but um, if if the unit reviews have been reviewed and stuff, but this first book is always the one where mm -hmm. it's oh because you're and, barely learning how to well yeah to experience grasp the whole concept concept of the real estate. I mean, unless you've already had it. You know, yeah. if you've taken courses through it, then you wouldn't know. No, yeah. So I'm just, I'm like, okay, cool. But I, the, again, it's not a situation like we can't um, review stuff. It's just I know mm -hmm. that once you guys take the first book exam, mm -hmm. you're you're cooking. You're gonna be fine because then it's like, oh, now I know what to expect in the next two books. Yeah, and then everything's smooth. It's just that this first one's always a bit of a um, um, a hiccup. Although I will say that I've that we've never been this far behind on um on just doing like light review for the units but if you guys have questions i'll answer them because i don't want to 
um, miss out on that. And that's the hiccup that with training, it's like, do you stop and, and answer the questions and then get behind or what you feel like is behind or do you answer the questions and then the students feel good about moving forward. And there's that that middle ground and I'm like, well, I don't know what the middle ground is. I want you guys to know from the book what is expected. Um, mm -hmm. I can instruct um, on like standard outlines on um, there's other stuff out there that um, that we could be using where it's like, OK, we're going to talk about all of these different um, lawsuits. But if the lawsuits are not in the book exam mm -hmm. and the lawsuits are not in the book, it, it, other than just to state there was a lawsuit or mm -hmm. you know, I don't I don't it's not that I don't want to do that stuff with you, but I I feel like it's better for us to just try to hit as much focus as we on the book. Mostly. Yeah, and then after that could be kind of extra tips yeah, if or we extra ever get that. that you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, if we could ever get there. And so it's like, um, so I can understand from the training perspective, they're like, no, people, and I've had people uh, um, come to me and go, I took the classes with some other instructors. I'm like, well, I try to stick with the book because that's what you have in front of you when I'm not around. Mm -hmm. And when I first started instructing, mm -hmm. it was a weekend. So uh, they were weekend mm -hmm. classes only. And there's mm -hmm. no customer service. So if people couldn't log in or whatever. So the whole Google Drive, the oh, Google wow. voice number, all of this other uh -huh. stuff was built around the needs that, that were bring, being presented. And, uh -huh. um, you know, because there's no, if you think about it, and I mean, that's why when Mark, I don't know. If, yeah, no, you were here. On yeah, Tuesday I was night. there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that's why Mark was one of the weekend classes. He was the only class mm -hmm. that I mm -hmm. ever couldn't get back in. So they had, I had already told them, hey, if there's any problems, you guys can always call me on my phone. Um, and we'll figure it out. I don't want you to feel like you're missing out in any way or whatever. And he, and when he called, I was like, you guys, my internet spectrum saying that they're, they're apologizing for the rain. And, and this was last year at some point, mm -hmm. um, I think it was like June or July or something, August, September, October. He said, June, uh -huh. July, I think it was Ju August and we had weird rain in LA and it was like mm -hmm. this weird storm. And then spectrum was like, oh, well, we're going to blame the rain. I'm like, you can't blame the rain if, if all of your equipment is waterproof the rest of the year, like what, you know, anyway, so it was real frustrating mm -hmm. on my part. Cause this, oh, all yeah, my plus you were doing the zoom in that, that <laughs> time. So yeah. it was like difficult. <laughs> so that day was that week was the toughest and the, and the, the prior class, cause we had consecutive Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, uh -huh. um, spectrum started acting up. And so I got on the phone with hotline cause there, I have a hotline as instructor. So I don't, just so you guys, you know, and like everybody else in class knows, and they'll, they'll know eventually when they jump in, but we don't for to protect you. We have no, we have no way of contacting you. You have to contact us through either the Calibri mm -hmm. emails or um, through like all the Google stuff that I sent you guys. That's the only uh -huh. contact I don't have any way of seeing. So when I have students message me going, Hey, I'm having an attendance at issue. It's like, you've got to call customer service. Cause really I'm your I'm the voice for the class, but I'm, that's all, mm -hmm. that's all, that's all. Uh, yeah, but it's a protection mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it's a oh, protection yeah. for the students and for um, you and the student. Yeah. And then LACC, mm -hmm. even the, the local uh, community, um, LACCD, even they have, um, uh, well, I mean, it's the same in, it's the same across all educational uh, fronts, if you will. Uh -huh. So they, uh -huh. so you can, unless a student reaches out, we are completely, locked out of that information and so whether it's uh it, it really is here's the book this is what i'd like to know if you guys can you know surmise uh i need you to try to retain as much of the vocabulary and i was wanting i mean if i could have kept mark on a lot longer i felt so bad though but he had let me know on sunday he's like okay my commute's an hour from 6 30 to 7 30 i'll get home by 7 30 and i can be in i'm like okay if if because I knew the weather and stuff. I was like, if that doesn't mm -hmm. work for you. Mm -hmm. And he, he texted me after, and he texted me a picture of dinner. So he ate dinner after he met with us, but if I oh, could have uh -huh. asked him more, like more, but I like, I had, I knew I had that knowing in the background, which was, I know that the guy uh, not only put in a full day, but he was, you know, like doing what he Just could to be there. Off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but he's not the only one we're, but we're going to try to get a few other of the students to come in. And, and also I, if I mean you guys talk to Mark and I, I've I've had a really I've only known Mark since July but he's mm -hmm. wonderful and he was mm -hmm. sharing um on Sunday when it was just the two of us on the phone how if his agent hadn't been so cool he oh, wouldn't uh -huh. have reached out to him and I, the fact that that mm -hmm. that agent is literally going to mentor him every um mm -hmm. sale. Uh, or yeah, help yeah, him. but and then just process meet of once being a, a real week. estate agent. Yeah, like oh, yes. that is uh -huh. not normal. I heard him mention that, uh -huh. and I was all, "Oh my gosh, that is so cool." Okay, mm -hmm. well, if that's what he's gonna like know, mentor him, 
yeah. she's going to mentor him through the whole process in the meantime till he gets the concept of doing it on his own in other and, words right yeah and that's not that's mm -hmm. rare now don't get me wrong it could be mm -hmm. that he works for a company where this is how they do things and so part of um what mark gets paid will go like the commission split will, will it'll be split between the two agents because he's shadowing this other agent but uh -huh. the reality of the situation is the smooth process the smooth transition um that we, he will be going through in order to um do this with a seasoned veteran is worth to me on this side of things it's worth the commission um oh, it yeah. might not be to everybody but i'm 48 mm -hmm. and i'm very much mm -hmm. so like please show me how to do this i mm -hmm. i don't want i don't want to to feel like i'm failing at this age i i mean don't get me wrong i do fail i like i do make mistakes but whatever like we mm -hmm. we have to move not whatever in a bad way like try not to hold on to that part try holding on holding mm -hmm. on to the part where we're going to keep moving forward and stuff and so um i like i really like the idea that this this gentleman but he also is saying hey I'll give you an hour on Friday every week so we can kind of like go over where we are, but he's mm -hmm. not um, in the open houses or whatever, but he's not. Um, but he also said something that was very key. He said um, when he went to talk to the agent, the agent's like, once you get your license, come and talk to me. And that's mm -hmm. standard across the board. You're not going to mm -hmm. hear people say, um, oh, yeah, I'll come and I'll walk with you through the educational process and I'll do this and I'll do that because the majority of people are like, uh there's so many people have asked how they've become successful and don't see all the steps have that have to get to that point and it's like if you can get through these steps to get to this point i'll help you from this point forward but if you aren't willing to do this stuff on your own then and so um um i appreciated that he shared that his um th that this broker or this agent i'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's a broker it might just be an agent mm -hmm. it doesn't matter the company that he he went with for himself uh -huh. yeah basically was like yeah get your license come and talk to me and then 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 actually did talk to him and didn't just um you know like completely lose um go oh well you know well this commission i'll see you at, at the meetings like literally got him into he's in the association uh -huh. meaning he's already got his membership with the association they've already gone to association meetings like he's mark um, did. i'm sorry you're talking about mark yeah, what Mark oh, got his uh -huh. license, uh -huh. and then he he's already a realtor. He doesn't. What I mean by mm -hmm. that, he's already paid his membership. He hasn't um, sold any properties yet. But like that other agent was like, okay, now this is this next step, and this is the next step. And I was uh -huh. like, Ooh, I like the fact that he's working with someone that's like, okay, if you're serious, you've got this is the next step. And and Mark has like really gone, okay, this is the next step. This is what I'm doing. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna. Yeah, it's great you know, to have someone that can actually like help you through the process at the beginning because it's like hard to do it on your own <laughs> you know oh absolutely and the thing is all i usually hear is hey i interviewed at this brokerage and like the agents there are not willing to have anyone shadow them and so i just don't know what i'm gonna do i'm like you find a broker that will give that you will. what you need or, yeah why, right why are, uh -huh. you, know, why are you, you staying with to... that one yeah mm -hmm. no and that, that's mm -hmm. my thing too it's like oh well that's one of the bigger names in town i'm like they aren't going to stay a big name if you as a can't even get in as an agent you uh -huh. know like there's there's this uh, stuff i had a um a cousin that worked for one company that was like a bigger name in town for a very short period of time and and i asked what was going on and she said well i walked in and i brought clients with me um but they anytime there was any this is a long time ago but anytime mm -hmm. there were any people that walked in the door interested in working with a realtor mm -hmm. they they were given to the boss or they were given to like the boss's um uh, the person the boss um wanted to work uh, wanted to get them only so it was basically fam i'll just say it's family so it only went to anybody that was in the family that was there and if they weren't in the office they would have that person come in to interview instead of use the people that were there and so she was like, it's cool to have the name. Like I have this name, but the reality of the situation is the, the broker isn't here to build the wealth outside of his family. And so she was really mm -hmm. disappointed with that. So I'm like, well, you know, if that stuff happens, like, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll figure it out as you know, time progresses or whatever. But, um, she eventually went to another, um, large school or large real estate, um, company name. And that, that mm -hmm. real estate company actually, um, is not it's around but it's really only fam with the family because there's family nobody only. yeah uh -huh. because people don't want to work with them because they've they've already proven that they're not going to give the um give any of the walk-ins and let me tell you something somebody walks into a real estate office um they're not like um 
it's rare for them to walk in. Like most real estate offices, when somebody walks in the door, uh, they're walking in because they're walking out of another real estate office that they're unhappy with. So they have to ask a lot of questions like, okay, so what brings you here today? And what's the experience um, that you've had in the past? So you can kind of figure out if they're like, well, I just fired the other guy because he didn't do what I wanted to do. You're like, oh, are you in contract? Like what's, you know, you're trying to like Mm -hmm. iron through or work through like whatever those uh, concerns or worries are. And so it's like, okay. Um, but, um, yeah, so, but we're in a different era. We're in 2022. I don't know why I have to mm-hmm. let you guys in. I'm sorry. Um, two people entered w- in the waiting room. Cool. Hi, Kathy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How are you? I have a quick question. Of course. How, um, how similar are the uh, quizzes that we have in our portal compared to the te- uh, open book test that we're going to do? Well, I just happened to have an email from somebody in your class. Hold on just a second. Can you send me the link for the Google Drive? No, yeah, I will send on. Jasmine. Hold on. Let me, um, I've got a text message from a student that took it yesterday. And the, I will read verbatim what it says, but she basically said, she said they're like practically the same questions in the, um, in, um, the unit reviews as they are in the open book. I'm like, okay. Oh, so the unit reviews are in the back of each... Uh, in the back of each uh, unit. Yeah. Okay. And I was I went through yesterday while between um, um, between uh, meetings and some of the office meetings. I was supposed to not be doing stuff, but I kind of was doing stuff because I was just waiting. But I also did the um, what is it called? I did all of the, I went back in and did all of the outlines for the, uh, that were missing or all of the unit reviews that were missing um, on uh, the principal's class yesterday. And then I turned them also into PDF so you can just flip them versus them being in PowerPoint. They were in PowerPoint as a, as a backup um, for a second set, if that makes any sense. So we have those in there. Um, you do, you guys do have the Quizlets, but I don't have the, I've got a couple people, hold on a second. Let me just finish this. I have a couple of people asking for the Zoom. And let me make sure I have it copied on my phone so that I can do this because I, there. Um, but we have pretty much everything that, I don't know if it's everything, but. So that you can go to the book, you can go to the uh, unit reviews on the Google Drive. I'm gonna check and see if anyone else is asking. No, I think that was the only student. I only had one student that was asking or two students. Okay, let me go into the into the into my text messages. The questions are just like the ones in the practice quizzes on portal and in the back of the book. So it sounds like there's a little bit of each. So your student platform has um, some quizzes you guys can review too. But that I thought I had more more text messages. Has has anybody in our class already done the, the uh, open book test? Yeah, the student. I passed the test 90%. Thank you. You're awesome. I didn't mean to read that part. And then the other thing was so happy. Uh, three more counting the state exam, going to focus on one at a time, prayer hands, dancing lady. Thank you. And then the last one, which was um, the one I read you. So it was three text messages in a row. There, the Google Drive, uh, or sorry, the Google Voice doesn't. I thought that we would have it. It's stuck together. Um, the questions are just like the ones on practice quizzes on Portal and back of book. So, sh- this this particular student is saying that it's be, it's the it, it's a little bit of both. But um, I to- was told by previous students that it's it's really the ones at the end of the unit. So it is it is possible they mix between the two. Um, for this for 2023 but this is um, a student that was in class with you that that decided just take the book see if they could pass which I thought was cool thank you yeah no of course I mean hey we're only as good as our our weakest link and at this moment I'm the weakest link so um, and I being the the instructor on this side of things I don't get to see anything that you guys are going through or any of the uh, like I can only go off of what you guys have shared like this is what I'm seeing or this is what I'm hearing I apologize, someone was talking and I was tiptoeing over that. Can we go over some of the reviews? 
Sure, let's do that. Let's, um, we can, do, would you guys, would you guys prefer to power through the reviews? What would you guys rather do? Power through the reviews or work on the last few unit outlines? What sounds best? Let's do the outlines for the chapters. Okay. Okay, perfect. Let's do that then. All right, let me let me stop sharing so that I can start sharing. I don't know. I I I'm not so powerful with the, the zooms that I know how to like switch screens. I just have to stop and then start again. We're not trying to cancel Zoom. Okay. So we we might have people jumping in and out because the this is open up um, to everybody that's in the that's in any of the classes so that if they have any questions they can ask them and we can just put them on the list. Yeah, uh, Carlos, we actually had somebody that did take the, the exam and um, the message was that the questions are just like the ones on the practice quizzes on the portal and the back of the book. Two dancing ladies and a pair of champagne glasses. <laughs> There's, I didn't read the, all of the little um, things um, that go with the text messages. All right, so we should be, hold on just a moment. Let me move this. We should be messing around or not messing around, but we should be, okay, 17. We should be on slide of 17. Oh, that's a really good question. So you should have received um, and not just an invite to take the final exam. You should have either received there's so there was something Stacy and I were talking about a few different things um, at the beginning at the earlier when class when I first walked in or we first walked in. And um, one of the things I said was depending upon what student because there's more than one portal to get through to the um, through to the classes, you actually might have a different platform than other people just in the same way you might have not you might have had a different book than other students um or you might have a different edition or something along, along those lines so in the past students were contacted in two different ways one is you log into your account and you can see that it that um the account is open for you to go take the exam um under the section that says principles and then the other way was um that there were students telling me not all of them but there were students that were telling me that they were receiving um emails confirming that the that the um account was open for them or the exam was open for them to take um the student that texted me actually let me text her back and um 949 where are you let me text her back and ask how she how she received it, because that way you would know in real time. Session and her students asked uh, if you received an email or logged into your account to um, take exam question mark okay and I'll leave that and what I'll do is I'll put my alert on for this and then once she answers back I'll um I'll have the oh Avery's here um I'll I'll have as soon as I have that answer from her we'll hear it ring and then once I don't have the answer from her we'll um we'll or sorry once we get the answer from her then I'll put my phone on silent and then we'll just do breaks we'll do five to ten minute breaks at the at the beginning of each of the hours so that we can power through all right um oh, okay so there is a click to, la to launch into the exam okay now if any of you do not receive uh that that launch click or like some type of uh there's like a launch um button or something on your student account or an email please get on the phone with customer service now this is where things get tough if for whatever reason customer service comes back and goes hey we don't see that you have the attendance um, that is needed that's fine to say i know that i had the attendance i want to go student directed or independent study from this point forward with this class and they'll extend your class for like 18 days if you are in, are one of the people in that position keep coming to classes we'll keep doing the live sessions in the evening and then i'll make appointments with you to uh to work with you uh with regard to um um 
Well, with regard to what it is that how to your expectations or, or training or, or anything that is needed so that you'll feel good within the 18 days to take, continue to take that exam and answer questions and stuff. Um, some students have, um, some of my students have classes where the final exam can be taken multiple times and every time you take it and you miss, you miss a question or two, I want you to put that and set that aside. Um, if you're taking that open book exam, I want you to take, if there's a question about one of the questions you're not sure you got right, just take a picture of it. Um, and um, then when it's all said and done, go back in the book and review those questions, because those are the questions, if you're not remembering them um, at this point after 30 days of, 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 deal, of studying for 12 hours a week, you know, if you will, that's just with me not including your time. Um, that means that's the stuff that's going to be the first to go. So I want you to take pictures of any of the questions that you are struggling with and then go back in and review those. Those also will help you um, uh, retain not only that information, you might even retain that more than the stuff that you've been reviewing. Um, but um, when it's all said and done and you pass, um, you'll be able to go back and go, oh, I was right on target with that question. I was right on target with that question. And if you don't pass, then you know those are the ones for sure, for sure that you need to um, be um, studying for the next time you take it. Um, but the student that took it yesterday, um, let me know that was the first time they took it and they just did it to see how they would do and they got a 90%. But I think that like Mark said on Tuesday night, having that open book exam opportunity, knowing that the book can be open and what was the one kicker he said, he's like, he almost didn't pass because he was being so casual with reviewing the book to make sure he got the answers right that he started having to speed up at the end. So I'm not saying you should do that or you shouldn't do that. I'm just letting you know that I thought that was a really cool, I never even thought uh, to say, you know, how did you feel about timing or any of that other stuff? All, all the questions you guys were asking Tuesday night, I really felt not only uh, were beneficial um, for everyone in the class um, and then those that are watching the recordings after, but I think it was also beneficial for Mark to see that um, um, his experience was is important and, and, and what he got out of the classes like you guys have. Um, all right, cool, cool, cool. So let's jump into it. Um, we are on uh, page, we should be on to page 208. Um, let's see, we have principles of competition is another one of the um, economic principles. So we've been talking about, and we started talking about this, but we were talking about um, appraisal. So basically this is just kind of that, that part where we'll be reviewing how appraisals work, why they work. And there's a lot of this deep dive stuff. And you're like, Kathy, I don't know that any of this information is important. Um, it's the fundamentals. So what are we doing? We are, we are pressing the soil, if you will, um, down so that the foundation can be poured on a, a firm foundation. And that's, uh, or on a, on the soil that isn't going to be um, shifting, like on the Strasburger lawsuit, right? So we're, we're doing some of these things that are more infrastructure than they are visually going to be aesthetically pleasing, but the aesthetically pleasing side of real estate is you being the licensed agent and doing your business and, and knowing that you, you have this, um, as you, the inf infrastructure under you. You're not feeling like you're going to waver or that there's a problem or a concern. You know, you can go to your broker. Um, you know that you can uh, be completely honest with your clients and that you work in an environment where um, you're, you're not cutting your eye teeth on the mistakes. Cause that's all I ever heard. You're all, you'll cut your eye teeth on the mistakes. Just, just figure it out. It'll be okay. Whereas um, the industry isn't like it was say in the eighties or the nineties um, in the eighties and the nineties. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Um, it, it, in the 80s and the 90s, the um, uh, it was the buyer should beware on what they bought. It wasn't the agent that needed to beware. That's why when I talk to you about working with a seasoned agent, I would prefer that the broker you work with has been in the industry for more than 10 years, that they actually did go through the crash of um, the industry. Uh, and part of the reason for that is they they knew what it was like then. They knew they knew what it was like getting out of it. And now they they felt the last five or six years where the market has pretty much been, you can sell anything to anyone. And now we're on this side of 2000, uh, on, on this side of the pandemic in 2023. And it's more of a, sellers might have houses. And yes, those houses were selling for a lot more money, but they're not necessarily selling for as much money now. Um, um, okay, so she's gonna check um, her account to see uh, um, if she, she doesn't, and she's like, I don't know, I think I clicked on something. So I'm like, just go check. So she, that, that's the student that already took the class that got the 90% and said, it's basically the exact same questions from the end of the unit, um, the units. And there were, there were some from the, the platform quizzes, um, questions as well. 
Um, if you'll note, and maybe you won't, and of course I am a salacious news kind of a gal, um, kind of, um, Britney Spears bought the house with her new husband, right? And, um, and then for 11.1, and they just went into contract with someone um, for, um, it was almost 2 million short of what they paid for it. And um, when we are talking about loan or um, purchases of that much money, they're usually being made with some type of liquid. They're not, they're not really loans. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I, there are loans for people that are at that level. Um, and um, they are out there. Those things are available. But um, I would venture to say that the value of her home hasn't come down. But I would venture to say that she might have paid at the peak when the market was still going up, whereas now the market's kind of relaxed a little bit. Um, and they accepted the offer for, uh, I think, a million, a million two lower than what they paid. But I don't know that that is a problem for her. Um, it could be a tax write-off. We need to talk to our tax preparers, right? Okay, no email. Uh, oh, okay, so this is what the student that passed said. No email, I called support and they told me to log into my portal and then under the pretest practice, you will see a final exam link to click on that and then the timer starts. The, verbi the verbiage is mostly the same as pretext and end of unit tests, the pretest and the end of unit tests. And the notes I took from you saying, this is most likely on the test. Oh, okay, so when I've said stuff like that, um, the reason I'll say something like that is if they're asking you about the acts, if they're asking you about the legal um, ramifications, no bias, no discrimination, you know, those are the kind of things that are going to be the most important. And Mark kind of lightly touched on that before. Oh, I did not get an answer back from Mitchell with regard to the questions on Tuesday night, and I did not link the 10 um concepts um email or, or youtube but we'll look up we, i have those things on my phone still and we'll we'll resolve that but let me get back to my text messages um okay okay so so if you guys want at the break or you can do it now no email i called uh, i called so she called uh the support line log into the portal then under the pretest practice you're going to see the final exam link um she clicked on it and then the timer started. But before, when you click on it, it's going to give you this option of if you know that you're you're going in and now time starts. Um, okay, I'm gonna send thank you. We're in class. Are in class. Um, in class. Have a great day. I love when uh, when we can do that. Okay, okay. Now I'm gonna put it on uh, on silent mode, and what I'll do is I'll go open my Google because um, that was I sent like a direct message to her from my regular phone, so we could get that answer quickly. And I will keep my other uh, my Google um, email open so that I can see any voicemails or any text messages that come through, so we can answer that stuff. Um, so we should be good, right? Check one, two, check one, two. Let me check, I'll, I'll come in and I'll go back out. Check one, two, check one, two. How are we doing everyone? Okay, everyone's good. Okay, I did the mute on and off. I will check that kind of stuff. Um, I don't have any other uh, Wi-Fi um, things other than the phone. So um, let me, I'm gonna put it on airplane mode. And if somebody wants to get in, um, I can, I'll check, I'll, I'll take it off the of airplane mode just in case there's any type of internet uh, hobble wobble over here. Um, it is the last day of the Murdoch case, we think. And so there might be a bunch of people online doing that kind of stuff, not in my house, but uh, you know, we all kind of share the, the, uh, the ethernet or the Wi-Fi -E kind of stuff that goes on in this area. That actually goes for all areas. Um, it doesn't matter if you, if you pay for high for fast Wi-Fi or not. All right. So that being said, we are going to be talking about the principles of valuation, and we're going to continue to talk about appraisals. So the principle of completion is another way the economic principles um, will affect the valuation. So buyers com compete with each other to purchase properties. So that principle of completion of comp sorry not completion of competition is important. So we have buyers that are like, oh my gosh, I saw fifteen other people in that house in that open house. I need to go put an offer in on that house. So that's where that competition comes from. And then sellers are like, oh man, I I noticed that down the street that there were more house there were more cars parked around that open house than ours, and I'm worried. And you're like, how would the seller know that? Well, the seller's not supposed to be at the house for open house. 
you as the agent are supposed to be there. So you'll notice, and I've had people do this that were sellers. I drove all the way around. I drove all over and all, I went to every open house and everybody else had more cars than we did. I'm like, yeah, but you left the house before we had our open house. Like there, the car, the cars that were there was me. <laughs> so uh, people get nervous about that kind of thing, but you can understand where the the principle of, of competition will, will, will be part of why people will put an offer in or why there'll be a bidding war. It's like, oh, you mean there's five other people that are interested in this house. And sometimes agents will actually put into the listing that they have um, that they're accepting all offers by the 21st because they uh, they're sharing with you that there are multiple offers coming in. And I always think it's fascinating when those multiple offers come in or have come in, quote unquote, come in, and then the property's still on the market for another 60 days. And it's like, okay, so all the offers came in. Did you guys not accept any of them? Was that your way of trying to start a bidding war? What's the reasoning behind saying something like that? You'll see that kind of stuff with probate, but if there is no probate involved, if there's no court actions involved, you're like, why did you say that? That's interesting. Um, so there's those little things too. So the principle of substitution is something that we need to think about. This is the basis of the appraisal process. And what do you mean by that? Well, not every house is on the exact same square foot lot. Not every house is the exact same square feet. Not every room is the exact same square feet, even in a track of homes or in a newly built subdivision. Um, they'll have three or four different plans um, for the for the homes, give or take, but it, it's going to be harder to find the exact same model of your home on the exact same size lot um, with the exact same amenities because uh, no two houses are exactly the same, right? Um, an owner cannot expect to sell for more than someone would ordinarily pay for a similar property under similar conditions. So um, we go back to the Britney Spears uh, uh, law, not lawsuit, but the selling of her home and find, okay, so yeah, they were willing to pay $11.1 .1 million for that house, but they were not able to sell it at that same price. They tried to sell it for more than what they paid, um, but, they can't, but, but the person that actually got it um, paid um, not far less, but enough less that it's significant. Um, oh, I can't do that. My phone is on airplane mode. I, was gonna, I can look up the numbers, but I think you guys are on the, on the target with what I'm saying. The principle of conformity states that more, um, that, more the, that the structures are in harmony with one another and the more valuable each of those structures is. So the principle of um, conformity would be like conforming all the lots are very close to the same. All the houses are, it's in the same track. And you'll find with an appraisal, um, appraisal companies will say, um, um, out of the out of the three homes that we reviewed based on the value, two of them were in the same subdivision as the um, home that is being um, purchased or whatever. So there's that um, understanding that the value is actually there because two other homes in that track just sold. So this the the valuation of the property or the value they're bringing to the property is realistic because homes in that subdivision sold for that price in the last two or three months. Now I know it's usually six months, but we're in a bear market. We're new in a bear market. So what happened a year ago is not happening today. What happened ago six months ago might be happening today. What's hap what happened three months ago is definitely happening today. Um, so you'll find appraisers will find value to homes um, that are six months that sold within the last six months. But what they'll do is they'll try to push it closer to um, this period of time to find true value because lending institutions are going to go, I don't care what house is sold six months ago. We were in a different market. That's a, that was a bull market. That was a seller can kind of like go, you're going to pay me X, Y, and Z. And people are like, I'll pay you more. Whereas we're in a market now where it's the buyer's like, I don't know if I like the color of paint on the wall. And the seller's like, I'll fix it. What color do you want? Tell, send me to sh give me the number at Sherman Williams. I'll order, you know, where it's not that extreme. I'm doing two totally extremes, but what I'm trying to say is it's swaying more that direction where the buyer has more leeway on what they can, what they can, what they're interested in purchasing. Um, so the principle of highest and best use. So the highest and best use or the HBU of a property, you might need to know HBU. Um, there were some abbreviations when I was reviewing the units, uh, the units yesterday when I was adding. So just so you guys know, I've had this Google Drive for a very long time and we set all of the unit reviews up and everything at the very get-go. I worked on some, some students worked on some, but I didn't know that permissions other than commenting were out there. So a lot of stuff was deleted. Not, by, I don't like deleting stuff. I'll just make copies of stuff um, uh, because I don't like having to, to redo things. So I've redone the unit reviews for every book at least twice. And I'm kind of tired of it, but it's not your fault that that happened. It's, uh, it's the way I had the, um, the link set up. The link was set up as editor versus just commenter. So anybody that had a link 
And then Adam's like, you've been doing this. Why don't you just go back to the original history? You can go back in. And I don't know if you guys know that with Google Drive or with Google Docs, but you can actually go back through history and click, and then it'll take it back to the original version. And I like, I don't know why it took me till last night, but I started crying. I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, I have been keep doing this stuff. He's like, I keep telling you. I was like, I just don't know what you're saying. Anyway, so um, in the reviews yesterday, um, in between um, tutoring and meetings, I noticed that there were some abbreviations in the unit reviews. So wherever there's an abbreviation in the book, you might want to note it. If it's asking you for anything with the abbreviation at the end of the unit questions, um, note those abbreviations, but um, the highest and best use or HBU is an abbreviation that is something you might hear in an office. So the highest and best use of a property more than anything else is what determines the value. So you can see why HBU as an abbreviation um, would be something that would be beneficial to talk to the appraiser with. So you're on the phone with the appraiser and they're like, well, the HBU of the property, that way you'll know that they're talking about the highest and best use um, so you can see where that abbreviation might work while you're in the industry. And if it works with you while you're in the industry, it might be in the open book exam. The principle of highest and best use is based on the reasonable use of real property at the time of the appraisal. And you'll notice it keeps saying at the time of the appraisal. Part of the reason it keeps saying at the time of the appraisal is just like a coupon or just like tickets to the Taylor Swift concert. They're good for a day, right? Uh, coupons are good for a period of time. The appraisal is only good for um, the time that it's being done, that appraisal. So let's say your house was appraised two years ago and it was worth $5 million. Chances are today that same house might be worth four or four and a half or four and three quarters. Um, if you are closer to Palo Alto, the center of the known universe, your house actually might be worth 8 million. Like it just depends. There's a lot of things associated with it. One of them is highest and best use. Um, let's read that sentence one more time. The principle of the highest, uh, the principle of highest and best use is based on the reasonable use of real property at the time of the appraisal, which is most likely to produce the greatest net return to the land and or the building over a given period of time. Um, so the four tests to determine the highest and best use, Physi uh, physically possible, economically feasible, legally permitted. This one is like the, the kicker of all of them, legally permitted and maxim, uh, maximally productive. So there is a such thing as interim use. This is the short-term or temporary use of a property until it is ready for a more productive and highest best use. So there could be, um, that's the term, that's the definition. Um, interim use might be something associated with bringing value into the property or showing why the value is not at highest and best use on an appraisal. So principle of progression, 208. The principle of progression states that the value of an inferior property will be worth more because of the presence of greatest valued properties nearby. So there's the, the, the properties on, the, on its way up, right? The progression. The opposite of progression would be the principle of regression that states the value of a superior property property will be worth less because of the presence of lower valued properties nearby. And you can see right here where um, there could be a re there could be reasoning why a lending institution would say something like, oh, I don't know if we want to lend in that area because that area is going down in value or that area has regressed or um, there are a lot of homeless in the area. Like uh, lending institutions, we can't do that as lenders, right? Or as or mortgage bankers. And we, can, we should not be working with companies that do that kind of thing because if they're doing, if there's some type of bias there or if there's some type of discrimination there, um, and, and they're guided by their numbers, not uh, the nationality or the sex or the religion of the person or people in the area. They're guided by their numbers. They don't want to go through the foreclosure process again. So they might feel like they can, but they can't um, put more rules and regulations in. Um, when we talk about Detroit or when we talk about, and I know that Detroit's not in California. Um, I know Japan is a different country, but when we talk about, um, you'll hear stories, you can Google that with when it comes to like Japan, that Japan actually has it set in particular parts of Japan. If you have $50,000 liquid, you can move to Japan and they will give you a house. They'll grant you because they're, they're, they're trying to build their infrastructure. If you think about Detroit, you can think about um, not just all the automobile companies that went out, but you'll hear things like um, uh, there, are, there are just ghost town neighborhoods um, where uh, like one house will be beautiful and the, all the other houses will be completely 
um, worn down and destroyed, not because people have come in and done things, but because it's a ghost town and the wear and tear and life in general um, has broken those properties down, which would, would, would basically take the value away from the person who's kept their yard and kept their, their area. I think of that movie that just came out, um, not that you guys should go see it, um, but the movie Barbarian, um, the first, uh, um, um, if you like go move forward 10 minutes into the movie and she comes out of this Airbnb, that's really cute. And she looks at the neighborhood and the neighborhood's completely um, decimated. No, that, that's the only house in the neighborhood that's in really nice condition. And, um, and it's just so cute. It's a craftsman kind of style home. Um, but then you look at the neighborhood and you're like, oh my gosh, like all of these homes used to look like that. Um, so you can kind of understand a little bit more. Yeah, I thought it was a good movie too. Um, but um, I really love the writing. So, um, and uh, all about it. It's one of those movies. We just came back. We saw Cocaine Bear last night. That's a story in and of itself. I laughed and screamed and I'm not a verbal person in the theater, but I laughed so hard like three times, but it's kind of set in when I was a little kid, you know, era. So um, there was a lot of um, nostalgia to it. But anyway, enough about Cocaine Bear. Um, and uh, this other movie that we are talking about, but they're good movies. And uh, if you go back and look at old movies, you're going to see older neighborhoods, like especially anything that's filmed here in LA, you're going to see neighborhoods and go, I think I know that neighborhood. Well, the neighborhoods in, in these are set are, they go into older neighborhoods that have been kept up, right. To do their B-roll. And, um, and that brings value to that neighborhood for that or whatever. But the reality is those neighborhoods that were filmed in, in older movies, if you will, um, probably the principle of regression has happened. And I'm going to bring up old movies and how they do things um, later on too, because when it comes to appraisals, um, uh, the way homes or neighborhoods look is beneficial to some areas of industry. And we'll be talking about those areas of industry. Okay, so um, the principle of balance states that real estate value is created and sustained when contrasting, opposing, or interacting elements are in a state of equilibrium. So careful mix of varying land use creates value. So there might be a situation where you have a mixed use um, in the area. So you have real, um, you have residential, you have um, commercial, you have um, kind of mixed use where you've got retail on the first floor and you've got commercial on the second floor, and then you've got um, residential on the two floors above it. If you go to the AMC over by, uh, over in Burbank, not that you guys live in Southern California, but AMC, there's like three or four of the theaters, but um, not the ones in the mall, but but AMC that's, that's, that stands right there with the Batman statue. Um, if you look next to it, a lot of people just walk an inch through a parking garage and go over to the AMC theater. But if you look above it, you're like, I think that's residential. And so when we talk about mixed use, um, you could vent, you could say we've got you've got retail on the first floor and and food, right? So you've got ice cream stores and food stores, and you've got different things. And then the second floor um, could be private business or retail, or or not retail, but but private business like medical or clinic or some type of offices. And then the two floors above that are truly residential. It's not a hotel. Um, and so um, I look at different buildings like that when I think of these uh, situations when we're talking about this um, varying land uses or mixed use. Um, so if you have over improvement or under improvement in a neighborhood, it could cause an imbalance um, over improvement. You've got a 15 bedroom, 17 bathroom home in a neighborhood where they're, um, they're all four bedroom, two bathrooms. That would be over improvement for you to sell it. But if you're going to be there a really long time, live your best life, and you're not looking to get a loan or anything else, it's going to be hard. You're going to be hard pressed to find another house like that within a half mile radius of that property. So that would be considered over improvement. Um, under improvement, obviously, would be homes in the neighborhood that um, are in really great shape and yours is either not or this house is, is not or the house is half the size of the other ones or something where there's there no the value can't get the same value. Um, the principle of anticipation expresses the value is um, expresses that value is created by the expectation of future benefits. So you might find that there's anticipated value in a property if an appraisal is being done on a property that's in the process of construction or about to go into construction. The value needs to be there. They anticipate that the value will be here based on the fact that values are here right now. So there's anticipation. There's that future benefit. The, prin the principle of contribution is where is 
the worth of an improvement as well as um, it adds to the entire property's value regardless of the actual cost of the improvement. So you're going to find that there's principle of contribution contribution brought into a property if someone, as an example, um, bought a home for half a million dollars in a million dollar neighborhood and then they gutted the house and put in a new kitchen and a bathroom and uh, new bathrooms and in you know crown molding floor molding marble throughout yada yada they have now contributed a large amount of money to upgrade that property and it could bring it up to market value and and they might be able to sell it for market value at a million but it might have taken two million to get it there so the principle of contribution is the worth of an improvement as well as what it adds to the entire property's value, regardless of the actual cost of the improvement. And I find a number of people, if you go on YouTube and watch flippers or people flip failures or any of that other stuff, you'll hear a number of people when they're first getting in the industry are like, oh, well, I thought if I put 50,000 into the house that I'd get at least 50,000 out. And it's like, okay, but did you put it in the areas that made sense? Well, I made sure that I, you know, because what are the, where, where are the money, where are the places that people uh, congregate in the house most of all? Um, kitchens, for sure. Um, and then it's either the master bathroom, master bedroom um, area, or it's like the kid's bathroom. The kid's bathroom doesn't bring, doesn't seem to bring in as much amount of value, but if you can get like a spa retreat feeling in the master and you've got an amazing kitchen, you are contributing to the right areas of the house. If um, you put tchotch not tchotchkes, but if you put uh, gingerbread around the outside of the house to get this really kind of cute cottage feel, it's going to have that great feel, but it might not contribute in value. And that's going to, those that, um, the gingerbread of it all is going to um, give it, it, it'll beautify the property, but the investment of that and the cost of that, that handmade or honed wood or whatever is going to be a really, uh, it might not be cost effective, but it'll be beautiful. So if that's what you want to do, you can do it. I'm just saying, so you can see where some people will, will say, well, I put 150,000 into the house. Why is, is the value only 25,000 more than what I paid for it? Well, they could have paid more than what the house was actually worth at that moment. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. So contribution, you've got to be smart with what you put into the property when you're doing a flip. Um, an improvement is a valuable addition made to a property to enhance value and extensive useful remaining life. So when people put contribute, when they put money into homes, a lot of times people immediately think, well, 50,000 is out of my bank account or off, off my credit cards. So that's definitely an improvement on the home. And the reality of the situation is they might have upgraded the wrong part of the house and that the appraiser doesn't see the value in that. So what, how do we find um, what is the best, uh, highest and best use of the property? How do we invest in that property and make it um, give the appearance of the highest and best use, give the appearance of the best value in the neighborhood for what's going in that school district, et cetera, for people that are wanting to buy into that neighborhood. At the end of an appraisal, an appraiser must have prepared, uh, must be prepared to answer the following questions. So what is the highest and best use of the property? Uh, this is definitely a, a residential four bedroom, two bathroom. It's best for this to be a home right? To be lived in and people, people to live their best life. If it's a commercial property, the highest and best use, like there's, there's there, cause appraisals are not all the same. Not every appraisal is created equally. It's they're meant for different things. So the highest and best use of the property. And um, what is this use worth? So what is the value of that property for that use? The professional appraisal has developed an orderly systematic method known as the appraisal process to arrive at an estimated value. So now we went through all of that going, okay, they can look at this and they can look at that and they can look at this. I feel like I'm about to sing a song. So they add um, all of those things together to come to the valuation or the appraisal value of the property, whether it's commercial, whether it's a residential pro property, whether they're going to be purchased or whether this is for home insurance or fire insurance or commercial business insurance, appraisals can be done for many things. So the appraiser must know why the appraisal is necessary. If you go, hey, I need to do an appraisal, the appraiser is going to go, okay, what is it for? You're like, my house, duh. And he's like, no, no, no. I get it's a residential property. Is this to sell the home? Is this because there was a fire? Um, you know, those kind of things. So the purpose of the appraisal will determine the types of information that will be gathered. So the purpose of an appraisal could be to market value for sale, right? So to sell a property and you're like, do people actually do this? Yes. People will actually, before they have you list the property, um, they'll say, you might have a, um, uh, an educated conversation with them going, Hey, houses are going for half a million in your area. And they're like, they were going for 800,000 before. 
and you're like, well, the country music awards, the CMAs, right? The comparable market analysis they did on your property showed that the last three houses that have sold in the last three months or the last 10 houses that sold in the last three months were in this area, this value. If you want, we can have an appraisal done so that the appraiser, a professional in the industry can do this. And it's going to cost the seller of the home you know, $500, $700 to do that appraisal. It might only be 375, but my point I'm trying to make is so we can get a realistic market value for sale from an appraiser. That's a professional in the industry. I'm a professional for 22 years in real estate. And I only know what I know about the houses that have sold, but maybe the appraiser um, sees other information out there that I'm not aware of. Um, and so you can see why there might be a market value for sale. They might be doing something like that sometimes. And the court will do that because of a probate sale, because um, somebody died into state or without a will. Um, value for mortgage loan purposes. It could be for a refinance of a home, right? The value of insurance purposes. So we talked about fire insurance, home insurance. Um, they might be have an insurance claim on the property. And so they need to see what the value of the property is with the newly furnished hot water heater that just blew out, you know, that kind of thing. Value for condemnation proceedings. So condemning a property, we need to figure out what the cost of this property is. If the government comes in and goes, hey, we're putting a railroad through this area. So this whole track of homes is gonna have to go out. So because it's being, um, the home is being taken by eminent domain, um, we need to va value the property because uh, in the state it's in right now so that we, it, in the process of later on, if it's condemned. Um, value of inheritance purposes to see if anybody needs to pay taxes. If this property is being inherited, there could be some concern there. Value of internal revenue service purposes. Uh, we could go back to the whole um, Nicholas Cage conversation where the IRS, you know, as accountant, um, didn't necessarily take care of taxes like they should have. So the IRS is like, hey, buddy, um, so we're just going to take these properties from you. And so they had the valuation done on those properties so they could liquidate the ones that needed to be liquidated in order for them to get paid back. And the reality was they liquidated all of them. Um, so value for liquidation purposes is basically the same as selling. Um, value for property tax purposes, um, because property taxes, if they're not paid, so the state might come in and go, hey, you haven't paid your property taxes for five years. So we're just gonna see what the value is so that we know how, to, how high to sell it to not only get our money back, but everything that it costs us to do this process. Um, but liquidating purposes could be, you could have a client that has a portfolio account and uh, we had a client that wanted to do a 1031 exchange and we'll talk about that in a few slides, okay? And what that means is he wanted to liquidate two or three properties and have the money, instead of touching the money, go directly to a purchase of another home. So we had appraisals done on a few of his, port in his portfolio, a few of his houses in his portfolio to liquidate those homes, make them a liquidated, uh, to, to make them li liquid so that the monies from that could go directly to purchasing another property. And the 1031 exchange side of it is that there would be no tax ramifications because he never, the money never touched his hands. Um, so once an appraiser knows the purpose of a property evaluation, it is possible to move to the next step. So once we know, and so you're like, well, how do we order appraisals? Well, we don't. We used to back before the crash as um, realtors or as um, uh, mortgage loan originators. But at, at this point in time, our clients go get approved for a loan and whichever lending institution they get approved with, they have a list of appraised, uh, approved appraisers and they will actually go, you can, they will let you know, hey, you guys can call so-and-so, we have them on our list and, and or why don't you guys um, confirm that you know, this is one of the people that's on the list and you, we'll, we'll let them come out and do the appraisal because we're lending the client the money on the loan uh, for the loan. And what will happen is they'll have, um, um, you'll reach out to that person. And part of the reason you're reaching out to that appraiser is so that you guys can meet up at the property, but it's not you picking that appraiser. That's no longer our right to pick those because obviously there's been some squirrely stuff that happened. That's part of the crash too. Um, so when it comes to gathering data to determine the property value, data can be obtained from government publications, newspapers, magazines, the internet, and personal observation. There are two types of data that are, um, there's the general and then there's the specific site. So general data and specific data are broken down as such. General data is regional, community, neighborhood, and market. And then specific data would be location, lot type, legal, improvements to the building, um, data should be gathered on population trends, income levels, and employment opportunities. And there's a few things that appraisers will go through to look at those kind of things as well. But as just like we as realtors, we're bringing the future into the present, right? We as realtors have the multiple listing service or CL or CRMLS. We're with our local association. We have opportunity 
to review information that's not public record. We all have public record information, right? We can all go on Redfin or um, realtor.com or whatever, but as realtors, we have special behind, uh, um, a, a, behind a membership um, programs that we can go and look at um, for information that's been sold that might not be public. It might not be public record. There are a couple houses that sold um, and uh, so on and so forth. So the same thing goes for appraisers. They'll, they, they have different types of programs and information available to them. So when it comes to general data, let's review it. General data is information about the area where the property is located and that affects the value of said property. Regional data is a region in a metropolitan area such as San Francisco Bay, Southern California. I would venture to say it wouldn't be, a regional data wouldn't be under Southern California by itself. I would say we've got San Francisco Bay, we've got San Diego, we've got Los Angeles, um, and then we've got like San Bernardino, because San Bernardino County is almost from, the, from one edge of the state to the other edge, right? Um, um, regional data can be gathered from monthly bank sum, um, summaries, regional planning commissions, and government agencies. And there are there is regional data that appraisers can get on on what's moving that we might not be seeing um, even on um, our listings. Because you could have a a company like say Zillow that has a portfolio full of properties and they're liquidating them, but they're not liquidating them out on the market as much as there might be an international interest to purchase those. And so there's there's other information as well. So when I say regional, I mean um, homes that have been sold in your area, but they're not being marketed on the multiple listing service. Community data is found in a community. A community is a town, just in case you guys aren't aware of that, I think you guys are, or a city where the property would be low would be located and we are licensed in the state of California. Appraisers are, appra um, are certified to do appraisals and licensed to do and or licensed to do appraisals in California, but there could be an appraiser that, um, that has gone through all of the regulatory systems for our, for our state as well as for other states as well. Um, and they might be on the list uh, for, of a lender's list. Um, and the reason that they're chosen is because they have experience in more than one state, but we're really just talking about um, uh, appraisals done here in California. So there's neighborhood data concerning the neighborhood's conditions and the amenities, and this can be obtained from personal inspection, real estate agents, or area builders. So if there, there's a property that's being built, um, if there's a subdivision that's being built, if there's an area that's being um, genderfied, or if there's an area that's being, um, uh, there's a facelift happening, that right before the pandemic, I would say closer to like 2015, 2016, there's a lot of revitalization happening in downtown Los Angeles and a lot of lights are going up and a, a lot of areas are being cleaned up and there's a lot of focus on, on getting downtown clean and, and back to where it was at one point. Um, and you can kind of see that in those neighborhoods that they're putting in these multi-floor um, um, apartment complexes and people are buying them right and left because the prices are just going up and up. And based on the neighborhood data, it was a good investment. And then here, the pandemic hit and a lot of things went back to the way they were prior and they're coming back. But you can kind of see that sway, that visually, you can visually see that that neighborhood. So when it talks about personal inspection, that's the kind of thing. You're driving through a neighborhood that looks... Um, uh, that's on the up and up. And then right after the pandemic or during the pandemic, the area looks like a bomb dropped. You're like, what happened? Didn't they just redo this area? So if personal inspection would be that kind of personal inspection. Um, the sales and listing prices of properties in a neighborhood is the neighborhood's market data. So when we talk about the CMAs or the country music awards or the comparable market analysis, we're comparing the market data for the neighborhood within a half mile radius of that home. Are home, like homes like this home selling? And if they are, how much are they selling for? And how much did they sell for? And how long ago was that? And finding value. Um, sources for sale information are assessors, records, and county recorder's office, title insurance companies, because a title insurance company will have put insurance on a number of properties, right? Because those houses are in the midst of um, transitioning from the seller to the buyer. So a title insurance company would be uh, have a wealth of information with regard to homes and what they're selling for recently. Other property owners in the area are going to tell you what they sold their house worth, but we don't know if they're telling you the truth <laughs> and the appraiser's own database. Um, and that's what I mean by their own database would be some type of a program that or a subscription or affiliation that they're with that they would have additional information or the exact same information, but it would support what we know is the value for our clients' homes. 
Um, Site-specific data is information that, ha that has to do with a specific location being appraised. So you'll see on an appraisal that they'll talk about, they won't talk about the home, they'll talk about the site. They'll say this site or this address or this location. Um, the very, it's very clinical. Appraisal, appraisals are clinical because they're talking about the difference between this site versus the, the, the three um, um, properties that are being reviewed against this site or something along those lines. It's, it's, not, um, it's not floral. It's just like we've talked about this in, the, in other classes where the, uh, you get in a car accident and you're in your car and the police come and they're like, can you tell us what happened? You're like, yeah, that guy over there with the red hair and the, the blue shirt and the this and that, they, he totally like slammed into that car and then that car did this. And then I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was drinking my coffee and they're like, no, no, no. So, you know, like where, they want to know the facts. They don't, they're, they're grateful that you gave them the description about the guy, but the reality is they, they don't care that you drank coffee or that any of that other stuff. Um, they want to know just the facts. So that's what appraisals are. Location, even though the location of a neighborhood and city must be considered in any analysis of a specific site or plot of ground, the exact spot of the site itself is the most important factor in determining value. You could say, oh my gosh, we're right around the corner from Universal Studios. That doesn't necessarily give you the same value as their property just because it's right there. There's, there's specific things about the site that the, they're, they're giving value to that piece of land. Um, so there are types of lots, we're on 209, the type of lots on which the property is located can affect the value. So a cul-de-sac um, is found um, at the end of a dead end street, or I call them turnabouts, you know, like you go to the end and you turn around. Um, it's the street that only has one way in and one way out. So what's a cul-de-sac? It's a street that has one way in and one way out. There's your term, there's your definition. A corner lot is found at the intersection of two streets. So this would be the corner lot, right, here in the image. A T intersection lot is one that is front um, head on by a street. So you could kind of see how this street is driving right into San Bernardino, uh, San Bernardino Boulevard is driving right into this house if the person does not see that they have to turn. So you can kind of see that it's a capital T. The interior lot is one that is surrounded by other lots with frontage on the street. Um, so. I'm looking for the T lot. Sorry, the interior lot. Did I say the T lot? So right here is the one that is surrounded by others with frontage on the street. So there's the street. So that it has frontage, but it's surrounded. It's surrounded across and everything. Okay. Um, the flag lot right here looks like a flag on a pole. The pole represents the access to the site. So you could say in some respects that this is um, our house and then this is our property and the neighbor's house. It, it actually technically is landlocked. I don't know what's over here, but you can see where they can only get to this home if they drive through our property to get to this. Now that's not what this is showing. This is showing the flag lot looks like a flag on a pole. Um, which is usually located at the rear of another lot fronting a main street. So in order for them to get out of their house to get to the main street, they have to drive past this property. The key lot, so named because it resembles a key fitting into a lock, is surrounded by the backyards of other lots. So they say that they this comes across as being um, a key lot, so they have more than one uh, backyard neighbor, right? The backyards of other lots. It is the least desirable because of the lack of privacy. And it looks like, well, and chances are, not only does it have more than one, but it has, you know, this driveway. But we're in California. So that's kind of like um, everybody's lot has <laughs> very little privacy, right? Um, legal data. An appraiser must evaluate all legal data connected with the site. And what's the site again? That's the property that's being evaluated, right? Including the legal description, any taxes, the zoning, general plan, and any restrictions or easements on the property will change the value. Our property has an easement that goes up the side, right? And because um, there, there's an easement, um, the value of our property is not as high as other properties because it's less desirable. People don't want other people, most people don't want people driving through their property. I, I don't have a problem with it personally, but I'm, I'm not the, the, the 80 percentile and we're going to be working with the 80 percentile. So appraisal will talk about or values will, valuations will be, be done on properties like that 
and you'll see that they're not worth as much money. Um, sure, I can at the break. Absolutely. I'm getting a couple messages. So if you guys need anything, I can uh, move that information. Um, okay, so improvements. Oh, hold on just a second. All right. How are we doing on time? We're doing great. So in 10 minutes, I'll email any of the Google Drive stuff. Um, okay. Um, so improvements, real property is divided into land and improvements and each adds its own value to the site. So improvements can be either on-site or off-site. So on-site improvements are structures permanently attached to the land, such as buildings, swimming pools, and fences. Um, buildings would include houses. <laughs> off-site improvements are items in area that border the site and add to its value, such as street lights, sidewalks, green belts, and curbs. So there's valuation. Uh, they bring like an, an older neighborhood is going to have like your favorite restaurant or um, well-groomed and growing trees. So there's shade and there's an old neighborhood, there's an old park and there's a this and that. Whereas newer neighborhoods are not going to necessarily have those large trees and they're not going to have um, as much of that kind of improvement that has been done yet. But don't worry, restaurants will come in and uh, Walmart will come in and Costco will come in. It happens. Um, so how do we decide on the appraisal approach? There are three main approaches to appraising property to arrive at a market value estimate. So there's the sales comparison approach, the cost approach, and then the income approach. The sales comparison approach depends on recent sales and the listings of similar properties in the area and are evaluated to form an opinion of value. Now your appraiser might have an opinion of value where the value of the home is very high. The lending institution could come back and go, yeah, we don't think the house is worth that much. We're gonna have another appraisal done on the property. And you're like, but this is your appraiser. <laughs> they might ask for another opinion, um, but it's usually their appraiser, but this is what was happening prior to the crash. It doesn't necessarily happen like that anymore. And appraiser will also fight for value. So they'll add, there's an addendum that they can add to the appraisal that says, um, for those that are concerned, <laughs> it won't say it that way. It'll be very professional. The value of the property was based on these three homes that, that sold in the area recently. And here's an additional four homes in that same area within the last six months where I, the value came in here. The, the appraiser will fight to prove value. It's not just an opinion. The, the appraiser will come back and go, okay, I see that you don't think that I'm right, but I know I'm right because. And um, it, appraisers don't like to have to do that, but they do. They do have to do that. Um, so reconciling, reconciling the data. So reconciliation, the final step in an appraisal is to examine the values derived by the various approaches. And we've been talking about those all morning, right? So writing the appraisal report. Appraisers report appraisal results using either um, two reporting options, the appraisal report or the restricted appraisal report. And if it's restricted, that just means it's not as detailed. Each written appraisal report must be prepared according to the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practices or the USPAP. Um, this is like, um, so appraisers have what we have as realtors, we have zip forms, right? Appraisers have a, a program specific to them um, that they can fill that information out. So when it talks about how they need to um, follow the Uniform Standards of Professional Practice, of Professional Appraisal Practice Standards, in the same way we have contracts, they have contracts. So they're filling in the blanks, but they're not filling in the blanks willy nilly. They know what needs to go in each area and why it needs to go in there. The appraisal report is the most commonly used report option. Um, again, when we talk about appraisals, we go, well, that's the value of the home, but it's truly a value of an, it's, it's the value of the opinion of the appraiser. So uh, if that's the clinical way of looking at it, right? The Uniform Residential Appraisal Report or the URAR is an example of the appraiser's report, which is used for most residential appraisals. In the same way we use California Association of Realtor far forms, right? The zip forms or car forms, it, they, could be used, they could be called a few different things. Appraisers use the URAR forms. Um, the, re the restricted appraisal report, so this is the difference, is the briefest presentation of an appraisal and contains the least detail. In this type of report, only the client is named because there's no other users and the user and the use of the report is limited to the client. And you're like, well, who's the client? Let's say you have a building, you have a commercial building, and you would like to get um, an appraisal done on the property. You're not wanting to get it on any of the stuff on the inside or any of the tenants that you have that are leasing 
um, the units, but you want, you just want to know the value of the property. It's restricted to you as the client. There's no lender involved. There's none of these other things. So it's a restricted appraisal report um, where it's just giving basic information to you with regard to what the value is. If there's an appraisal report done on a property, that appraisal report is going to be more significant because it's not, it's not um, connected to just you as the client. It's connected to the, the lending institution that's going to do the loan, or it's connected to a person who would like to buy that property and a lending institution that they're going to work with. When a seller puts, does an appraisal report on a property, a, the lending institution for the buyer isn't necessarily going to accept that appraisal if that appraiser is not on their approved appraisal list. And so sometimes appraisals are done for different reasons, but I mean, they are, they're all done for a specific reason, but they're not all done for the same reason. So there's three approaches to a value um, or the sale comparison approach cost, uh, sorry. So there are three uh, approaches to value. They are sales comparison approach, cost approach and income approach. So let's look at each of these. So the sales comparison approach is the one most easily and commonly used by real estate licensees. It's the best for single family homes or condominiums and vacant lots because sales information is readily available and easily compared. The appraiser will collect data on comparable properties and I, I'll call them comps sometimes and they um, that are as similar as the property in question as possible and, and in certain categories. So if they're Getting an appraisal done on condominiums, the properties in the area that sold have to be like properties. They have to be condominiums. Comparable, so they have the comps, the comparables have to be of like property. Comparables are the properties that are similar to a subject property and are used in the appraisal prop process to find value. So what are the advantages of sales comparison approach? Well, most easily understood. So it's very like, this is the value of the home and this is why. Easily applied for the sale, a lenders look at them and go, that makes sense, or they, it, or they say it doesn't, but usually it does. The sales comparison approach is the best for single family homes, condominiums, uh, and vacant lots. Now that's the second time it's been said in two slides. So you might want to note that for the open book exam. Disadvantages of sales comparison approach are the following, finding enough recent sold similar properties to get a comparable value, which might be happening in 2023 because we have the lull from November through the beginning of January is usually the hardest time to sell homes because people want to be with their families, right? They don't want to have to deal with packing and moving and all the things. Uh, correctly adjusting amenities to make them comparable. So amenities, meaning there's, um, there's a, a higher quality tile in your house versus the house that's being compared. So they're, they're trying to evaluate um, some of those kind of things. Sometimes those amenities might, uh, the numbers might not um, parse the same way. Um, old sales, unreliable with changing economic conditions. So there could be that. And then difficult in conforming transaction details. Um, is there a way for the seller to find out what the property appraised for when the buyer gets? Oh, yeah. Well, they're going to know. So that's a, it is a great question. So let's say as an example, um, Erica is selling her house and Chantel is buying it. And they're both agents. Uh, they're both agent. We're not going to go like their, their client is. We're going to talk like it's you guys being the person buying it. So Chantel wants to buy Erica's home and Erica has her prop property listed for $500,000. Chantel goes through the lender process, gets approved, and the lender's like, hey, based on uh, the value must come in at a minimum of half a million, $500,000. So, so, so the appraiser comes out and looks at the property. And this could go two ways. The property appraises for half a million. Now, Chantel putting in that offer to Erica has a contingency that the value come in at what, it's, what she offered, which is half a million. When she removes the contingency, Erica, the seller is like, oh, okay, it came in at value. But let's say as an example, Chantel's like, hey, I'll pay half a million for the property if it comes in at that value. And the appraiser comes back at 499,000. It's a $1,000 difference. Chantel uh, is going to let Erica know, hey, we're both agents. Like I, it, the appraiser's coming in. It's all, we, we can like add an addendum to this, but I, but based on what the appraisal stated, we're a thousand dollars off. And I really only want to pay what it's worth. And at that point, Erica could do something, uh, say something along the lines of you're right. Let's just amend this, um, that you're buying it for what it's worth. And, and so in that situation, the appraiser 
um, the, the seller of the property would be aware that the appraisal came in um, at the exact amount. Now, can the seller of the property see a copy of the appraisal? The answer would be no, because they didn't pay for it. But that's between agents. You could actually show a copy of the appraisal to the seller of the property. But at that point, I don't know that Erica is like, I've got to see the appraisal. But I could see why Erica would be like, no, I want to see the appraisal. How could it be $1,000 off? I'm a realtor in this area. Um, more times than not, do properties typically get appraised for what they're going for? Yes, because um, yes, they do, because you guys are good agents and you're not going to list a property for a weird amount. But we have, that's why we have to build rapport. I know we're going to go to break in just a moment, guys. That's why we have to build a really strong rapport with our um, our clients. Because let's say, as an example, Erica is my agent. And Chantel, you're coming in. Don't worry. Erica's my agent. And um, I'm like, Erica, my house is worth at least $750,000. And she's like, okay, well, I did a, the Country Music Awards or the comparable market analysis on the property. And I can see um, that houses were going for that about a year ago, but houses are kind of at 600,000 right now. And to put uh, this on the market and to have a strong opening, I think it would be best for us to have it open at the value um, that houses are going for right now. And I think, we, I think putting it on the market for 600,000 is very strong. Um, houses are still selling, but houses are only, really because we're in a bear market, they're selling for what they're worth right now. And, um, and so I'm like, reluctantly, okay, because 600 is still more than I paid. So, okay, you know what, Erica, uh, you're, you've, you've presented to me a good case. I'm, we're going to run with it. We're going to list this house for 600,000. And then you do an open house and Chantel brings her client in and her client's like, dude, this house, I remember a house like this sold like last year for 750 or $800,000. I you guys have priced this in, in the right place for the market. I would like to buy it. Like people that want to live in a particular neighborhood are watching value. And Chantel's like, Eric is great to work with. And so you already have built a rapport between the two of you as agents. And you guys know that you're both good agents. And so you're happy to work together. But Chantel also knows that Erica is not going to steer me as the, as the client in an inner direction. Now it could go the other direction and it could be a situation where Erica's like, Kathy, I'm serious. Like, I know that you think your house is worth that much. And I would love to get that commission, but the houses in your area are going for 600,000. And I, as a client, I've had clients like this. I, as a client are like, yeah, but the jerk down the street sold his house for 850. I know my house is nicer than his house. It doesn't matter that he sold five years ago. It doesn't matter that he sold two years ago. I have this emotional value that I've put on the house. And so how does Erica handle that situation? Erica goes, okay, Kath, let's do this. I know the houses that how the house will go for 600,000 because that's what houses are going for, but there could be an upswing depending upon um, Erica's training with her broker. Brokers like let the seller, if the seller wants to decide, sellers have to decide the price anyway. So it could be a situation where uh, we go, okay, well, how about this? Why don't we see how the market moves for the first 30 days? And we'll do a few open houses. And, um, and can we put in the, in the listing um, something along the lines of 775,000 plus um, or, or um, best offer, come in with your best offer, um, the seller is um, interested or something along those lines. There's a way to handle the situation. And then Chantel's client comes in and is like, that's a lot of money for this house. Like I know they're going for 850 last year, but like, I don't think the market will hold that. Like we could put in an offer for maybe 700, but contingent on the appraisal coming in at value. I don't want to um, be stuck with a contract. You know, I want that contingency set in place. And so those are the kind of ways um, you would maneuver that kind of a situation. But seeing, seeing the appraiser themselves, seeing the appraisal it, in and of itself, the seller is not going to see it because they didn't pay for it. So they actually don't technically have the right to it. Um, let's do this. I'm going to let you guys, let's do the 10 minutes. Um, and your 10 minutes starts now. And I will get the Google link in chat. Okay. 
Let me make sure that is the last of the, those are text messages. Let's see if we have anything in Google. Can you send me the link for Google? Yeah, I'll send the link, I'll send the link. Uh, let's see, is there anybody else? Oh, <laughs> Anthony, I see your suggestion. Most of the time we have this link is for our evening, uh, our evening Q and A's. It's just so, um, as long as we need to, as long as you guys, um, as long as you guys feel, as long as you guys want to meet, I'm, I've, I've set the day aside. Uh, let me put into chat, but you guys don't have to, and it's going to be recorded. It's going to take a while for whatever reason, the, 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 up, the upload from Tuesday took a minute. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, so it might take a while for it to come up, but we'll, where is live? Live links. No, we don't need the live links. We need the Google drive in and of itself. I'm struggling with the, there we go. There we go. It's taking a minute. There we go. Okay. We've got six minutes left for those of you that are like, how many minutes we have left for six minutes? We'll go over to it. We'll, we'll go over it. Here you go. So. The Google Drive is an accumulation of stuff that has been built for class as well as um, anything that students have helped out with or said, hey, why don't we try this or how do we try that? Um, that's a really good question, Avery. I wish I wish you'd had the chance to talk to um, Mark. Um, so there was only one question. For, we'll come back in from the break and we'll see if anybody remembers what the one math question was that he saw on the state exam. Um, there is an appendix associated with it, and we can uh, we can do a math uh, section. But do you are you worried that there's going to be math on the open book exam? So, the, no. The, I appreciate you asking. We actually don't. Uh, I don't really do a lot on on the math side of things. Okay. <laughs> so for Zana. Farzana, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I passed the open book exam. Most of the questions are from the practice quizzes and the website. Okay, so you, when you say the website, you're talking about the um, um, the unit reviews on the online digital version. Okay, well there you go. Just in case. Now I I put in um, I put in a note from another student, and I got a text message saying saying that since they passed, they aren't going to come into class with you guys, which is totally fine. I come in, go out, do whatever you guys need to do. I totally get it. But um, if you're taking any of the online quiz um, quizzes, everything's open book. So I don't want you to feel, I mean, feel however you want to feel. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to tell you guys how to feel. I don't want it to seem like that. I just want um, you guys to know that it's okay to, um, to be concerned, but I really believe that once you take this, this open book exam and you're understanding what the expectations are you as a person 
um, in your area of, of expertise and building your area of expertise, the next two books and the next two processes are going to be smooth sailing. And I'm not just saying it because I've been in it for a long time. I mean, I came into teaching and I've been teaching and I've been in the industry for a really long time. And then there were questions. I'm like, I don't even know the answer to this stuff. And so there's, because it's not what I'm using in the industry, but it's found, it's fundamental or it's foundational. And I had a couple of students say, well, shouldn't you know it? And I said, well, I'm familiar enough that I know where to go look for it. And that's what I want to share with you guys. We're, you're learning information that's building this foundation of infrastructure so that you'll know where to go to ask the question or to review that information. Um, it could be something about life estates. It could be something about um, FHA programs. It could be something about first-time home buy buyer programs, low-income housing, um, and approval for purchases in your, in your county. There are different things in different counties. And so um, there's so much information out there that is at your fingertips. We can't cover all of it in these classes. So we're going to, we're going to cover as much as we can to remind that you, to remind, remind you not, not because Google's listening or Surrey or Alexa, but that there is a plate, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a foundational place and go to the department of real estate and look in their reference books. You can contact the hotline. Um, I think we've talked about the hotline, but maybe we haven't that once you become a, a realtor, that there's a hotline associated with your a local association, you can call them. And what I mean by that is it's legal advice. Um, if you're about to list a property, you talk to your broker, your broker is the agent, right? So you're going to be talking to your broker about any concerns or questions. Maybe you have a client that is fighting for you to list the property at $850,000 when you know houses are going for 600 in the area. You go talk to your broker. Hey, I've got the situation. Your broker nine times out of 10 is going to be like, oh my gosh, I've had clients like that. One of my first clients when I was first in the industry, and this is how I work with it and let your, your broker help walk you through the process. Um, and so these classes aren't that side of things. The second book is a little bit more because it's practice. Like what should you wear? Why should you act a certain way? Why should you market things? And we're going to be talking more about that. Mark talked about that on um, Tuesday evening and basically was like, I went out to open houses because Kathy told me to. And like, I think 90% of the people that were at the live session were like, Kathy never told us to go out to open houses. I'm like, that's book two. That's book two. Like, we're still doing the pouring, you know, we're still prepping the ground, if you will. Um, I see. Oh, okay. There you go, Erica. Um, Mark said the only math question that was asked on the uh, California Department of Real Estate salesperson exam was about the square footage of an acre. And do you guys remember what he said? I was going to wait until the break. We still have like a minute and a half, but do you guys remember? You can either say it or you can put it in chat. I do Seven. remember what he said. Yeah, 7-Eleven, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so uh, let, off the top of my we head. All do, we all know it's 43,000, but he did say 7-Eleven, which is the five plus the six equal 11 at the end. So it's 43,560. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> that one stuck it. with me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. But the thing I was thinking was um, even if you flip it. So if you, if you flip it in your head and say 43,650, uh -huh. it's still uh -huh. 7 11. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's oh. a good one, too. But okay. You want, the, you want the 560. So I don't think that the state exam uh, go, uh, says 43,650. I think it's for, I think that the four ans the four options are like 43,140. Like, so what will happen with the state exam is they'll put like one of the, you'll know, the first two are 43 and you're like, oh man. And then it'll give you four options. But I don't think that one of them is flipping the five and the six, but you could say five goes before six. So you could go, it's seven eleven. It does. We know it's 43,000. But then um, it's, you know, it goes uh, larger to smaller, 43,000. And then it goes, um, five goes before six, which makes it more complicated. But, but um, another thing is remembering that there's a zero at the end, because if the, there's three numbers that add up to 11, that, that would be a kicker too. But um, I had somebody else say it's um, three, four, five, six, but we start with four. Um, we go down and then we come back to five and six. I don't know if that is beneficial to you guys. Um, I think 7-Eleven, <laughs> just go with 7-Eleven. And then if you come back, you're like, Kathy, they flipped the six and the five. I know the five that goes before six, then you're, then, then you've made it. You've passed it. You're like, I got, I got that answer. Right. But 7-Eleven and I don't know, do you guys, 7-Elevens are all over the world. Um, little markets, like a circle K. 
So when um, he said that about 7-Eleven, I immediately thought local, uh, local market or the market connected to the gas station. Um, we have a 7-Eleven right down the street. They had Slurpees when I was a kid. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if they do any of that stu stuff either. Yeah, Carolina, it stuck with me too. And he said 7-Eleven. I was like, I don't think they said something like that, but I didn't get it. And it took a minute and it was like, oh yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys got that. Okay, cool. Perfect, perfect. Quick question, sorry. Yeah, you're fine. Jump in. Um, I was reading the terms of the test and we have to, if theoretically we fail the first attempt, we have to wait 18 days after to take the second one? Oh, no, 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 no. You have the opportunity to take it two times in a seven, uh, in a seven day period. So when it comes to those open book ex exams, you can take it twice within a seven, uh, within that window of opportunity. Now, if you don't pass on the second time, um, when it comes to Calibri, you're, you're going to need to retake the whole entire class again, because that's how the curriculum is set up for that school. So, or for the school. So if, um, if you're, if you're going through the a private institution or if you're going, you you guys are, sorry, I don't mean to be like, so like, um, split when I say stuff like that, you get two options. Now, if you don't pass the second time, if you don't pass the first time, text me, call me, um, and we'll set up an appointment. We'll talk through, cause you're going to be able to see where you didn't, uh, the percentage of the things that you did well on the things you didn't, things you didn't do well on are the ones that are need to be reviewed. And then call me, let's talk through those. Let's do a zoom and, and talk through those so that when you hit the ground running for the open book exam, the second time you can pass with flying colors. Um, but I think we've found out from, um, um, not just the student that texted me, I, I believe it's Mindy that texted me. And then Farzana actually said in class that they, that they passed. And it was basically the exact same answers um, or questions from not only the unit reviews, but also like it was a mix of those and some of the ones from the questions that are on um, um, the exam uh, reviews in, on, on the student platform as well. Um, I just discovered your online quizzes. Excellent. How did I miss this? Well, the, I, I've only done two. So I haven't done a lot of them, but I also have like the flashcards. I have the PDFs that have, I've turned the PowerPoints into PDFs so that if the PDFs get edited again or deleted, um, I can see that the commenter section is actually working now. Like I got a message from Anthony today. I got a message, I think from Kyle yesterday. Um, oh my gosh. No, I mean, this information... I've, I'm not always, it, it has always been there, but, but I only find out from you guys that stuff's been deleted or how can you change this? I'm like, I didn't. And I'm like, what is going on? And so trying to lock down these so that I'm not doing it another time. Um, when it's the last day and time we can take the exam, you're going to have to call customer service. I'm, I would venture to say that that Tuesday morning is, is the, is your end date, but you'll have to confirm with them because they're the ones that are auditing the, 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 the seven day window. Can you please provide your phone number? Of course. Um, 732-723-7326. So that is my Google voice number. So when I'm in class with you guys, like right now, um, if somebody were to call right now, let me put it back on airplane mode. I won't be able to take the call, but what I can do is I can check voicemail and I can check texts when I'm not in class or when I'm not lecturing or when I'm not in a curriculum committee meeting or whatever the situation is, which is all of like every day, all day. Um, so I'll be able to respond, but I, I won't like take the call right now, just in case I've had a couple of people say, can I call right now? No, no, please don't call right now. Um, oh my gosh, of course. Yours says it expired. I don't know what's expired. Huh? Yeah. You need to def you're for the, okay. So you definitely need to get on customer. Huh. Yeah, that's a tech issue. Please get on with customer service and let them know because they're, they're, it's crazy that it would expire if you just, if the, if, if the window basically just opened yesterday afternoon. Yeah, um, Jasmine, did you have a, um, did you have a class where you, um, we're doing like an independent study and then transferred over to um, uh, lecture, lecture classes. 
Cause I find that some of the, oh, okay. Yeah. Get on the phone with customer service and, and show them. You're like, my hours are here. What's going on? I see my hours, but now I'm showing, it could be a broken link. And I'm like, what do you mean? What is it? What's expired? Yeah, please get up. We're here in class. Go mute, mute your, not that you're, you're unmuted, but, but get on the phone with customer service right now and, and get that taken care of. Cause we're here for you. Like we're, we're still going to be doing this stuff and this is being recorded. So you'll be able to go back and review this information, but I'd rather you strike while the iron's hot. You're like the window was supposed to open yesterday. What's going on? Why I'm supposed to have seven days to take the exam twice. Um, and then um, and um, get back on with us because that is that's got to be a tech issue. Now, if they come back, if if you're yeah, your hours are fine. That's a tech issue. There's a broken there's a broken link. And as a reminder, not that you guys were here at eight twenty five or eight thirty, whenever Stacy and I started talking in class, but um, there's more than one student platform, and some students have the old platform, and some students have the new platform, and then some students have like this a middle be like this mesh between the two. So like when we were in class on Tuesday, and Sonia was like, "That's what the that's what my platform looks like when somebody we posted the picture." Um, and I looked at that and then I went in and I have, and I found that I have two accounts cause I have, and neither of my platforms look like that one. And then I read this email that's like, oh, Hey, there are some students that have this platform and then we're transitioning. You put everybody migrate everyone over. Um, when you've got like seven, like a, a few million students across the nation, you can kind of see why they're like, we're not going to, we're not going to cross the streams. We're going to let people that are on this platform continue on this one to finish their classes. And those that are coming in in like say January. Um, they're going to be on this one and and they're all migrating forward it's really the way the um the platform is built it's really what you see on your screen they're all they're all interconnected by the tech department but you could after having this conversation with you you could kind of see how uh, a link might be broken or something so definitely get on the phone with admin or at the tech department or the customer service um and what did um what did mindy say in the text this morning she said that she went in and um actually called customer service and customer service walked her through where to find the link. And I would encourage you, Jasmine, to, to do that as well. Um, and yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's jump back in. Uh, where were we? We're right here. And if it kicks me out, you guys should be in limbo until I get back in if we have any internet issues, but I don't think we will. So, so we talked about the disadvantages of the sales comparison. There aren't a lot. I mean, the sales comparison just really shows what the sales are out there and if there are any. Um, so we talked about the sales approach. This is the cost approach. The cost approach looks at the value of the appraised parcel or the, of, the, of the site that's being reviewed, right? as the combination of two elements. So what are those two elements? The value of the land, if it was vacant vacant with nothing on it, the cost to rebuild the appraised building as new on the date of evaluation, less the accrued depreciation. And you'll find that the cost approach is something that is used for say people that um, have had a fire or some type of an insurance claim. So eth eth uh, methods to estimate the cost of a new building. So to estimate the cost of building a structure new, an appraiser can use one of several methods. That would include the square foot, the cubic foot, the quantity survey, and the unit in place cost method. Um, so what is the square foot? Well, the square foot method is the most common. It's used by appraisers and real estate licensees to estimate the cost of construction. The size of the building in question is compared by square foot to other buildings with the same area. Um, a lot of times what you'll also find is they're saying it's worth this much per square foot. So if this is a 500,000, sorry, if this is a 5,000 square foot house and the house next to it's a 4,800 square foot house that calculated on the cost or the price of the square footage. Um, cubic foot method is very similar to the square foot method, but it takes height as well as, as the area into consideration. So it doesn't just go the floor plan, it goes this uh, upwards as well. Um, there's the quantity method. Um, this method or the quantity survey method, this method is to take a detailed estimate of all labor and materials used on the components of building. This method is time consuming, but very accurate. And the reason the quantity survey method would be best during the pandemic was there was a massive supply and demand chain issue, right? So the cost to do any type of construction during the pandemic 
um, was almost three times what it was before the pandemic. And even now, um, you couldn't even get two by fours at your local Home Depot. You could only get two by threes and other things like that. My brother was like, Kathy, my brother's contractor, I'm struggling. Like, this is ridiculous. I've driven all over the Central Valley. I've driven all the way up to Merced. I've driven all the way down to Bakersfield trying to get... Um, wood for the construction that they're doing. And he wasn't even calculating in the cost of gas to get the supplies because they couldn't get the supplies to the properties that they were working on. And I was just like, this is insane. Um, so of course what I do, I jump in my car, drive down to the Home Depot and sure enough, there's only two by threes. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm not in a small area. I, you know, um, the cost of units. So unit in place cost method. So cost of units in the building as installed, as computed and applied to the structure costs. So the total cost of the walls in place, the heating units, the roofs are figured on a square foot basis, including labor, overhead and profit. This is the most detailed method of estimating a value and probably the most, so that and then the, the that one, I would probably venture to say more than anything will tell you exactly how much it's gonna cost. What's it gonna cost for the plumber? What's it gonna cost for the uh, electrician to run the wires? What's, you know, like all of the detail, very detailed, but very accurate. Um, depreciation. I don't know that we've talked about depreciation as much, uh, but that's okay. Depreciation means loss in value from any cause. So the property value has depreciated. It's no longer worth what it's worth for whatever reason. The opposite of depreciation is appreciation. And you can have your house appreciate in value, right? Or increase in value. And this is usually as a result of inflation or some special supply and demand force relating to specific properties. So Houses, as an example, we talked about this uh, on Tuesday. Actually, we've talked about the, this throughout the few weeks where the Silicon Valley, you could put a house on the property or a, a house on the market for like one and a half and it was going for a million over asking um, because the houses, the, the value of those homes was appreciating so quickly. Physical deterioration is a big deal. This type of depreciation can come from regular wear and tear. It could be also negligent care sometimes called deferred maintenance. Uh, you do need to know what the word defer maintenance means. And that actually does mean uh, negligent care of a property. Um, there might be another way, um, a term for it. Um, functional obsolescence is a depreciation that is attributed to any item or feature within a subject property that's no longer useful or functional. Um, uh, it's not that the, um, uh, have, I don't know if you guys have been into any of those houses where you're, everything's one level or it's multiple levels, it's two steps down here and two steps down there. And then they'll be in the middle of the living room, they'll have a sunken area to sit around the fireplace. Um, to me, that's functional obsolescence because I'm so uh, uh, like, I have two left feet. So I would literally, if, if I were in the dark, I'd be afraid that I'm going to fall into this you know, area where the fireplace is supposed to be like this nook cozy thing, but I, you know, but that's like something that was definitely a dynasty circa 1980s uh, style home. Um, so here's an, for instance, in on page 210, a four bedroom house with only one bathroom might be considered functionally obsolete because most homes today have at least two bathrooms that, and uh, with many one bathrooms um, for one for each bedroom, or they have a Jack and Jane where there's a bathroom in the middle of the two, the, the two kids rooms or something, right? Where they share. First time I ever saw a Jack and Jane bathroom was when I saw a rerun of the Brady's the Brady Bunch. And I was just like, that's so cool. They share a bathroom. And then uh, having brothers, um, the reality of sharing is not the same as the um, coolness of how they had a door on each side. And anyway, <coughs> sorry. So functional obsolescence, that's a really good example. A four bedroom with a one bathroom, whereas uh, most people want a four bedroom with a two bathroom or a three bedroom with a two bathroom. Mm -hmm. Curbable of depreciation refers to the loss in value that is economically feasible to correct. In other words, the cost to fix the problem is less than the loss in value. So fixing the problem makes economic sense. Um, a lot of times people will, will flip properties and think that they have, um, they can do a really quick fix to it. Oh, I'm just gonna put grass in the front yard. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna plant a couple trees. I'm gonna um, lamp, I'm gonna change the laminate um, um, counters in the kitchen and that should be enough. You know, and it's like, mm, not necessarily, it doesn't always work that way. Okay, good. I, I, good. Please call and let us know. 
Um, economic obsolescence. This type of depreciation occurs because of forces outside of the property, changing in the social or economic makeup of a neighborhood. Again, I'm going back to Detroit, Michigan, where it was the automobile capital of the world. And then they, uh, then all of those companies moved to other um, countries because of our, um, because of whatever happened in the, our country. And it caused there to be, that was outside the the scope of what people were expecting. They People moved out of town, not because they didn't want to live there anymore, but because they had to go where the jobs were. So changes in the social or economic makeup of the neighborhood, zoning changes, that could be an issue too, oversupply of homes, undersupply of buyers. We had an oversupply of homes at the crash because there were subdivisions being built quicker than they could even get permits. And um, so then they were bulldozing um, subdivisions and model homes because um, people were not buying or those companies went up belly up. And now those houses were um, a liability, no longer an asset because they were, they were empty and there was a lot of like destruction being done to those properties. Um, so, um, so economic, another thing about economic obsolescence is it's usually incurable. So when I talk about things like Detroit, uh, Michigan, or I talk to you about parts of Japan, um, the economic obsolescence, like in Japan specifically, uh, there was a, a poison, um, I don't know if it was the nuclear um, plant leak, but some of the areas where they're basically giving property away, if you can, if you're like a, um, it doesn't matter where you live, uh, though they, they need people to come back in and they really need people just to live in those areas. They're now for human habitation again. Um, there's not a lot that can be done uh, to cure the problem. Um, so they're doing, they're trying to, to help people come. Well, we'll give you a house. We'll do this. We'll do that. And then also in Detroit, you could buy a house for like 15. This was years ago, though. You could buy a house. I don't know if you can do it now, but you could buy a house for like $15 if you would just move in. You could buy a, a track of homes for $100 if you would just move into that property and start encouraging people to come back and, and bring business back into the area. Um, so depreciation for appraisal purposes. This book, uh, the book of depreciation calculated by an accountant is not the depreciation considered by an appraiser. Very true. An appraiser subtracts the estimate of accrued actual not book depreciation. So accrued real depreciation on a building from the cost to build new. Using a straight line method to determine the accrued depreciation, the appraiser assumes a building will decline in value the same amount each year until nothing is left. And so you'll find like, as an example, our house is going to be a hundred next year, but it has the age of a house. Uh, she's strong. She's, she's good. She's, she's got the age of a house uh, built in the seventies. So she has, or eighties, she's her age, her, because she's been kept up the, the age or the effective age versus the actual age is what we're going to talk about now. So for example, a property with an estimated effective age of 50 years would be said to depreciate at an equal rate of 2% per year. So that's two times 2% 2 times 50 equals 100% depreciation. And using this method of calculating accrued depreciation, the appraiser probably will not use the actual age of the building, but rather the effective age, which is determined by its condition, not the number of the years uh, since it was built. So our house will be 100, but uh, let's be honest, on the outside, she's looking, she, she, needs a, she needs a facelift. But on the interior, the work that has continued to be done, the plumbing, um, the um, electrical, all of those things were uh, maintained or, up, or upgraded as time progressed before they sold the property. So um, she's in good shape. So our actual age of our house is 100 by next year or 99, right? But the effective age of our house is uh, what we're at, which I think would be like a house in the 80s or maybe even the 90s, but maybe it's the 70s, we'll see. So you can see the difference. Um, depreciation for appraisal purposes continues. So actual age is the real age of the building. So our house is 99, going to be uh, to 100 in uh, 2024. Effective age is not determined by the actual age of a building, but it, it's condition and usefulness. Do you need to know actual age, the difference between that of, and effective age? Yes. The economic life of a property is the estimated period over which a building may be profitably used. So the economic life would be associated with um, say like a commercial building or something like what's the estimated period that this building will be profitable? What, how can it to continue to re, to take, to receive money off of this building? So thinking about like buildings that Costco is in versus the buildings where your local mom and pop 
um, grocery store in. Chances are the buildings, um, the economic life for the building that Costco's in is probably longer than some of these other because of the maintenance and all the, the way it was built and different things, right? So let's see what the example is on 214. If the subject property was really 25 years old, but was as well maintained, uh, but was well maintained, and it would sell for as much as uh, uh, nearby 20 year old properties, it would be said to have an effective age of 20. But the numbers are higher than that in, in some parts of California. If the house is hundred years old, it has the effective age of other homes that are selling that are either brands making new or because it's been gutted or whatever. Um, so depreciation for tax purposes. How do we know if we can get the tax break? Well, we're not tax preparers. We are realtors, right? So, and because we are realtors and real estate professionals, we go to a tax uh, professional um, to get this information. So let's see what the book says. Depreciation for income tax purposes is book depreciation or a mathematical calculation of steady depreciation or loss from the owner's original purchase price. That would be the cost basis. So whatever they paid for it and then what it's worth with regard to book depreciation. Now the slide prior talked about book two slides prior. The de book depreciation is calculated by accountants, right? Are we accountants? No, we're realtors. So when we talk about this, this isn't something we do. This is just kind of sharing what the situation is. Um, Huh, it's saying access denied. Okay, well, yeah, absolutely. I can totally send that information. Um, interesting, access denied. I wonder why, well, okay. Yeah, I can totally do that. It'll have to be at the break though, but yeah, I can totally do that. Yeah, of course. Oh my gosh, that's the easy part. So depreciation for tax purposes. Because we're not tax preparers, we're going to understand this concept um, that the depreciation um, or that steady loss um, is associated with what the person paid for it and what this book calculation is by an accountant, but it's not something that we do. It's just good for us to know that the cost basis is the original purchase price. So what's cost basis, Kathy? Good question, Kathy. Cost basis is the original purchase price of the property. This allows the owner to recover the cost of investment over a useful life of the building. So in this kind of situation, when we're talking about the cost basis, uh, I would venture to say, because we're talking about the usefulness and the value of the building, we're on on the commercial side of what appraisers are doing. The book value is currently, uh, is the current value, and this would be for accounting purposes. Notice I keep putting accounting purposes on things. So a book value is the current value of a property calculated as the original cost plus capital improvements, the minus, and then minus accumulated or accrued depreciation of an improvement. So you've got capital improvements. So you've got the, you've got the original price pr plus all the good stuff you did to it. And then it has to be, then, then whatever has been um, like any of the accrued depreciation of the improvement, all of the, all of the wear and tear and those kind of things are subtracted. Is this something that we do know the accountants do it and we pay them uh, nicely to do it. The income approach or the income capitalization approach estimates the present worth of the future benefits of ownership of a property. So there's this, um, hey, in the future, X, Y, and Z, that we should financially be in this kind of place. Are we financial advisors? No, we're realtors. We help people purchase homes. We help people purchase commercial properties. And sometimes other people that have specialties in those areas get involved to be able to present their information, such as accountants, such as appraisers, right? The title company lets us know that there's clear and marketable title. So contract rent or the amount actually paid by a renter for the use of the premises may or may not be the same as economic rent. So we need to be able to know the difference between those two. The amount of rent could bring in at, uh, at an open market. And so what are you saying? You're, you're saying, well, there could be contract rent, the rent that is received, and then there is um, maybe a change if, if this property was put back on the market or there was a lease or a lease option on the property. An appraiser evaluating property looks at the economic rent rather than the contract rent in order to discover the fair income of the property.
So how do we use capitalization for income? You're like, I don't think we're going to go in this direction. Well, this is part of the book that we're talking about if you were to walk into commercial real estate and have some of the fundamentals and understanding of that side of things. The process of calculating a property presents worth on the basis of its cap uh, of its capacity to continue to produce an income stream. This is called capitalization. So the process of calculating that is like, how long can this work? And you're like, how would I know how to do that with a building? Let's look at it from the perspective of trees. So they have an economic life, right? If we have apricot trees, the first three years are all about growing those trees. And then from there on two to three years there, it's all about maintaining those trees to get a strong harvest. So the process of calculating a, pro a property's present worth. So in year two or year three, that's the first year. So we're gonna be able to figure out the basis of its capacity and then continue to produce that income stream is called capitalization. How long are these trees going to be able to produce uh, effectively apricots or almonds or something along those lines? The capitalization converts the future income stream into an indication of the property's present worth. So there's an indication, but what if there's an almond shortage or what if there's a wildfire and we lose all the avocado growth in California? Some of these things have actually happened well, the indication is just like, hey, if we continue to go the direction we're going and there isn't a freeze and there isn't um, global cooling, there isn't glo global warming, there's not a pandemic, there's not a water shortage, where we're, this indication is roughly right in the middle of all of those things. This is what the property's present worth is because this is on, on future gain. The appraiser must determine the amount, reliability, and durability of that income stream. And the appraiser is going to look at it now they're going to bring in pandemic, but they're going to be bringing in the things that they know do happen over the course of time with regard to a property. So again, I'm going back to farming, not because um, I can't talk about retail. It's just that uh, to me, it visually uh, makes maybe a little of this a little bit easier, but maybe not. So there are five basic steps calculating the effective gross income. The effective gross income is the total annual income from the property minus any vacancy or rental loss. So loss of income becomes, um, well, on a unit is known as the vacancy factor. And a lot of times you'll find if somebody has like an Airbnb um, that they only look at the effect of gross income as 80% of what would come in on that year or 50% of what would come in on that year because they're trying to calculate in cancellations as well as holidays, even though most people go to Airbnbs during holidays, but, but the off season, if you will. Current market rents are used to determine the loss from the vacancy factor. So market rent is the rent that the property should bring in on an open market while contract rent is the actual or contracted rent paid by tenants. Determining operating expenses. So what does it cost to run this business? What does it cost to run the Airbnb? What does it cost to continue to maintain those apricot trees? Expenses are generally classified as being either fixed or variable. So fixed expenses include property taxes, insurance, and utilities, right? How, how, and the utilities on, on an apricot farm would not just be um, would be uh, the maintenance of the tractors, the tractors, the water, and all the things. If it's an Airbnb, the utilities would be the gas, the electricity, and the water maintained on that property, not just the insurance um, for the rental policy on that property, as well as um, the property taxes, making sure that those are maintained. Variable expenses include management um, and uh, what maintenance like, um, like the plumbing goes out or um, there's a freeze. So the plumbing goes out on your Airbnb, or if it's apricot trees, there's a freeze and you lose 20% of your trees to freeze. Um, calculating net operating income. So the net operating income, and I don't know that you need to know NOR, NOI, um, but it just noted on 215, is the income after paying all expenses included in maintenance reserve. It does not include the principal and interest or the debt service. And debt service means what's being paid on that property because it, it, you have a debt against that property. That, that's just always going to be there if you always have a loan. Now, if you pay off your loan, your debt service at that point is going to be the home insurance or the commercial insurance or the business insurance on the property. But if you don't owe a debt with regard to lending, um, it's going, the, the debt service thing would be taxes and insurance only, right? The capitalization rate or more accurately called the internal rate of return, the IRR, you do need to know IRR. 
um, it, that is, there is a question on one of the quizzes, um, one of the, the unit reviews, I think for IRR, there's a um, vocabulary word, like mix and match. I think IRR is on there. I could be wrong, but let's just note page 216 for the sake. Okay. So the capitalization rate is, the, is also called the internal rate of return. Do you need to know that those two things can be used synonymously with each other? Yeah. This is the uh, financial, it, this in the financial community provides for the return of invested capital plus a return on the investment. The rate is dependent upon the return a buyer will demand before investing money in a property. So please note that capitalization rate and internal uh, rate of return are the same thing. Um, calculating a market value. This is something whether you do commercial, you do re residential or, or if you decide to go into property management, you need to know what's out there. You've got to have your, your finger on the pulse of what rents are going for. There's an apartment down the street here that is the rent for the apartment is going for 2,800. And I was talking to one of the neighbors this week and we were talking about how rents are crazy. She's like, I know the rent um, for one of the apartments going the opposite direction is like $1,700. And I was like, that one right two properties away from us is 2,800 or three properties away from us, 2,800. She's like, what? I was like, yeah. So obviously one side is is a little bit more uh, genderified than the other, if you will, because the more expensive areas are the ones that are maintained or continuing to grow and build up, right? Um, I didn't even know you get an apartment for 1,700 to be honest, but that that's my own opinion. Um, in this area, I'm not saying that there aren't any, but I was like, oh, 17 is actually not bad. Um, okay, the rate is dependent upon the return the buyer will demand. Okay, so calculating the market value. Calculating the market value by dividing the net operating income by the chosen cap rate. So do you need to know how to do that? You just need to understand that calculating the market value is step five. Um, are you going to need to know that for the state exam? No. Are you going to need to know it for the open book exam? I'm going to say no on that one too. But you do need to know what the gross rent multiplier is, 216. Real estate licensees and appraisers use the gross rent multiplier to convert gross rent into market value. Gross rent is income received before any expenses are deducted. A gross rent multiplier then multiplied by the total annual rents will give the rough estimate of a property value that can then be compared with other like properties. So if you have a client that has a, an investment property that, that is that is coming, that rents are coming in, you're going to want to be able to know what the gross rents are, but you're also going to want to be able to calculate, okay, what's the cost of doing business? And it's good to know that information. So, um, so there are appraisal licensing standards. Now, back when the bubble happened in 2007, 2008, um, we could just call an appraiser and say, hey, Joe, what's up? Hey, can I be go down to 123 Main Street? Um, we really need to get that appraisal back as soon as possible, charge us whatever. And we would have that phone call. And he's like, how much does it need to come in at? Well, it's pretty much priced where it needs to be. It might be 50,000 above. I'll send you um, some information on it. And then he would get back to me and go, man, it's gonna be tough to get that. Um, it's gonna take me a little bit longer, but I think I can. And that's how that was the relationship we had with, real, with uh, appraisers. Cause the appraiser could tell me right then, yeah, I don't think that house is gonna fly. And I'm like, oh, what do we do? And he's like, well, let me call a couple people and see if there's anything that's not like he would have to do a deeper dive. And sometimes he would and sometimes come back and go, it's not worth your 500 bucks or whatever this, you, you guys are going to have to pass a heavy pass or let them know that the contingency can't be removed because I can't remove it. Maybe you can find another appraiser who can. He's like, I don't want to go squirrely. But back then there were a lot of squirrely real estate, uh, sorry, there were real estate agents and appraisers. And there's a reason I'm going to this. The appraisers qualification board establishes the minimum education experiences and examination requirements an individual must meet in order to become a licensed or certified appraiser. So in the same way you did those prerequisites and you're gonna go take that state exam after you pass all of these three open book exams, you're, you're going to, uh, it's that same thing, but it's, it's, it's under the, the process that they go through. They're going through something a lot like what you're going through. They're being told about the law, they're being explained and some of what our jobs are going to be, they're kind of being told, hey, this is what you're going to do. And these are the people you're going to work with or the, the areas in the field you're going to work with. The appraiser's standard board, um, just like the California Department of Real Estate for us, develops, interprets, and amends the uniform standard professional appraisal practices like the California Department of Real Estate will amend or require the California Association of Realtors to amend the documents that we use. You don't have to use those, uh, those documents, but they do, okay? A lot of people feel far more comfortable with them. 
The appraiser's practice board will identify and the issue opinion uh, and issue opinions on recognized valuation methods and te techniques which may apply to all disciplines within the appraisal profession. So if anything comes up, they're going to review it and check on it. So in California, the California Department of Real Estate licenses appraisers. So there's a I know that we we they have like we have the commissioner over real estate. We also have um, um, the, uh, there's an appraisal board and some other things. So you've got the California standard board, you've got the appraisal practice board. And so you can see where the commissioner can't do everything. The commissioner's over, over, the, over the state and then they have the breakdown of um, those different areas. So the book stops with the commissioner is probably the best way of explaining what I'm saying. So types of appraisal licenses that are out there, there's the trainee license, which actually technically doesn't get you very far. There's the residential license for residential properties, the certified residential license, and then the certified general license are out there as well. So the higher you are on the totem pole, pole if you will, um, the more opportunities you have to do a number of different um, appraisals out there. If you're a trainee, I don't know if you guys are aware of anyone that does any type of appraisals. I was hoping I could get my cousin on the other side of the family in because he is an appraiser to explain the difference of these things. And I might interview him and just have it on the YouTubes. But basically a trainee is putting in their hours and there's a number of hours they have to put in before they can become an appraiser. And we don't have that in real estate and we don't have that um, in some other fields. But in appraisals, they're, they're very serious about a lot of these things. Um, they have continued education just like we do. So registered appraisal management companies, um, it, company law, it should say law. So in 2009, the California appraisal management company law was enacted requiring the registration of appraisal management companies with the California Department of Real Estate appraisers. So there's this connection now where uh, before there wasn't necessarily, we weren't, uh, being, uh, we weren't being regulated in the same way or by the same area. So 2009, after the crash, there was a lot of regulation required by the appraisal, uh, by the way appraisals were being done. And that's why you have to be a lender approved appraiser now. And if that lender's approving the loan, then they're going to direct which appraiser is actually gonna go out to do um, the purchases uh, or the, the, the appraisals on those properties. So. Um, so the BP code section 11302 defines the appraisal management company as any entity that satisfies all of the following conditions, maintains an approved list containing 11 or more licensed or certified appraisers who are independent contractors or employ 11 or more licensed certified appraisers who are employees, two, receives requests for appraisals from one or more client and for a fee delegates appraisal assignments for completion by its independent contractors or employee um, appraisers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is unit 11. All right, let's jump into unit 12. But uh, in about four minutes, I'll, I'll see, actually, you know what, hold on a second. I should have received a notice on um, that said something like uh, there, somebody's wanting to gain access. Okay, I do not have. Okay, uh, we'll do it at the break. There's like four emails asking for a couple different things. So we'll take care of that um, in about eight minutes. All right, let's jump over to unit 12. So land use subdivisions and housing. And you're like, isn't this basically what we've been doing in the last two pages? Yeah, our last two units, yeah. So we're gonna to continue to build on that. So due to the rapid and continuing growth of cities and the movement of people in into once quiet rural areas. And for those of you that have always lived uh, in the city, you might not um, know there are parts of California that are actually still very rural. I'm sure you know about it, but what I mean is there are people that have only lived in the most rural parts of California. And they're like, I'd never live in a big city. I'm a country girl. And I'm like, we're not even country. We're, Cal we're still California, even if we're our country. Such population changes have created problems that have led to an increase in regulation because people have been breaking the law. All right, page 229. 12A, I, these are the things I want you to be able to do before we get to break, but I don't think we're gonna do it, but we're gonna try. Identify methods for government regulation of land use, recognize the procedures of land planning and development, recall housing and construction regulations, and then classify 
different construction and building styles. That's going to be the funnest part. So the power of eminent domain, and we talked a little bit about this in the last unit, where there's actually appraisals done on properties uh, and uh, that are being condemned so that the value of that property can be presented. Why is that, why is that um, appraisal being done? Because eminent domain is happening on that property. That doesn't change the value of the, of the property at this time. It just clears, clarify, it clarifies to the appraiser who's asking for the appraisal. So the state or the, or the county or the city would be asking for it. The power of eminent domain permits the government, and that would be any and all of the parts of the government, the state, the city, the county, to take private property from the owner of the, of the, um, of the property, but it must be for public good or for public use, and they have to pay fair market value. I think we've talked about police power in the past, but I want you to know the term and not necessarily the where we are um, as a country right now. We need to know what the term means. Police power is the power of the state to enact the power of the state, the county, the city, um, all of them, right? All of those. The power of the of the all of the powers that be state to enact laws within constitutional limits, and they're supposed to stay within the constitution um, to promote the order, safety, health, morals, and general wealth, welfare of our society. That's the term and the definition on 229. Are you going to need to know police power for um, the open book exam? I think you guys are going to hit that one running. I'm not worried about that one for you, but it doesn't hurt to know that it's on 229. In California, every city and county must adopt a comprehensive or master plan known as the general plan for long-term physical development. And I always think when I hear the words general plan, I always hear that movie Hot Fuzz where they say it was for the greater good. And the reality of the situation is there's a general plan for every town and every city in the state of California. And they have mapped out about 20 or 30 years where certain things are going to go. And so if you go onto Google Maps and you put in your address and then you go to the satellite, you can see satellite and then you can see the map. There's a few different versions of your screen you can see. And the one that's the map is going to show lots of streets. And you're like, those streets aren't there yet. But that's what they're projecting on the general plan. There are going to be streets in the near future. And that near future could be 50 years from now. Every general plan must cover the development issues in the following seven major categories. Land use, circulation, not just our legs, but the circulation of what's going around in that area. Housing, conservation, we gotta make sure that it's eco-friendly, right? Open space, noise, and safety. Cities and counties located on the coast must also address coastal development and protections of natural resources and wetlands. It's just not located on the coast. Um, there are inland um, areas as well that have some of these concerns, but the book is talking about the ones on the coast because we're going to go on, we're going to talk about the coast, but there are other parts of California that there are safety uh, precautions set for the wildlife in the area. Central Valley, right off of I-5, um, there was a farmer that had been killing what he thought were gophers for years, and he was the third generation farmer, um, and he was found, he was caught killing a gopher and um, he was like, you guys, they've been with our, they've been on the property for years and whatever. Well, they found out it was, uh, it's a wild cousin of second cousin twice removed of a gopher that is going extinct. And so then it turned into a situation where he could no longer farm the land because it was their natural habitat. So there are things like that that are going on. You're like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, it's California. You guys, it's California. There's all kinds of stuff like that that happens. So let's jump over to um, zoning 230, the regulation of structures and uses of property within selected districts are known as zoning. There's your term, there's your definition. A zoning ordinance primarily implements the general plan by regulating land use for individual product projects, whereas general plan is more far reaching and future oriented. So when I was saying about how those streets might be going in or that, or your area might become um, the next tract or subdivision, I'm not saying next week, I'm saying it could happen in your child's lifetime or in your grand grandchildren's lifetimes. So planning and development, California is so organized that the symbols that we use in our county are not the same symbols that are being used in your county. We might use A for agriculture, but you might not use A for agriculture, but there are symbols used to show the different zoning areas. C usually is for commercial, R1 is usually for single family homes, but you and I both know that a single family home is anything that's one to four units. And I know that R2 is a duplex, but you could have a duplex on, on a single family residence uh, property. You can have four units on a single family resident property, even though it says it's zoned R1 in state of California. So this is an example of A for agriculture, C for commercial, um, 
I'm just giving you examples. Not all counties use the same abbreviation. So you should be Googling your area when you're working with your clients to make sure that you understand the abbreviation of the area that you're in. Usually every district is zoned for different types of uses known as permitted uses and conditional uses. You need to know the difference between permitted and conditional. So please note page 231. Permitted uses meet the current use requirements within the district. So if it's zoned agriculture, it's permitted uh, or it, it, the, the requirement is it has got to be agricultural, right? Conditional uses do not meet the current use requirement, but may be allowed by obtaining a special permit known as a conditional use permit. You can build, um, you could build a school. There might be a conditional use for a school in that area because there's not a school in that area, but it's an agricultural area. When an area is rezoned to another use, existing properties may retain the previous zoning under a grandfather clause, but grandfather's clauses can be kicked out So over time. So a grandfather clause is a good thing. So let's say we're in an agricultural area and it's now been rezoned for residential. Those agricultural uh, people can stay there because they are grandfathered in. All right, take that second break of the day. And I will get um, everyone that's telling me that they're not, um, there aren't a lot of people, but there are a few people that are asking. I can take the exam. Oh, okay. I'm getting a couple people. So customer service. Let me see if I have the number for customer service. Let's see. Good morning. Sorry about that. I was wondering if I could have access to the recorded class sessions. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put it, the link in the chat as well, because I am not getting the private messages I'm getting on chat and the private messages I'm getting on my email are not the same one. So let's, yeah, no, no, I'm with you, but I'm not seeing an email. I usually get an email alert that says that a person is not able to um, get in and then I can just click a, it's okay. Um, so I was checking for those. And I've got a couple people sharing with me also that they're having a struggle um, with uh, customer service. Zoom sessions. Yeah, I'm going to give me two minutes and we will make sure we take care of that. Let me just do it off the other, uh, trying to do stuff on my phone is not benefiting anyone. Let's try to do the other laptop. I got, we've got the Zoom on that and we got the laptop over here. So let's do, let's do this. We're gonna do this over um, Missy's head. She's sitting with us. All right. Um, Oh, you okay? Hi, Bubba. All right, let me op open up my emails. I know it seems like we're not in class, but we're still in class. We are. She's like, are we going to do something fun today? After. Do something fun after. Um, sorry, buddy. I was wondering if you could access the, the recorded class sessions. Yeah. Okay. And then.
Okay. Okay, and then we have So customer service is support. Once again. Okay, now it should, oh, hold on a second. Um, okay, all of the emails, I haven't received any alerts that said a link was broken, but that doesn't mean a leak wasn't broken. That just means uh, there must be a link issue. So let me check. here okay we're just gonna run with it so let's do this i'm gonna send the link right now and um we'll we'll get to the bottom of it to see why. Every day, okay. Okay. So it should be sent. It should be received. Okay. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. All right. Um, and let's do, I'll put it in chat again so that everyone can pop in. Um, and what I mean by again, isn't like it happened today, just that make sure that we're good. The, um, everything is in the Google Drive. It may not be 100% organized the way you guys would want it organized. And I'm okay with that because I, 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 we don't all think the same way. But this is really so that you have another opportunity um, to be reviewing information, whether or not we're, whether we're together or not. 
Um, so here is the, the Google link for uh, just information and it also helps. Awesome, perfect. Thank you for letting me know. Um, it lets you guys know that we're um, not just in it to win it, but that we are, um, we have this additional resource. So it should show you the principles folder, the practices and the legal aspects, and then also a folder that says extra good stuff. The extra good stuff is going to give you information about way, where areas of places you can go. I actually need to do a deep dive on every folder now and try to figure out what's been deleted and what has not, because I've seen stuff move and I'm like, who knows, maybe it's Google, but Google, uh, Adam's like, Google doesn't work that way, Kathy. So I might have to move everything back to like a year ago um, at when I'm transitioning everything, but I'd rather review it based on the, the most recent version of the books and the way things are going. Um, and then the live Q and A and the events, there's a folder for that. So if you don't have the link or wanna know, we're gonna try to do, I did get a message from Anthony saying, I need to correct because uh, correct the links because it shows a PM, like a Thursday PM at 6.30. I'm gonna try to stick with the Thursday PM at 6.30. And then, uh, but today's the day of like, hey, we're gonna do our final and um, you know, let's walk through it. But the unit reviews, as well as um, any anything, so the unit reviews um, digitally, as well as in the book should benefit you greatly for your exam. But we're gonna finish a couple outlines that we have. Um, and that being said, let's hit the ground running again, guys. Our coffee break is over. Okay. Let's do this. Um, I wonder if like, hi, if, Kathy. Yeah, Stacy. Um, so on chapter 11, um, I just want to make sure that I read something on your, on your PowerPoint right now. At the end of the chapter, it said something under the appraisal licensing standards. It said in California, the borough of the real estate appraisers no longer are doing the license appraisers. So because they, in the book, it doesn't say that. It's on it's, your PowerPoint, you had that. The but Bureau of Real Estate? We don't, uh -huh. there's there's no Bureau of Real Estate. So the books have not okay, been so. Yeah, so it, it's okay. the California, it, we are with the California Department of Real Estate. And then uh -huh. when the crash, thank you, Stacy. when the crash happened, Mm -hmm. the bureau the federal government came in and and started monitoring every state and how the regulatory system was working so basically they came in and not purposely but slapped the hand of the commissioner and was like hey you guys aren't doing things right here and the commissioner's like everybody's doing it no he didn't say that i please if you if the department of real estate is <laughs> watching this i i'm joking but what happened was the bureau took over all of the, all of it, and then re-regulated re or regulated things even more in a more strict manner. Because I mean, how many times have we gone through stuff and you're like, we're not going to re, I'm not going to be in that part of the industry. Well, the reason why it's being shared with you is there's been justification in court. Well, your honor, I wasn't aware that an appraiser did this or your honor, I wasn't. And the, that's when the, 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 the court is like, but you're a specialist in real estate. So in the book, if it says anything like Bureau of Real Estate, instead of saying California Department of Real Estate or DRE, um, I, uh, my outlines have changed it back because within a couple of the last couple of years, it's been changed. It's been changed from the California Department of Real Estate. Um, excuse me. It's been changed back to the California Department of Real Estate, which means that the federal government released the regulatory um, uh, or the um, looking over your shoulder, if you will. And so anywhere I see that, it's not really for your book exam that you need to know that, but the California Department of Real Estate is now back on um, on the throne, if you will. And the federal government's okay. not really- I just wanted clarification because I was like, wait, hold on. I read something different on your yeah. PowerPoint versus so what's inside says, the book. No, no, no. So I'm with you on that. So if it said anywhere in the, in the, anywhere in the book, if it says Cal- BRE, um, uh -huh. it is uh, no longer um, um, in control, if you want to call it that. Um, okay. Uh, we are regulated by who we were regulated before, um, um, by the uh, DRE, DRE mm -hmm. or uh, what I call the California, we all do, Department of Department. Real Estate. Yeah. Real estate. So anywhere you see mm -hmm. Cal BRE and it should be in the outline in different places, but I used to like hammer at home and I'm not going to hammer at home with you guys. Cause that's a conversation we can have. Whereas one of the first classes I ever taught, I'm like, we're not under the California Bureau of, of Real Estate or, and it was called Cal BRE, but it was federally governed. I'm all, 
we're back to the DR, but just so you guys know that when I first started, it was the DRE. So it was dre.ca.gov. And then when the crash um, happened and the federal government came in, it was still the same web website, dre.ca.gov. And then now that it's transitioned back, it's still this, the dre.ca.gov. So when you're like, why are you doing, why do you, you don't talk in abbreviations. That's the only thing I talk about in abbreviations. It's on the DRE website. And I've had so many students ask me, What's the website again? DRE.ca.gov. So instead of me just saying DRE, I, and I'm, I don't think I've done that with you guys, but it, there were so many students prior that have asked that I'm like, you guys. So I just name the website instead, which is weird. Um, but it's just that we are no longer under the Cal Beery, the California Bureau of Real Estate, the Bureau of Investigating, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The, 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 when it, the moment bureau comes in the door, you're like, nah, the feds are in on that, you know? So uh, not that we're all in the forties and like walking around with guns, but I mean, if there's like this weird, um, anyway, so it's the California, it's now the California department of real estate. It always was, but the federal government's yes. like, okay, we've regulated, regulated you guys enough that we know that you can get back on track, but they basically Cal BRE was, was over everything for 10 years. And so that's why a lot of you, it's not just, it's not just these books, you'll see it in a lot of stuff, like any advertisements. Well, the Cal BRE says this, well, the Cal BRE isn't over it anymore. So it just kind of lets you know, there's a line in the sand on this side of the pandemic on, and it happened during the pandemic. I believe it happened, I think in 2020, it might've been 2018, but I think it's, who knows anything from 2018 till 2022 is like one year, like in my memory, I don't, I've lost, I think we should be able to lose those years of our lives too. You know, like we're back on subtract five years from your life. And then that's the age you are today. Um, just cause the, um, the pandemic was so insane, but yeah, if you guys want to look it up, you can, but the Cal BRE is no longer, um, running things. It's the California department of real estate or the DRE. And, um, it is, uh, the, <laughs> Uh, dre.ca.gov. And if you ever want to do a, um, like a link, if you want to find the vocabulary, or if you ever, if you want to look at the book on the California Department of Real Estate website, you can actually do a Google search. And the Google search would be um, um, dre. I don't know, I hit that one instead of dot uh, gov. And then what I'll do is I'll do comma um, glossary. And what it'll do is it'll throw you into their um, education stuff because they actually do have that glossary. And that's the one that I want you guys to work off of. Um, so that, I do stuff like that in order to find the link quicker. I'll use our, our, our departments because it's ours. You know, it's the department we're under. Their website as a, on a Google search, the dre.ca.gov comma glossary or comma um, estimated um, application times or comma um, live scan or any, that way I can find the information on their website and not because Google used to, when Google was the cat's meow, Google used to, you could, you could just put in DRE, a comma, glossary or whatever. And then you get these, a ton of advertisements now of these schools that want you to go and buy classes from them. You're like, no, I just want to go to the department of real estate, their information. I, I just want to know their application turn times or their this or their that. And so, um, Google has now become the yahoo.com of, of, of the nineties and everything's, there's a lot of advertisements. So I just want to encourage you guys, when you do Google searches with regards to the department of real estate, put in the department of real estate website address, and then put in glossary or, um, um, exam, um, application information or like e-licensing. And we'll talk about e-licensing to actually go through it together, um, in book three, but good. Good question, Stacey. I appreciate it. And it needed to be a bit clarified. Sometimes I remember Thank to you. clarify this stuff. And then sometimes I'm like, well, we'll talk about it when you guys bring it up. But yeah, no, absolutely. And you won't be questioned about that on the open book exam. You will be questioned about that on the state exam. So that's why I'll like push really hard. We're no longer the Cal BRE. Okay. Um, but you'll hear that for three months versus just this book. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see highlighted stuff, but yeah, no problem. Um, let's jump over to page 231. So we've been talking about the, uh, right before the break, we are talking about permitted uses and conditional uses on a property. So what about a conditional use permit? This allows a land use that may be incompatible with the other uses existing in that zone or in that area that zone for something specific. The use is allowed as long as the project owner complies with the conditions specified to the permit. So you get a conditional permit to do a certain type of job, like you wanna bring a morgue into a residential area or something like that, then there, there, it's a conditional use permit. On these conditions, we will allow you to have a morgue here. Um, zoning and use variances. A city and a county may allow a variance 
something varied from the norm, right? Or an exception to an existing zoning regulation for a special reason. So let's look at the example in 231. If a lot has an irregular shape and does not meet the standard zoning for a side yard and a setback. So side yards are usually like five feet from the property line. The, the, you, you can't build your house more than five feet from it or it's 10 feet, depends on your area. The owner is at a disadvantage when trying to develop a property if they have a weird irregular shape lot, right? So the owner may ask the city or county for a waiver or zoning variance, which would allow a property to be developed. So in summary, a variance is simply a deviation from the developed standard. So in these kind of situations where it's maybe a thin, long um, um, or wide um, piece of property, but in order to get a normal size house on that property, like a standard 12, 11, 12, 1300 square foot home, they might need to move the, the property line or the house closer to that fence line in order to have a standard size room or something along those lines. So these type of variances are out there. They need to be applied for. You can't just go and start building. Um, not that you guys would do that, but there are people that do that. And they're like, well, I, I built it. It should be fine. If it's not permitted, we can't bring it in at value. And sometimes lending institutions will say, hey, we don't mind helping you buy that house, but you're gonna have to bulldoze half that house because it's not permitted. It becomes a liability risk and not an asset. Um, so permits are kind of a big deal. Um, a lot of a big deal. So specific plan. So after a general plan is adopted, some cities and counties carry out the proposed land uses through spe um, specific plans. So there's specific things. So it, this pertains to a particular development site or area of the general plan. That specific plan isn't like, okay, this since the general plan said that we're going to do all these things. It's very much so like, we're going to build this part of it, specific plan, this part of it's going to be adopted. And we're going to work on that because for the general plan, this part needs to be accomplished. Environmentally sensitive lands are a big deal in California, not necessarily other states, but California is huge on making sure that we protect the environment. Why? Well, because the majority of the income, not the majority, a large amount of the income that comes into California is associated with our, our, um, our agriculture. And it's not just our plants, it's our, our wildlife, it's the dairy, it's, all, it's the almonds, the milk, all the different types of milk, all the plant-based and all the animal. We do it all. Welcome to California. Land and water areas containing natural features or ecological functions of such significant uh, of, of such significance um, as to warrant their protection are considered environmentally sensitive lands. So if, if we have natural water, if we have natural oil, if we have natural um, types of minerals, uh, the natural things, the animals, that stuff would needs to be protected. And this is where we go over to local coastal programs. So under the California Coastal Act, you need to know this for the book exam. You definitely need to know this for the state exam. Under the California Coastal Act, 15 coastal counties and 58 cities along with the state of California have stewardships of 1,100 miles of coastal that stretch from where? Oregon to Mexico. And you need to know all of that information. So please note it on 232. The coastal zone contains over 1.5 million acres of land and you need to know that it, it, it has a 1.5 million acres of land that reaches from what to what, and then you'll have those four options there. Three miles at sea to an inland boundary that varies from a few blocks in, of urban areas to about five miles in less developed areas. The that is going to be one of the answers to one of the questions, but you're also going to be asked questions with regards to the 15 counties and the 58 cities. And I don't know exactly how they're going to ask you those questions, but you will have one or both of those questions definitely on the state exam. And you will have one or both of those questions on the open book because it's really important information for us to know. Um, the Clean Water Act or CWA of 1977, page 233. Thank you, page 233, perfect. On both of those, it's 233. I am one page off every day, but I'm okay with that. The Clean Water Act of 77 regulates the discharge of pollutants into water in the United States. So that's a federal thing, but we've got, but what we're talking about, so we're not just talking about state concerns. We're talking about the federal government saying, hey, by the way, the discharge of pollution is a kind of a big deal for us, right? So um, it's everywhere in California, including the wetlands. It can't, it's not just parts uh, that are right on the coast. So wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year or for varying periods during the year. So like if you think of places like Louisiana, 
that is very marshy, right? Very, very, uh, their, their water, their, their ground is very um, moist. Great word, right? Speaking of that, did you guys see the pictures of Venice being dried out? Insane. Venice is always sinking, but not right now. They don't have any water. Um, okay, so I'm thinking about wetlands. I'm thinking of things like Venice. I'm thinking about things like Louisiana. I'm thinking about thing, uh, places like Florida. I know Venice isn't part of our country, but it is important to understand that water and areas and homes where water and, and buildings where water um, is prominent are considered wetlands. They don't have to just be on the coast. The two, um, there are two types of wetlands. There's coastal wetlands and then there's inland wetlands. Part of the reason I brought those things up. So coastal or tidal wetlands are found along California's Pacific shoreline. Um, a shoreline is the intersection of the land with the water. Do you need to know a shoreline? Well, right there on 233, we have the answer. Um, uh, estuaries or an estuary is an area where seawater and freshwater mix. And, and um, I've seen, at, there's an estuary, uh, we went on a cruise back in the day and um, we were down in South America and you could actually see where the fresh and the salt water um, connected, the estuary. So it was interesting. Um, inland wetlands are found in deltas, swamps, marshes, low-lying areas of lakes and ponds, and in floodplains along rivers as well as streams. A floodplain, you do, do need to know this, is a low land adjacent to a river, lake, or ocean. Um, a lot of times you'll find that there are different parts for a country that during the rainy season, they flood. Well, it's low land adjacent to a river, lake, or ocean. It's lower than um, the level that the water or the sea is going to rise or the water is going to rise during that season. Um, Oak Woodlands Con Conservation Act of 2001 was enacted to protect the oak wood, um, woodlands from residential, commercial, and industrial development or conversion of oak woodlands to intensive agricultural development. So what does this mean, Kathy? Well, California Oak Woodlands Conservation Program <laughs> has said that if you have oak trees on your house, you cannot legally cut them down without getting a permit and going through the process of possibly having an arborist come out and do it or trim on them even. Since over 80% of the remaining oak trees are found on private property, this program offers landowners an opportunity to obtain funding to maintain and restore the oak woodlands. Also, because it's illegal to cut those trees down and you're gonna get in trouble. But people, people can't, you can cut down a, a particular, uh, and you, you bring in the arborist to trim down the larger parts and some other stuff to protect the trees. And the, it's not, it's just so you guys know, when it talks about this um, Oak Woodlands Conservation Act, it's not saying that in the forest, the oak forest that we have in California, this, these are, these are trees that have been planted all across America and specifically California. And if they're in your backyard, they have rights to. Um, a subdivision, I think you guys know what this is, but let's just refresh, is a division of land into five or more lots for the purpose of sale. Notice the word five, California loves five. Five or more is commercial, right? When it comes to units of prop on, a, on a property, four, a one to four is residential. So five or more units um, um, in an apartment complex on a property. So in that same respect, a subdivision is the division of land into five or more lots for the purpose of sale, lease, or financing. Um, some subdivisions are also developed for commercial purposes, the commercial acre. And you're like, but I thought you just said, we're, I'm talk, I, I, should, I was too slight of hand. So when it comes to a subdivision, it's five or more lots. When it comes to a commercial uh, um, apartment complex, it's five or more units. When it comes to a residential property, you can have one to four units on one lot, but this subdivision specifically is talking about dividing the land into five pieces. Some subdivisions are also developed for commercial purposes. So a commercial acre is the area remaining from an acre of newly subdivided land after deducting the area that, that needs to be devoted to streets, sidewalks, alleys, curbs, and the like, because in order to maintain that commercial property, um, or have a commercial property, people need to be able to drive in or drive on or park or so on and so forth, right? It is also re referred to as a buildable acre. Do you need to know that commercial acre is buildable acre? It's a good idea to know those two things. So a parcel of land is subdivided into lots for the purpose of sale. And you can see how some of these lots are square 
And then some of these lots have a little bit more of a stranger outline. Obviously the square ones are fine, but the ones that are a little bit more unique, a lot of times those ones are the last to sell because people want the side yards and the backyard. They want everything to be squared off. <clears throat> so there are subdivision, and I'm sure you know this, there are residential subdivision laws, and there are two basic laws under which subdivisions are controlled in California. So there's the Subdivisions Map Act, and then there's the Subdivided Lands Law, and we want to talk about those two. So under the Subdivision Map Act, the city or county is authorized to control the orderly and proper development of a community. And then under the subdivided lands law, the real estate commissioner regulates conditions surrounding the sale or lease of subdivided real property, while the city or county regulates the lot design and physical improvement. So there are certain things um, that your local, the local authorities like counties and stuff can say, yeah, we are totally cool with you guys having the subdivision there, but because that land at one point was an apricot orchard and you guys had to pull out 500 apricot trees. We need at least 500 trees planted in their place. There's things, there's, there's things associated with certain areas that would be regulated under these two acts. The Cal California has adopted the guidelines set forth by the California Environmental Quality Act. Do you need to know the CEQA? Not necessarily as the abbreviation, but you definitely need to know the California Environmental Quality Act. It, to ensure it ensures that the government agencies consider the environmental prior the environmental sorry let me turn this guy off she yelled it in my ear and i heard it on the other laptop but um that we're good sorry i don't know if you guys can hear surrey but she's like talking to me so um before because of the california environmental quality act it will ensure government agencies uh, have considered any of the um, environmental um, issues prior to approving a building project. Meaning, um, as an example, there was a piece of property that Adam and I wanted to buy that was up near Silmar and um, or on the way uh, up to Fort to where 14 and 5 split. And there were um, at environmental issues on that property because there were naturally growing plants and wildlife. And they, even though we wanted to revitalize uh, the, the, the property and the home, and it used to be a school, it was like a really cool piece of property and the train drove through it for, um, for commuting and stuff. It was a really very cool piece of property. Um, there were environmental concerns because the person that had owned the property prior to us had been dumping dirty soil and we don't know what was in the soil. So then there's a concern where we're testing and different things. So government agencies, the building and safety department were like, hey, We'd love for you guys to revitalize this property, but there's a few things. There's already some economic or not economic, but environmental concerns. So these have to be checked before a building project can be done or before revitalizing this property because of the failure of the previous owner being so destructive. An environmental impact report or an EIR. Do you need to know what ER, EIR stands for? Yes, you do need to know that EIR stands for environmental impact report. This is a study on how a development will affect the, eco the ecology of a surrounding area. So it's like, hey, we wanna put in 500 houses um, in the foothills on the way up to Mammoth. And they're like, okay, 500 houses, That's um, that would be 10,000 cars or more because people might have teenagers. That's uh, at least two more fire departments, a police department, meaning stations. Um, we're gonna need to get grocery stores and gas stations over there. The general plan, you know, we talked about the general plan, that's how, um, the government or the powers that be, whether it's this, the safety and building code uh, authorities or just the the whole entire department. So you could kind of see where um, people would like come in and go, oh my gosh, like we you guys can't build 5,000 new homes in that area because it's going, that dense population is going to affect the freeway in that area and stuff. So there's things that they look at, that environmental um, concern. So they would they would understand that through the process of the environmental impact report, they'd have a study on how a development would affect that area. Um, if it determined that a proposed subdivision will have no adverse effect and the on the environment, the city and county prepare a negative declaration. So if it has no effect, um, it's there's no uh, there's no problem. We are will not be uh, there will not be zombies. So the negative uh, declaration means there's no. Um, there's not going to be a problem in the area. We're not going to cause there to be um, a, a problem in the area. This um, environmental um, impact is, is, is minimal. 
to the area. It's not going to affect the wildlife. It's not going to affect the ingress egress of the neighborhoods. It's not going to affect the freeway. It's not going to take over the water. We don't have to put in a new water system up there or a new well system. <laughs> Excuse me, and so on and so forth. 5,000 houses, yes, yes, we know it's going to happen. But if it's 500 houses or 50 houses, it might not. The first, so when it comes to the MAP Act, it has two major, subdivision MAP Act has two objectives. The first is to coordinate the subdivision plans and planning, including lot design, water supply. As a reminder, water, the clean water is on one side of your house, the, the water that the gray water is not on the same side. You don't cross the streams. I talk about Ghostbusters and other movies a lot. You cannot have the clean water and the gray water or the dirty water uh, running on the same side of the house. So you can see why um, the first is coordinating the subdivision plans and planning, including lot design, water supply, street patterns, right of way for drainage and sewers. So you have the water supply. Notice it's two. You're like, aren't those the same thing? No. Water supply is it's tis tasty. And uh, the drainage and sewer is uh, if it's yellow or brown, flush it down. So they those are two. They have to make sure that they have both of those things on the plans with the community pattern and plan as laid out by the local planning authority. So people don't just go willy nilly, we're gonna go, we're gonna go do this and that on a property. You'll, you'll notice that as you drive through, you're gonna start recognizing if you don't already do it in subdivisions where certain things are located. Oh, everybody has their electricity over here. Oh, everybody has this over here and that kind of thing. The second objective is to ensure, and it's for safety. The second objective is to ensure initial property improvement of areas dedicated for public purposes by having that subdivider file subdivision maps, including public streets and other public areas so that these necessities will not become an undue burden on the future of um, taxpayers in that community. And one of the things we talked about in a couple chapters before is that we have special assessment taxes, right? So we have our, our standard 1% property taxes, but those special assessment taxes go towards the infrastructure of water, whether it's clean or whether it's uh, gray water, right? Whether uh, the streets need to continue to be paved or they need to be repaved. Now there's more potholes. We've got more people driving through the area. So now we're going to have another special assessment tax with regard to the amount of people that are coming and going and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's, it, there's a lot of these things that need to be balanced out. The Subdivision Map Act requires every city and county to regulate subdivisions for which a tentative and final track map or a parcel map are required. So tentative means we would love to do this, and the final uh, track map is like, this is what you guys get to do. So we are the subdivider or this, we are the builder, right? The developer. So we have this tentative track map and this map is proposing to the subdivision uh, what we're wanting to do to the subdivision and how it's going to work. It's used to make sure that the improvements such as the lot layout, the sizes, the configurations, the grading plans, the traffic access, the street alignments and every el everything else has been uh, presented so that there is no question and that it moves forward and will conform to, what did we talk about before? The general plan. We can't just do a subdivision that's crazy and there's only one way in um, and, and, um, and that same way in is the same way out. There, the plan would have to make sense for the area They'd, so that you don't have like a bottleneck situation. Um, I, um, a friend of mine used to live at um, Eagle Ridge, which is a golf course in Gilroy. And they lived there right before the school went in across from the main gate. And even before the school went in be across the main gate, um, it would still kind of bottleneck at like eight o'clock. And so one of the things she would tell me is she would leave her house 30 minutes early just so she didn't have to sit in traffic at her safe gate uh, to get out because of the way it was handled. And then the school <clears throat> was put in and then it backed it up even further. So um, for the greater good or for the general plan, um, it maybe that part of, Gilroy wasn't necessarily mapped out to the best of the ability of the people living in the area. Um, so that, that that tentative and that final track did go in for both of those companies, whether it was the school or the, the, the uh, Department of Education and this gated community, but the gated community was there for many years prior to the school going in and they were approved to have the gate there. Maybe the gate should have been moved down to uh, two lots or half an acre or something, who knows. The final track map indicates any, charge, uh, any changes required by the planning commission and is recorded in the county where the property is located. So that final track is like done and done. Here we go, we're moving, we're cooking. A parcel map pertains to a parcel of land that will be subdivided into less than five parcels 
or units and shows land boundary streets and parcel numbers. So a sample of a basic outline of a, of a final map preparation and approval can be viewed in this unit. Um, <clears throat> do you need to know what a parcel map is? Usually with a preliminary title report, which is the title report that you get, there'll be a parcel map that'll show the house or the property that your um, client has owns or is about to own. And that parcel map is an eight and a half by 11 sheet and it'll have their house and then it'll have the other tracks, the other homes, um, their, their lots and how they're um, measured and information on there. And that's uh, what a parcel map kind of looks like. Um, it, or what I should say is <clears throat> you'll be seeing them. You'll be seeing them um, as new agents. So health and sanitation, local health officers and local code enforcement officers um, for the state, as well as local health laws um, are, are there to ensure the sanitary conditions of a housing track and the process by which um, all of these things, we talked about the, the gray water and the, the clear water, right? The local health officials may determine if water is potable, which means it's safe to drink. So when I talk about water and then we talk about gray water, gray water is not for drinking. <clears throat> so a percolation test would be tested in the area a te the percolation test is used to determine the ability of the land to absorb and drain water and is frequently used when installing septic systems. And a septic system isn't the, the city sewer. Septic system is where you have to put in your own um, or have a company come in and bring in a septic. Um, it's basically a, a cement, like a cement box, a really large cement box that has water and different thing, different elements. It's got a, a level of gravel and sand and different things where when the gray water runs into it, it does a filtration system and it helps filter that water before it gets out into the soil, which could possibly get into the um, um, potable water, the drinking water. And so there's reasons why um, there are officers that enforce state and local health um, laws to make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen. A septic tank is a sewage settling tank, which must be at least five feet away from the improvements. And you're like, Kathy, what does the improvement mean? Well, that's the house, home, barn, et cetera. It doesn't have to be that far away from the home. Um, it's for uh, human habitation is what it's actually talking about. So it has to be um, five feet away and you don't want it right next to the house anyway, because it ha you, you, don't, you shouldn't be walking on it. <clears throat> To ensure proper drainage, the water table must be determined. Um, so you need to figure out, well, let's go through it on 234. The water table is the natural level where water will be found either above or below the surface of the ground. So percolating water is underground water, not flowing in a defined channel, um, meaning that it's, it's just there. It doesn't go one way or the other. It goes wherever it wants to. But a defined channel is any natural water course, even though dry during a good portion of the year, so not the rainy season, right? Local health officers have the authority to stop any development with problems in these areas because those defined channels may not be running water today, but they need to be protected because they will be running water during rainy season. Um, and it's like, oh, well, California is in a drought, so we can just develop. No, that's not how it works. The general plan is always going to keep those areas safe and open or protected. So 234, subdivided lands law. The subdivided lands law is directly administered by the real estate commissioner. Its objective is to protect buyers of property in new subdivisions from fraud, misrepresentation, or deceit in the marketing of subdivided lots, parcels, units, and undivided interest. And if it's undivided interest, then that means it's a, that interest in that one piece of property is uh, has more than one entity interested in it or financially connected to it. So it needs to identify, it needs to be identified. We're gonna be talking about that over the next few slides. The public report under the subdivided lands law is a document disclosing all important facts about the marketing and finance of a subdivision, keeping it within the letter of the law. The public report must show that the subdivider or the developer, whoever's developing the property can complete and maintain all improvements. And what are the improvements? Well, it's the houses, but it's also the streets and the lights and all the things that are improving the land from just being a piece of land and that the lots or parcels can be used for the purpose for which they were being sold. So they were being, or they are being sold to make homes or to the improvement to be a home and everything that goes with a home on that. So it's making sure all of that gets taken 
care of. <clears throat> so commercial subdivisions are on the same track, but they're a little bit different. Commercial and Industrial Common Interest Development Act of 2013 provides for the creation and regulation of commercial and industrial common interest development. So there was there in 2013, there was a regulation on what could be done with regard to um, building um, commercial or industrial um, um, sites. And you'll see those, like if you're on I-5 and you're coming towards LA and you're gonna go up the hill, you're gonna see right before that, I'm not talking about the outlets, I'm talking about the Ikea or um, over on the outlets, but on the east side of the outlets um, at, at that last big stop, um, there's a huge um, area that has um, either industrial and commercial warehouses, um, and you'll see a lot of uh, you'll see a lot of semis and stuff going through in that area. Um, so it's talking about those kind of um, they're not track homes, but those kind of things. Um, so types of subdivisions. So due to the scarcity of land suitable for subdividing. The subdivision process has become more sophisticated, often resulting in higher land prices and new types of subdivisions. And you'll find that a lot of times what will happen is people will go to an older part of town and they'll turn, um, like uh, as an example in San Francisco, um, this would have been 2009. It would have been the early 2000, like 2001, 2002, there was an old cannery um, on the wharf, but not on 39, uh, Pier 39. It was like Pier 40 or something, and or maybe Pier 43. It was in that area. And um, they turned that cannery into lofts. And so there are these beautiful lofts, but they're, it's just kind of a weird situation. But you can see where that kind of stuff could happen. Um, let's see. All right, the standards, so let's go back to planning and development. So I, I was talking about Cannery Row. It's not Cannery Row, that's Monterey, but there's, uh, it's another area. And Cannery Row actually in Monterey, they're doing some interesting things as well. A standard subdivision is a land division with no common or mutual rights of either ownership or using among the owners of the parcels created by the division. This type of subdivision is typically a track of single family or individual lot. So you could, you could see how a standard subdivision is like the book was saying earlier about a track of homes. It's the standard, it's the run of the mill. Um, when it comes to land projects, subd subdivisions located in sparsely populated areas, so fewer than 1500 registered voters. I think it's kind of interesting that they call that. How many people, well, don't tell me if you're registered. Um, now people have to register when they register their car, right? There's uh, registered, uh, no, they don't have to, but there's like an encouragement at the DMV, like, hey, are you a registered voter? Anyway, I just think it's interesting. So subdivision, let's start over again, land projects. Subdivisions located in sparsely populated areas made up of 50 parcels or more are known as land projects. So what are the keys here? Uh, not to be registered to vote. I want you to do that if you would like to do that. I think it's a good idea. 50 parcels. Um, or more is known as a land project. So that's what you need to know on page 234 with regards to land projects. Do you need to know what a standard subdivision is? I think we know that. So I don't want to really like hit that one home. I think everybody kind of understands that just from, but I, I could be wrong. You can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Common interest developments or CIDs are combined. So common interest developments, you're going to see this. You do need to know what this term means for the open book exam. Um, but I'll call everything a common interest development that has gate, that has some type of homeowners association, or I'll call it a planned unit development, a gated community. Um, let's see what they have to say. A common interest development combines the individual ownership of private dwellings with a shared ownership of common facilities of the entire project. And I always think of a gated community. You go in that gate and yes, you have your either condominium or you have your um, duet or your townhouse or your whatever and there's uh, whatever home. It might be a single family residence as well. And, uh, you, but m nine times out of 10, you have one common wall with your neighbor, meaning that if you were to put a hole through the wall, you could see into your neighbor's kitchen. If this is your kitchen, they're usually laid out in the same way. Um, so CIDs are common interest developments that have the opportunity for you to not only live your best life in your home, but there's a shared ownership of common facilities. There might be a park, there might be a pool, there might be a game room or something along those lines. The common interest development provides a system of self-governance through the community association, and it's usually called homeowners association, or it's also called HOA. 
homeowners association. You'll hear me talk about HOA. Oh, it's got an HOA. It's a gated community. It's a CID. It's a plan unit development. You'll get used to the, those abbreviations. If I say HOA or if I say CID, I'm not using those to trick you. I'm using those so that you become familiar with them. And if you're like, Kathy, wait, what does that abbreviation mean? Call me on it. I should know it. If I don't know it, I'll be like, I need to look that one up for you. Okay. The association has the authority to enforce special rules called CCNRs. Now, there have been some new regulation in, in July of 2022 with regard to covenants, codes, and restrictions, because covenants, codes, and restrictions come with the preliminary title report. So when title, when you open escrow, your client goes to, to buy a house and, and they put in the offer and you're like, I'm going to get this commission. Before the buyer can buy that home, they have to get, they have to review that property. And there's a property title, a preliminary title report that tells the title or the chain of title on that property. But sometimes if the property is really old and uh, it'll come with covenants, codes, and restrictions, it's not just covenants and codes and restrictions are usually with CIDs, common interest developments, plan unit developments, something that's a gated community, something where there's shared ownership of common facilities. But there are other properties where there are CCNRs and those most of the time um, have some type of influence, uh, some type of bias related to them or some type of um, um, irregulation, uh, irregular, like, why does it say that? Like, how come, you know, I can't uh, bring a mule onto the property? And you're like, we sometimes it's something weird like that. Like there no camels can be purchased or owned on this property. There's this weird restriction. And then sometimes the restriction is associated with discrimination. And so in July of 2022, they changed um, title. Uh, or the title regulation now stipulates that we as agents, if we have a client that wants to buy a house and it comes with CCNRs, we need to make sure that there's, if there's any discriminatory uh, language in that CCNR, that it needs to be redacted, meaning that the title and escrow company need to make sure that that stuff's lined through. Now, are they going to know to do that? Absolutely. They're the ones that are going through the training and regulation, but it's also something that we as agents need to make sure because we don't want our clients to ever feel like there's been bias um, against them or any type of discrimination for any reason, whether it's stated in state or federal law or it hasn't been stated yet because there's this gray area within um, that same area that, that we could be dealing with. So we've gotta be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, so when it comes to CIDs upon the sale of an existing common interest development, buyers must be provided a copy of the CCNRs. And so if it's a gated community, there's definitely gonna be CCNRs because there's an HOA. Written notification of any pending special assessments, claims or lawsuits against the seller of the homeowner um, from the homeowners association. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, somebody could live in a gated community and tell the homeowners association they suck and they don't want to live there anymore. And they can, they can forget about getting their homeowners association dues they're paid they're that are being paid. So there could be something happening where the seller is having to move out because they, they have um, not complied with all the conditions, all the covenants and restrictions with regard to that gated community. So if there's any of that stuff, if there's any of the the, the strange stuff going on, we that has to be identified in the sale of the property. Um, written notification of any known pending special assessment claims lawsuits. Okay, I already said that. The state, a statement showing whether the seller's account with the homeowners association is paid up to date or not. And what does that mean? Well, let's say a seller is really unhappy with their um, com uh, common interest development. And they're like, you know what? Not only am I going to sell, I'm going to stop paying my HOA. And they have their property on the market for six months. When somebody goes in to buy a property, the lending institution that they're going to be working with is going to want to make sure that that property does not have any debt or any liens against it under the name of the prior owner that will that that could somehow stay. And the debt to the homeowners association, that was part of the covenants, codes, and restrictions that the seller promised that when they moved into that property, they would pay it whether they are happy or not. Um, and because they stopped paying it, that would be a debt that would have to be paid in escrow. And if the seller's like, forget it, I'm not paying it. The lending institution might tell the buyer, Hey, we know that you want to buy the house. We know that you're credit worthy. That property is not deemed credit worthy because it is not going to be given to you, um, with marketable title. It's not clear. There's a lien against it or there's a debt against it that the seller's not willing to pay. And this is a situation where we might be the agent of the seller and we're aware that they're, you know, they're $1,500 behind on their HOAs. And we share with them, we'll just have, we'll just put it in, we'll add $1,500 to the sale of the home and then the buyer to the listing price. And then the buyer can come in with that money. 
Um, and, and even though we know that it's really coming out of the uh, sweat equity of the seller, um, the seller might feel better about the situations that, that it gets paid out of escrow. Um, so there are little things like that that you can do um, to benefit uh, the sale of the property and make the seller feel a little bit better about the, the fact that not only they're selling, but that they're not technically paying, even though they're paying uh, for the debt of the HOA. Um, condominiums, they're considered CIDs, right? Community interest developments. They consist of separate fee um, interest in a particular specific space. So the air. So if you own a condo, you kind of own the air plus an undivided interest in all common or public areas of development. This is the term. This is the definition. Um, condos, you don't own the land. Single family residents, you do. That's basically the difference. When it comes to planned developments, or also known as planned unit developments, um, so planned developments can be, can, these are, um, it could be a PD or it could be, or um, you can look at them that way, but it's not PD lowercase d, it's PD uppercase d. So a lot of times planned developments, also known as planned unit developments or PUDs or PUDs, uh, we've talked about PUDs all the time. Oh, that's a PUD. Oh, I, I sold a house in that PUD. Um, you know, like four months ago, the area is great, HOA is on target, you know, you're having that, you'll have those kind of conversations in the office. A plan development is a planning and zoning term described, um, describing the land not subject to conventional zoning requirements. So there's something about that plan development that's specific to how they do things there. It allows clustering of residences or other characteristics of a project. You're like, what do you mean by clustering? Well, there's only a sidewalk on one side. You can only drive one way in and one way out. You cannot park on the road. You cannot park your car in front of a garage. You must have all your garage closed at all times. There's, there's specific, there's specifications to those. And the homeowners association is like, it's, is, is, it, is its own policing organization that will ticket your car and will try to tow your car and do other things. Cause you're outside the realm. There's a plan development. There's things that are required of you. There are CCNRs with regards to plan developments as well. When it comes to stock cooperatives, please just know the term and the different definition. A stock uh, cooperative is a corporation formed for the purpose of owning property. Each stockholder is given the use of a living unit and any amenities, living unit meaning like a place to live, and any amenities um, such as community recreational facilities and the like with regard to it. So if you are a stock cooperative or you have a co-op, it's a little bit like a condominium where you kind of own not really the land, but you own uh, it's it's so it's like that with a condo condominium. But the difference with a co-op is you're a stakeholder. You're a you're you hold stock or you're, you have a, you have a you have a claim. You're a stockholder in the corporation that owns the building that your co-op is in. Um, I I've never I've never worked with a co-op before, I, and I I've done a lot of lending in my day. I've never worked in a co-op, so. Um, they're out there. Um, if you guys have ever, or if you ever experience them later, come back into class and talk to um, the future students about that, because I'd love to hear the process. Um, so the term and the definition are on 235. So I just want you guys to know that you do need to be aware of what a stock cooperative, cooperative is, but not just for the open book exam, but for the state exam too, because that might be one of the questions that feels a little tricky. Time sharing. I think timeshares um, back in like the 80s, they they had they had to be deregulated 237. Thank you. Um, whereas they weren't necessarily um, on the up and up, timeshares can kind of come across a bit squirrely. So time sharing is a favorite way to have an interest in a building, or that's how the book states it, with the right to occupy limited um, to a specific time period. So what are time what's a timeshare? Well, you and 500 other people own this uh, condo in Hawaii and you're, it's not 500 people, but you and a hundred other people own this um, condo in Hawaii and you get the condo every two, uh, two weeks, every two years or something like that. And everybody else does too. And there's a property management company that makes sure that it's all being taken care of. And 150 or $200 is coming out of your um, bank account every month to pay your part of the mortgage if you have not paid completely into it. Timeshares are really interesting. And as Carol, one of our previous uh, students shared, that was the, the only reason that they actually ever went on vacation is because they got into a timeshare and it was like, we already put the money in. We need to go stay in Hawaii. And they have one in Hawaii. Um, when it comes to undivided interest, the land itself is not divided, just the ownership. So the buyer receives an undivided interest in a parcel of land as a tenant in common 
with other owners. So it's undivided interest. So you are a tenant in common. I want you to recognize or to note that undivided interest means that you are a tenant in common and make sure that you have those um, two noted and make sure it's in 237. In the, if you wanna be able to go back and look at it, you can. The state housing law. So the, the state housing laws or the health and safety code section 17910 outlines the minimum construction and occupancy requirements for dwellings. What does it mean by the minimum construction and meaning you guys have to at least make sure that, that the house is built like this because it will fall. Um, so it's minimal um, in the same way that NASA makes sure that the shuttle is, is at a minimal construction and, and, and um, maximum occupancy requirement. But it's not uh, because they're only doing the minimum. They're, they're saying, okay, from a health perspective, this is what needs to be done for a home, or this is what needs to be done for the shuttles um, that NASA sends up into the space, right? One way of enforcing the construction regulations is by the issuance of a building permit. Is it going to pass code? Is it going to pass the building permit? All new construction, rehabilitation, or remodeling projects must have a building permit issued by a local building inspector prior to beginning any work. And um, all new construction, comma, rehabilitation, and we, um, we, we, the, we found that we had a building permit that wasn't accurate for our property uh, when we decided to put the, the insulation in and, and the new walls. So we had to get a permit just to do some minimal work that's being done in the house. And that being said, guys, we're going to keep going. We are going to keep going. Hey, let's take a break. You guys want to do a 30-minute lunch? You want to do a 33-minute lunch? What do you want to do? I, um, I'm going to take a 10 minute break. If you guys want, I'll come back in. I might, um, and start more if you want, because if you guys want to eat and just chat, we can, we can do that, but I can keep pushing forward. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. See you, um, at we'll do 1230. And I'll check my emails and stuff. And we'll keep going. Wait, I got a different check chat. 10 minutes is good for you. Okay, yeah, I can be back in 10. I'll see you guys at 1210. You guys, whatever works best for you, we'll do. Um, I can do 1210. I just want to like get up and walk around and make sure this one has food and water. And um, I'll refill my coffee and we'll just keep going. Okay. So I'll see you guys in nine minutes. Are we gonna see them in nine minutes? Tell them. Tell them you want to eat something. You want, you want to tell him? Okay. Okay. See you guys in a few. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> I don't mind not taking the 30. It doesn't, it doesn't. Um, I want to make sure that you guys are covered and you're feeling good about where we are. Yes, please take your 30. Okay. I'm taking, <laughs> are you guys feeling, are you seeing, uh, seeing the, the, the DOG's eyes? Are you crying on camera? Is it what's happening? Okay, we'll be back at 1230. Either way, it works. I'm not worried. Okay, see you in a few.
All right, we've got about three minutes left, everyone. I've got my um, energy drink, seltzer slash no sugar, no flavor. And I had a um, salted caramel. Can't, I had lunch, but I mean, I love. I don't know how you guys are with Marshalls and like TJ Maxx and stuff, but if you ever go into the gourmet section, I'm sorry, the sound sounds like a snacky for you, but it's not, Bubba. Um, these are sea salt caramels and they are so good. So I get to have one a day, sometimes two. And so I had one after lunch. It's so good. So, okay. But I find that with like candy and stuff that I, I can get away with just having one because if I have more than that, the flavor, all I taste is sugar instead of actually tasting the sea salt in the caramel. And that's really my thing. I make a mean toffee too. But anyway, that stuff being said, I hope you guys are having a good lunch. We got about three minutes and then we'll jump back in and we'll just keep going. Um, and you know what, you guys, if you want to do like these kind of crash sessions um, after each of the classes, we can do it. And if we do the outlines, we do the outlines. If we do the reviews, we do the reviews, but I'm totally down to do this because I really am here to encourage you. Um, but if it doesn't feel encouraging, I'm sorry about that. So. I'd be yawning because my caffeine hasn't kicked in yet. Sir. Huh. But that being said, I hope you're doing well. Um, Snickerdoodle got some food and we should, um, we're good. Everything's good on this end. I mean, you know, with respect. I don't know if I'll, I'll always be able to do like a whatever day that we're not in class, but if I can, I will. Because sometimes I'll, um, because it's not just you guys that are coming to class, it's all the classes that are, are able to come in and sit through this because the information we're going over, it's not just good for your books, but it's also good foundational for the state exam. Of course, oh my gosh, I appreciate you guys. I, I'm, I really am here for your educational success. I keep getting messages going, I passed. And I'm like, why do you guys think you wouldn't pass? Open book exam, I believe in you. I know you can do it. Um, when we get to unit 15, though, there are some regulatory things in there that I want you guys to just review on your own. You're probably going to have one question about all of chapter 15. And so instead of me going, hey, this is all you need, this is what I want you to study in chapter 15, we'll review each of the chapters to the best of our ability, right? And then what will happen is uh, when it comes to unit 15 or some of these things, I'll just say dog ear that page. You might need it for this, the open book exam, you might not, because I don't know, not everybody's gonna have the same open book exam. There's like a set of standard questions though that they're going to be asking you. And so I just wanna make sure that you guys, um, if you don't review it, because chapter 15 isn't really, um, 14 and 50 are, 15 are kind of like, hey guys, guess what we're gonna do in the next book? And then it kind of is delving into that. And we're kind of reaching into that in this unit as well. So like units 12, 13, 14 and 15 are kind of like, hey, this is the foundation for what we're going to be going through in the next book. And then what's going to happen with the third book is, oh, by the way, everything you learned in book one and most of what you are a part of what you learned in book two is going to be the review for book three. And that's the legal aspects of things. Because I don't know, um, a few of you have said stuff to me like, well, why are we going through appraisals? Or why are we talking about escrow? Or why are we we're not going to be in that field? But you're going to be working with people in that field. Um, and I got a text message from one of my cousins and she's going to be off at 4.30. Her husband's the one that's the appraiser. So I'm going to see if I can't get um, Dave to be able to swing into class. Dave's dad is fascinating. Um, okay, we'll have that fascinating conversation at another time. It is 12.30. Let's get back in it. Um, his dad did some work with NASA on the moon, which was like so awesome. And I'll leave it at that. But I was talking to him like, that's so cool. Anyway, okay. State housing laws, building permits, rehabilitation. I don't know that we did any of that stuff. Timeshare ownership divided. Okay, yeah, so this is the one. We should be on page 237. Am I on the right page, ladies and gentlemen? I think so. The state housing law, health and safety code section. We already talked about that, talked about building permits. Rehabilitation is, so one way of enforcing the construction regulations is, is the issuance of building permits. You guys should know that building permits are required to do any type of expansion or any type of um, development on a property. Rehabilitation is the restoration of the property to its former or improved condition without changing the basic design or plan. <clears throat> so we are rehabilitating this house and our neighbors are like, when are you guys gonna flip that thing and sell it? And I'm like, oh, not for a long time. We're gonna stay here. Even if we're gonna make the house nice, we want the house nice for us. 
So building permits and local building codes, you need to know both. In 1970, the California legislation made the Uniform Housing Code, Uniform Building Code, Uniform Plumbing Code, Uniform Mechanical Code, and National Electric Code the applicable building codes for the entire state. Um, I just want you guys to be aware of the Uniform Building Code and know that the other stuff's on page 237. Still on the wrong page. Local government still has the power to set requirements for local zoning, local fire zones, building setbacks, and uh, side yards, rear yards, and then specific property lines. And what I mean by that is the property line. Um, so a lot of times you'll find a client saying, well, I know that's not where the property line is and the property line's here. So that's where I put the fence. And you're like, ah. so how do we figure that information out? Well, we go to the building department and we ask for someone to come out and survey the property with regard to the building, uh, the property line so that our clients um, are well aware. And so are their, are their neighbors of where the property line meets. Hopefully the fence is actually on the property line and not on the neighbor's property. So in order to protect California consumers, contractors are licensed in the California under the California contractor's license law. So the, sorry, the contractor state license law. Um, so if you have anyone that does any work for you, or if you have ever gone um, to Home Depot or to Lowe's or something, you've seen a number of people in the parking um, lot that are looking for work. A lot of times people that are in the parking lot looking for work um, with Home Depot and stuff are our laborers are people that are actually very um, keen in doing their work and there are contractors that are also there. Um, so it is important that you make sure that you work with a contractor and your clients always work with a contractor because they are um, there is a regulatory system and because contractor state license law is in effect, it will protect the client. Um, so exempt from minor work, not exceeding $500 of valid California contractor's license is required for the license category in which the contractor is to work on the property. Now, if there's asbestos on your property or lead-based paint or any of these other things, contractors, there are contractors out there that are licensed to do the work and the removal of those products, but you might find that they aren't. And so you're going to need a specialist in that area as well. It's always good to have a contractor come in and look at your property and review things. Compaction, we're going to be talking about lawsuits involved in uh, properties not being compacted properties. So compact, compaction refers to extra soil that is added and compressed to fill the low areas or raise the levels of a parcel or a piece of land for buildings. So clay soils are generally classified as expansive soil. And the reason for that is once you add water to clay, it will expand. Um, Central uh, Valley is known for having sandy soil. Uh, Silicon Valley is known for having clay soil and clay soil is harder to dig, especially when it's wet. This means that given an amount of clay will tend to expand. Okay, I said that. Um, so just so you guys know, clay soil is the expansive soil. Do you need to know that for the book exam? No, but it's just good to know the information. Adobe is one of the most expensive of the clay soils. And we've talked about um, Adobe bricks, bricks in some of the classes and some of the classes we haven't. So you can see why that kind of... Um, clay soil would be used, uh, sorry, expensive, not expensive, expansive, meaning that it expands, but adobe clay, um, when adobe bricks are made, they're made with um, hay and some other products and, and, and you can understand why they would expand. It's not just the clay side of it, but it's the other parts that are associated with that um, brick. They're one of the most brittle and they're not good for earthquake. Um, do you need to know what backfill is? I want you to know what expansive soil is. Uh, you need to know that adobe is one of the most expensive clay soils. Maybe you do need to know that there are adobe clay um, homes out there. Most of them are not in California because they are not um, earthquake equipped. Um, backfill is soil that is used to fill in holes um, or support a foundation. Um, it is good to know the term and the definition on 237. <clears throat> So are you going to be asked questions on the open book exam with regard to the parts of a building? You might be asked, I don't actually remember in the unit reviews, but I know on the state exam, uh, you are going to be asked a few questions. So do you need to know what the acre bolt, the bracing building paper, um, the closed sheathing, the crawl space, the cripple, the eaves, the fire stop, the flashing, the footing, the foundation, the header and the joists are? Yes. So please note them and review them. Um, mud sill is really important because foundationally speaking, 
homes that are built right on the ground or homes that are built on a um, kind of like a stilt version <clears throat> are considered to have mud seal because they're close to the ground. The lowest part of the frame of the house is the mud seal. It is uh, fastened with bolts to the foundation and supports the upright studs of a framing. Sometimes it's not bolted. Um, this home is a mud seal. Um, and uh, you do need to be aware of the type of foundation that a client's home is. Um, and they need to be aware of it as well, especially for like home insurance purposes, earthquaking, earthquake proofing and some other stuff like that. Um, so I, that's the one term that I want you guys to really know. Um, foundation header and joists aren't bad to know either. Um, open sheathing, uh, rafting. I just want you to note page 237 and go and just slightly review or note um just the different parts of the buildings because do you need to know each one of these uh like the back of your hand no <clears throat> and you don't have to know them like the back of your hand for the book exam or the state exam 239 erica you're the best thank you baby, baby. 239. you guys are all the best i had a student ask me how come so and so is the best and i'm not the best i'm like you guys are all the best i i i mean it in, as an encouraging like i appreciate you as a a group as an entity of peeps I'm happy to have you in the class. Okay. All right. Hip pitch gable. Okay. So roof types. Okay. So parts of the building, I want you guys to know those. When it comes to roof types, you kind of need to need to know these. So the licensee should know most desirable roof pitches. Well, what are the most desirable roof pitches? Whatever your client needs. So we're going to be talking about these. The pitch of a roof, it, it is its incline or rise. So the pitch, that's a high pitch. Most likely that's a particular type of roof. A gable roof has a pitched roof with two slopes. A gambrel roof typically seen in Dutch colonial architecture is cur has a curved roof with a steep lower slope. Whenever I think of a gambrel roof, I think of kind of like um, Disney or magical. Uh, Gambrel has it like a very whimsical look to it. A hip roof is a pitch roof with sloping sides and ends. That would be all four sides. Um, so do you need to know the, you need to know, you need to be familiar with these. I'm going to say you need to be familiar with these and I'm not going to go further with it because there are only a few things you actually do need to know, like the back of your hand with regard to it. And we will get to that note, but we're going to just do like a general uh, review of these. So here's a, there's a gable roof on one side, and then there's the gable with the dormers. And uh, dormers are those windows that pop out from the roof. Gambrel roof, you can see it's more of a barn, um, but there's also like, uh, you can see roofs that are a little bit like this that are like in Disney movies and stuff where they're a little bit more, um, if, if it's a thatched roof where it looks like it's like wheat or something on the top of it, the um, property, uh, it, it just kind of gives more of like a whimsical feel, um, um, but you might see it like a, a, in, on a barn or something, but gambrel is associated with that pit, the pitch that goes up the sides and over. You'll see them, <clears throat> with the sides higher and the top lower or even flat. Um, so gambrel is more than just this barn image, but it's not a bad one. Um, hip roofs, you need to be able to visually, Mediterranean, I think we all know that one, pagoda, the way it, the, the front slants a little bit. Um, a shed looks like a shed. A shed has like one, it's one-sided, a flat roof. A lot of times you'll see properties um, that are built flat roof. And I think like when I look at a Mediterranean home, I usually think that it, I think about the orange tile that are the roof tiles, but then I also think of like um, homes in Arizona or homes in the desert usually have like a flat roof associated with them. So that's what I visually see. A frame is your standard run of the mill. You've got the pyramid, which makes sense, not like the pyramids in Egypt, but it does make sense for sure. Yeah, Palm Springs, absolutely. And the thing is Palm Springs is a hot area. So I immediately always think of like a flat roof in a hot area versus um, like, uh, you don't see a lot of flat roofs. Yeah, um, that are out there. Uh, but if someone goes, Kathy, 
I want to buy a house, but I want to make sure that it looks like a pyramid. I'm like the whole thing or just the roof, you know, like you could have clients that ask for specific things. When I think of thatched, I think of the, um, I think of that previous roof, but a thatched roof is very whimsical. This is also, it's a different type of whimsy, like, um, the gambrel roof, even though it has more like the barn feel to it, it might have higher, higher sides and a more shallow point to the middle um, that gives more of like a, um, a European style. Um, thatched obviously is thatched, but you can actually have the mix of the two. Um, the dome, I always think of the Capitol in Washington DC when I think of like a domed roof, but I have actually been in homes that had this, like you walk in and then you just walk into this entryway and you look up and, and you start like hearing like angelic music, even though it's not really playing, it's only screaming at the top of my head. And you're like, oh my gosh. But a lot of times like a religious building will have more of a domed, a domed roof as you're walking in or in the middle of the, of the, the chapel, if you will. Um, you'll also see cones. And, and when I look, when I think of a cone roof, I really do think of a sugar cone upside down on top of the building. You'll note that I, um, I do talk a lot about food. Um, when I, when we talk about mansard roofs, this weird slope, um, the mansard and the gambrel can actually be mixed up easily. And I, but they're the, my two favorite where it has this kind of sloped. Um, and then you, you know, you like, um, the gambrel has more of that barn look, right? The red barn, the traditional red barn look and mansard's more of this, um, European, like the, the very sloped, almost Tudor style. Um, but, uh, it's good to just be familiar with them because you might have someone walk in and go, okay, I want the house from the movie such and such, but I don't know what that's called. And then you can go, oh, okay, Despicable Me. Yeah, well, that's just like a standard run of the mill uh, home in a subdivision that's been painted with flat black paint, but we can do that. I, I'll find somebody to come in and do the flat, but, or whatever the situation is, you know what I mean? So people will come in. And, so when they say that agents need to know this information, it's really good to be familiar with it. Let me make the screen smaller on this. Oh, 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 there, there, there we go. So housing styles are important. We need to know. We have a client that likes a Mediterranean or they like the Cal a California bungalow. My house very much so looks like this. Um, but I don't think it's that big, <laughs> but we do have like a traditional California bungalow without all the extras. We don't have the, the, we don't have the front um, porch finished, and, but hopefully I'll have it finished next month. Um, contemporary. When I think of contemporary, I think of sleek lines, right? When you think of a ranch style home, it's kind of a circa 1990s. It's like the house you would see, um, like the facts of life, I think might've had a house like this, um, but it's not so far back that it's the Brady Bunch. Um, contemporary with traditional Tudor influence. Tudor influence is associated with like really high peaks. And then Cape Cod is literally um, um, the craftsman, but just flipped on its side or the, um, here, hold on a second. <clears throat> it's a little bit like the bungalow, if you will. I mean, the roof, obviously it's, it's a different slant and it's a different pink, but peak, but you can feel that Cape Cod feeling. The slope of the roof goes up from the door. Um, I don't, I'm going to have to figure out a way to get it so that you guys don't have to sit in, um, in holding, um, Georgian colonial is very specific, but then this is a little bit like mission. So the difference between the Georgia colonial is that a Georgian colonial has these five windows, but a, a mission style home will actually have a, um, a porch on that second floor, um, Tudor revival or Tudor style is one of my favorite. The cool thing about Tudor is they usually have some type of a rounded arch entrance when you go inside and there's usually some type of leaded glass or um, some type of a, of, uh, I always, I, I apologize. I was raised in non-denominational religion, but I have a large Catholic side of my family. And I always think of the windows in the Catholic churches when I think of Tudor revival, it doesn't have to make sense. Um, it just reminds me of that or Cinderella. I don't know. I can't give you that one either, except Disney obviously does have a heavy influence on my life. So I think of these different things. I don't know of any movies though, where there was a Georgian colonial style or a mission style. Um, but we will eventually continue to talk about um, all of those things that are out there. Um, when it comes to Pueblo, right? So more of a stucco, you've got the Victorian. So it's got all the tchotchkes on the outside. 
And then you think of a townhouse. If you look at the Victorian next to the townhouse image, you can see where that townhouse does have like a Victorian um, influence or some other type of influence that would uh, present in some way, shape or form, something that would that would give uh, people to go, I want a townhouse, but I don't want it to look um, 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 too modern. I want it to kind of have a warmer feel. Well, if it, a warmer or a family feel would be like more Victorian or something. You need to make sure that their family's on the same page though, because my family might be a little crazy. And with that, that's unit 12. Let's go over to unit 13. Uh, I should have it in here. Where, where are you? There we are. All right. We should be on 247, give or take, because uh, you guys know how good I am with pages. Um, we're going to be talking about real estate brokerages. And you're like, Kathy, I know about brokers. I know, you know, but I just need to make sure that, or the book just needs to make sure that we know what the book wants us to know. Um, so this section is going to examine the business and the practical aspects of a brokerage and what the brokers are expected to do, which is follow the law. Um, so what are we going to do by the end of this one? We're going to be able to recognize the types of real estate brokerages and the activities in which they engage in, which should be lawful, identify deciding factors on new licensees and, um, and the uses um, to select a broker. And we're going to be talking about in the next book, we're going to be talking about how do we interview a broker to hire us? But technically, how are we going to hire them? Because it's not all about them accepting you. It's about you going, I think I could go into the trenches with these people. Indicate the importance of prospecting, advertising, and marketing, and then recognize ethical and legal behavior expected of real estate licensees. Um, well, recognizing the, that you have to follow the law, I think we already know the answer to that one. So you guys are already doing great. We're already almost there. We're one fifth of the way. Um, page 247, people commonly refer to firms where real estate agents work as real estate uh um, as um, real estate brokerages. That's true. The term brokerage generally means an activity involving the sale of something through an intermediary who uh, negotiates and the transaction of payment on behalf of someone else. So basically a brokerage isn't just real estate brokerages. There's um, places that there's investment brokerages and um, other ones. I can just think of investment right now. We don't need to fight the masses on this. We know that brokerages can be more than just real estate offices, right? And But we need to talk a little bit about how does this ownership work? With, that, with regard to that, is this brokerage a sole proprietorship? Is it a partnership? Is it a corporation? Is it a limited liability or what people know by abbreviation as an LLC? Well, let's talk about it. Let's think about it. We're going to know once we interview a broker, but before we go and interview that broker, let's think about how they're holding their business. A sole proprietorship is an unincorporated business owned by one individual, so, solely, right? So that means one. A partnership is a form of, of business in which two or more persons join their money and skills in conducting the business. But the Department of Real Estate does not issue partnership licenses. And that's important. This is not, uh, this might be a book question, but this is definitely a state exam question. Um, however, a partnership may perform acts for which a real estate broker license is required as long as they, uh, as every partner has a real estate notice broker license. Every partner, you can have a partnership with another person, but everybody's got to be a broker if this partnership will work within the Department of Real Estate. And the Department of Real Estate will very quickly go, I'm aware that we don't give out partnership licenses, but you can't have a partnership if there's only one person. If this, if this is a sole proprietorship, there's only one person that has a broker's license that's in the partnership. You guys are going to have to change the way you do that. We're not going to allow you to keep your license if you're doing things outside of the regulatory system. Um, but they're really nice about it. They aren't like, hey, you're a bad person. We're going to take this. It's more of a, hey, guys, just in case you, aren't know about, you don't know about the law. Um, joint and several liability. We, we need to understand what the word joint mean and what the word several mean with regards to the book. Just like a sole proprietorship, the broker owner of a participating, sorry, let me start over again. Just like a sole proprietorship, the broker owners of a partnership are jointly and severally liable. Severally is a lot. It means all of them, not just one person. Several T is one, severally is more than one. It's a partnership. Joint and several liability is the legal term used um, in reference to a debt in which each debtor is responsible for the entire amount of the debt. It's not that one partner only has the debts. Everybody, you're in a partnership. Guess what? We're both going down with the ship. 
We're both going down with the debt. We got to pay this. A corporation is a legal entity whose right in business are similar to that of an individual. Notice it says similar to that of an individual. That's how you know what a corporation is. So if it asks you a question in the book exam or the state exam, a corporation is, is that like, uh, is a business that is similar to an individual. It exists indefinitely and has centralized management in a board of directors. Its stakeholders liability is limited to the amount the individual investment, uh, to the individual investment and its corporate stocks are freely transferred. And we're gonna be talking more about corporations in the near future, but corporations are like individuals, but they don't have the same rights as, uh, as a human because like corporations can seriously just, you know, come and go, or people come and go, but corp I mean, we, we either on the earth or we're in the earth. And so corporations can live on forever. If you think about Disneyland or you think of Walt Disney World, Walt Disney is no longer with us unless you guys believe the, the science of the eighties. Um, but, uh, and what I mean by that is they, they, he's, in, he's cryogenic or something. But um, the reality of the situation is the entity, the, the corporation is still with us and it's called Walt Disney or Walt Disney World, right? But he is no longer on the earth, but the corporation is still with us and kicking heavily, kicking heavily. Um, infinite duration. So if permitted by its articles of incorporation, a corporation may take title to real estate due to its indefinite duration. A corporation may not hold title as a joint tenant because it's not human. So it cannot be a joint tenant with someone else because it there is no way of knowing whether or not this corporation is going to uh, to um, end its end its in 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 itself, right? Or no longer be around. S corporation is a corporation that operates like a corporation, but is treated like a partnership for tax purposes. And how are we going to know what's better for us or for what's what our our broker did? Well, we need to go talk to it, to go get consulted by tax uh, a tax specialist. Um, so when it comes to LLCs or li limited liability companies, it, this is the alternative business entity that has the characteristics of both corporations and limited partnerships. So owners of LLCs are referred to as members. The LLC offers its members the advantage of limited personal liability. Limited personal liability is extremely important because that means they can't really go after your house if you have an LLC. They can go after the, the business, they can go after the things the business owns, but they can't go after necessarily your own personal stuff. And uh, the LLC uh, has a choice of how the business can be and will be taxed. And how do we know what the best thing to do is? Do we have ourselves or we, we have our broker or if we are the broker, we go talk to a tax specialist to find out what would be best for us. What are our broker's responsibilities? You're like, Kathy, you talk about all this stuff about how to, how to run a business. I know, but this way you'll know when your broker interviews you and you interview them, they're like, we have a partnership. You're like, oh, wow, who else has a broker's license here? Partnership usually means both. These are, you might want to yell that at the top of your brain, but let them finish, you know, whatever they're saying, but you'll know how they're holding their business or how they're running their business. They'll give you a, a lot of a leg up if you don't know this information. If you do, don't worry about it. We'll get through this really quickly. When a broker opens a brokerage and employs licensee, he, a licensees, he, she, or they must follow various state laws and abide by the commissioners, the Department of Real Estate Commissioner's regulations. So maintaining an office, this is a big thing. An active broker must maintain an office in California and it can be their home address to transact businesses and then display licenses. And you're like, what kind of license is the broker gonna display? Well. Technically speaking, our broker, once we have our license hung under them, must hang our business license on the office wall of their um, of their office, whether it's a home office or whether it's a, a brick and mortar outside their home. So what I mean by that is whether it's their home office or whether it's just a regular commercial building, our personal license with our name and our license number and an address so people can go find us. So remember, you, you can put a PO box on there. Um, that information is going to be public so people can walk in the door and see that information on the wall. And it's a requirement by the Department of Real Estate that the broker have all of those licenses hung so that if they do audit and come by your, either your home office or your regular office, they can see those on the wall. Um, following proper procedure with employing salespeople. So a broker must have a written agreement with every single sales associate, whether they are a salesperson licensed as a real estate salesperson or as a broker associate, meaning 
They also have their broker's license, but they're hanging their license under your brokerage. The agreement must be dated and signed by all the parties involved. So these employment agreements must be dated. So if let's, as an example, Sonia is my broker and I'm Sonia interviews me and I interview back and she's like, I think this is a good fit. And I'm like, so do I. And she's like, okay, well, here's the contract. The contract for employment states everything that it needs to state. And she, uh, I sign on the dotted line and she signs on the dotted line because that's the contract I have with her. And she'll have that, she'll have something like that same type of um, contract with everybody else in this class that is going to carry, uh, let her uh, brokerage ha um, allow our, our licenses to be hung by her. So the agreement must be dated and signed by all the parties and cover material aspects. But I'm not going to sign someone else's contract. She is, because she's the broker, she's going to sign all these contracts, right? She's going to make sure that everything is itemized, detailed, and correct. But each of the sales associates is going to sign their own contract with her. I don't know what's on a contract with another agent because my commission split and my conversation communication with Sonia is associated with the relationship, my experience, and what I can bring to the table. So my commission split might be lower than somebody else that's going to close 15 deals a month and is walking in with 15 deals. So those details aren't necessarily public record. They're between you and your broker. Maintaining a valid real estate license is a massive, huge thing that we must continue to do. And it's not just me that has to do it as an agent, but Sonia being my broker, she needs to make sure she's maintaining her uh, real estate license as well. So the commissioner can bar or suspend any license or, or unlicensed, person, unlicensed person from any position of employment with or managed or controlled of by the real estate business. The term quote unquote bar means to prohibit or exclude. And for those of you that are like, they can't bar me. I, I don't have to have a license to sell homes. I don't have to do that kind of stuff. Technically speaking, the California Department of Real Estate is run by the commissioner who has been assigned to that position by the governor of the state of California. And if you were found doing anything wrong with the Department of Real Estate, it's just going to be noted under your information. So if you decide to go become a nurse and get licensed in the state of California or an esthetician or um, decide to you want to, to sell cars and you need to go get a dealership license, there's going to be information in there that shows that you were barred because of something you did inappropriate under another area. And it might cause you to not be able to get licensed. So we've got to be really careful with this stuff. If a license is expired, the sales associate cannot perform any licensed real estate activities until the license has been renewed. That's totally true. You have four years from your first license, from the first, well, it's every four years. You just have to get it, that license renewal and we'll talk about it. But there's also a grace period, which allows you, so you could, you could wait. So let's say as an example, Sonia's like, Kathy, your license is gonna expire next month. I know, I know, I just wanna get this deal closed and then I'll, I'll deal with it. And she's like, well, no matter what, whatever's happening, it freezes as of um, March 21st. And I'm like, oh shoot, you know, okay, uh, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Well, you're 45 days. Notice in these classes, these prere prerequisite courses that we're taking, you have to wait 18 days between taking a final exam for each of the books. The same thing is, uh, the same type of thing is set up for your continued education. You're not allowed to take all of them in one weekend. And if you want to blame anyone for that, you can blame the people of my era that used to go on wine tasting on the weekend. You could do all 45 hours on a bus, wine tasting through Paso Robles and come back. So because and I did do it one time. I've got to be on. I'm not going to say I didn't do it, but they changed the regulatory system with regard to how continued education was set up. And there was a lot of gray area because people are like, I'm already licensed. Like I know the law. Well, then why are we still going to court on stuff? So um, there um, you, you have to get your continued education done pretty quickly. And what I mean by that is by the second year you've had your license, please start your 45 hours of continued ex um, um, education Go back to where you got your initial um, uh, courses or maybe your broker or is going to want you to go somewhere else. It's totally up to them. But let's say it didn't happen. And then Sonia's like, Kathy, like, seriously, you, you, you're, you know, this is the, you, this is the day it's expiring. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And she's like, you've got to get it done in the next two years. You've got that grace period. But until then you cannot do any more sales. And I'm like, okay, so I have two, and I probably would say it like that. Okay, you're right. But the grace period, so you have four years to get your continued education done. And then on the day that it's due, if it's not done, your license is suspended pending you getting that 45 hours done. 
And there's an additional, these additional two years is to help you get that continued education in. It's not going to take you two years, guys. It takes like a month, a month and a half. Don't, don't be a Kathy lazy bones. Get, get this stuff done as soon as you can. Okay. So try to get it done sooner than later. Start in the second year and don't wait till the third or fourth year, because you're going to be doing the same regulatory stuff that we're doing right now, except it's more independent study, but you're still going to have open book exams. You're they're still going to be timed. You're still going to need to know like that, you know, ethics is really going to push you hard um, with regard to uh, not passing some of these exams. So it's important to know them. So you can't conduct license, you can't conduct uh, real estate on a suspended license because you didn't finish your continued education. So that's important. Um, brokers have to supervise sales associates. That's just the way it is. Final answer, do not co collect uh, $200 and pass go. Activities that need the, the broker supervision. It would be all of them. So but let's see what bo the book says on 249. Handling transactions requiring a real estate license. That would be any and all transactions with regard to purchasing or listing homes, reviewing documents, which may have a material effect upon the rights or obligations of the parties in the transaction, meaning that they're, you're reviewing information and giving your expertise. You don't have expertise or you do, but it needs to be held back pending you having your license reinstated, which is all you've got to do is your continued education. So you're cooking with gas, okay? Filing, um, storage and maintenance of such documents. Um, this is supervision, the broker, and the broker has to make sure that information's in there. Handling of trust funds, never work for a broker that had a trust fund account. We've talked about trust fund accounts before, but that's something the broker has to watch. Advertising any services for which a license is required, right? They have to make sure that all the advertisements are taken care of. I'm gonna make sure that's not any of you guys. That's not, it's, it's Bill Murray wanting me to buy some golf clothes. <laughs> Or his company, sorry. Okay, advertising of any service for which a license required. Absolutely, familiarizing salespeople with the requirements of the federal and state laws, which we are reviewing, right? Relating to the prohibition um, of discrimination. So the reason why the book is going, oh, hey, by the way, your broker needs to remind you, you can't discriminate because those are the that's the major area where lawsuits are still coming in in 2022. Now, 2023, I'm sure there's stuff on the docket. I don't know what it is. But people are still finding that there's bias, that there's still discrimination. And that's why they've changed the way one of these classes is being taught. And, and it's a requirement by 2024 that we actually teach, have a bias training uh, session, interactive session with you guys. Uh, you guys have been grandfathered in, I think. Um, and we'll talk about that more in book three. Um, retaining records is really important. And you need to know for the state exam, not necessarily for the book exam, but a licensed broker must retain all transactions for three years, all of them has to have a storage account or some type of a digital account that, that keeps all of them. The requirement does not include electronic messages or ephemeral nature. So like text messages, anything posted on social media. And what I mean by that is um, communication on social media, like, hey, dude, I tried to call you. I can see that you're on Twitter or something like that. Um, so when it comes to handling trust funds, real estate brokers and salespeople in their capacity as agents receive money from people, meaning you have this contractual obligation with them. And these can be in the form of a check. And a lot of times you'll find that it's not just that the law is very clear about how these funds need to be deposited in things but or ha are handled, but that's why brokers will have a trust fund account, a, a client account where monies are transferred in. And I've talked to you guys about the um, well, actually the Murdoch case as well, but I've talked to you about, um, Girardi and some other, and I know they're attorneys, but a trust fund account, uh, or these, uh, these trust accounts, it's, it's called a trust fund, meaning you can trust us with your money. And Mr. Murdoch, uh, showed that, that his, tr the trust fund account he created, um, to mirror the one where the client's monies were supposed to go in and were being transferred into his account proved that he could not be trusted in the same way Girardi proved he could not be trusted with his clients' monies as well. So when it's called a trust fund, it really is talking about how our clients are trusting our brokerage with their monies for their down payment to buy a home or with monies for this or for monies for that. Like they'll, they'll hand us a check that goes towards the credit uh, company that pulls the credit and it can go into this trust fund account or it can just be written right to that, that credit company where their credit's been pulled and sent directly to them. So what are trust funds? Well, trust funds are our clients' money. So let's see what the book says on 250. Trust funds are money or anything of value received from a buyer by an agent on behalf of, uh, of the seller. 
And it's it what it, they mean is you're holding on to it so it'll go towards the purchase of something. It's being held on to so that the seller can review the offer. And if the seller accepts the offer, then that check will be written to escrow and um, it, you continue to move forward with the purchase agreement. You can find an example of a trust fund. Um, oh, sorry. There should be some type of explanation or something at the end of this book, but examples of trust funds are cash, a check used as a deposit for a purchase or a good faith deposit. They're saying in good faith, we're gonna deposit this money in, hoping you'll accept our offer to buy your home or a personal note made payable to the seller. I've never seen a personal note payable to the seller like an IOU, like I totally owe you $100,000. But what I see now is that people will um, transfer money from their bank account into escrow on acceptance of an offer. So there's no real cash being handed or checks being handed. Um, back in the day uh, when we had clients that would come in with like 5,000 down on a house, we would actually make a copy of the money on the copy machine and put it into the file, proving that we had received the money and it had to be splayed out so you could count how many hundred dollar bills or whatever. Um, I just remember at one point, uh, one of the brokers I worked for said, we don't take cash or anything. You, whatever you guys have, hold on to it. And then when escrow, uh, when they accept the offer, we're going to make sure that that money is taken down there or you know something along those lines because it was so uh, dangerous to have chunks of cash in your office. Now, I, didn't, I never worked for a broker that was like, oh, hey, thanks for bringing in 100,000 cash to put down, you know, that, that never happened. Um, but I know there are agencies out there that do that kind of stuff. I've never worked for a broker that, that allowed that kind of thing um, in the office. So proper handling of trust funds. Um, when a broker or salesperson receives trust funds from a principal, which would be our client, right? In connection with the purchase or lease of real property, the transaction begins. So the moment they hand you the cashola, that's the proper handling is to put it into said trust account within three days. I don't know why we'd be holding on to it for three days. We're not walking to the bank, but it has to be from the time from inception to your office. It must be put into the trust account within three days. Um, actually, it should be with to, to escrow within three days. Account no later than three days following receipt of the funds by the broker. Okay. So it has to be, it has to go into your broker's office within a very short period of time. And then within three days of acceptance, it has to be an escrow, but I always do escrow like same day. Um, so example of trust fund handling as instructed, an office, an offerer's check held uncashed by a broker before an offer is accepted may be held uncashed after acceptance only upon written authority from the offeree. So what are you saying? Well, a buyer can hand you a check and go, this is the check I want to go towards that property. Please don't cash it until we know they've accepted the offer or please don't deposit it in your trust account until we know, and that would have to be in writing. The offerer, the buyer check uh, may be given to the offeree only if both expressly authorized in writing. So it's like upon approval, they can totally have my money, but it doesn't go directly to the seller. It always goes through the neutral third party, which is escrow. All or part of the offerer's deposit may be refunded by an agent or sub-agent of the seller without the express written permission of the offeree to make the refund. Please note this one because this one's harder to explain. All or part of the buyer's deposit may not be refunded by an agent or sub-agent of the seller without the express written permission of um, the offeree, which is the seller. So I'm gonna go like this. And why is that? Well, if there's a situation where monies have to be refunded or somebody is getting out of contract or trying to relieve themselves from being in contract um, and the buyer has put money in and deposited money, that money is no longer theirs. Up to 3% of the purchase price will go to the seller for um, the cost of doing uh, almost doing business. And we'll talk more about that in detail as time comes. Um, the things that I really want you guys to understand about commingling is a trust fund is a, is a client's account. It is in your name, but it's for your client money. And when you go into the bank and you go to deposit money into a, your trust account or your client's account, the bank is going to say, hey, oh my gosh, this is for the trust account. So this is a client's money. And you're like, yeah, why are you asking? It's the regulatory system with the bank that they confirm that information with you. They're going to ask you if you're going to commingle your money. So this money is going into your the trust account for your clients. No, no, that's going to my personal account. 
this looks like client money. Are you sure you want to put it in your personal account? And they're like, yeah. And so here we go, commingling money. But it, the situation is the bank is going to ask you questions to confirm the information so that they can note what you stated so that they stay within regulation. They're going to try to help you not commingle, but you, you know, like banks are not going to want you to crime hard because it puts them under uh, on the radar, if you will, as well. Because if you're allowing them to come, if they're allowing you to commingle money, your money with your client's money, how many other accounts are, are going to be an issue as well. So here are some examples of commingling. Personal or company funds are deposited into the trust account or the client's bank account. This violates the law even if separate records are kept. Very true. A trust account or a client's account isn't in the name of the client. It's it's in the it's it's called a trust account because any of your clients can deposit money in and come out of that. Um, commission or sorry, trust funds are deposited into the licensee's general or personal bank account rather than into a trust fund account. Commissions fees or other income earned by the broker and collected from the trust account are left in the trust account for more than 25 days from the date they were earned, meaning they're, it's time sensitive. Your trust account is very, these trust accounts are very time sensitive. Why is there money in this account? The account should be at zero or at $200 because you can have like $200 in these accounts um, because you have no deals going through. Why is there $150,000 in here? Where is that? Why is that money in there? Where, where was it supposed to go? Um, a broker's trust fund account must meet the following requirements. It must be designated as a trust account in the name of the broker or trustee. So it needs to be in the broker's name that it's a trust account. It must, it, that's the easiest way to do it. It must be maintained with a bank or recognized depository located in California. This is a great reminder um, <laughs> because when we transferred our money to close the deal, um, I was at the bank and I was doing a wire transfer to escrow because an escrow has a trust account as well. Trust accounts can be held by escrow. Trust accounts can be held by the brokerage. And I remember doing the transfer and I think it was 20, it was, it was like $20,000 or something like that. And it might've only been 17, but it was a chunk of change. Um, and so I don't want it to sound like 17,000 is not 20. I mean, it was more than, a, it was more than five bucks. And the money was being transferred to escrow and all of the information for escrow was encrypted and we had to go through this process. Long story longer, the wire transfer goes through and it confirms the escrow office's information in Cambodia. And the lady at US, um, at US Bank like almost lost her mind. She was like, Cambodia? I'm like, dude, I can only do what I can do. Escrow gave me this information. They confirmed it with you on the phone. And she's like, this shouldn't be. And I seriously, the gal gave me the receipt. And she said, if I call you, um, will you come back? I'm like, yeah. So literally she calls, I pull the car over and she's like, Hey, okay. We've been, we're researching this and we're going to hold on to this till we can confirm that this trust account information is in California. And it was in San Diego, but for whatever reason, it showed that it Cambodia and not California. So I digress. We were fine. We bought the house. All the monies were confirmed, but um, anyway, the lady at the U.S. Uh, bank was like completely nervous. She's like, I'm so scared. I don't want you to lose your money. And I'm like, we can only do what we can do. Like they gave us the information, but I had already shared with you guys, I was having problems with escrow anyway, because of spelling and other stuff that they kind of were missing out on, but that's okay. Um, it may not be an interest bearing account for which prior written notice can be required for withdrawal or funds, except for certain instances. So it cannot be an interest bearing account, a trust account cannot, you can't make money off the money that's sitting there or the money that's ever been in there. It cannot be interest bearing. So your savings account, you get a little bit of money back. Your checking account, you get a little bit of money back, but trust accounts cannot, you cannot make money off of other people's money. Withdrawals from a trust account may be made upon the signature of one or more specified people in your office. It's usually the broker and maybe like if your bro broker has an accountant or somebody that does payroll. Um, so who are the people that can can withdraw money? So the broker in whose name the account is maintained, the, de the designated broker officer, if the account is in the name of a corporate broker, so like you're the accountant or someone like that, an individual specifically authorized in writing, so it's signed. So usually like the accountant will have that as part of their job. An unlicensed employee of the broker, usually your accountant doesn't have a real estate license. And so you can see why it would say an unlicensed employee of a broker, if specifically authorized in writing by the broker. Um, and then you can actually look at a sample of a trust bank account record um, somewhere in the unit, but it would be after page 251. 
So how do we measure profitability? Well, I look in my checking account and go, okay, there's still money after the bills are paid, but that's not what the book is talking about. Real estate brokerage firms are in a business to provide a service and to be profitable. Aren't we all, right? Two quick ways the broker can determine profitability are the company dollar and the desk cost. A company dollar is the amount a broker has left after all commissions have been paid. The desk cost shows how much each sales associate must earn to cover the expenses for the office, either monthly or annually. It is calculated by dividing the total operating expenses of the firm by the number of licensed sales associates. And that's how you'll find a broker will go we require that anybody that works at our office uh, close two deals a month. And what they're doing is they're, they're thinking about the company dollar and the desk costs and how much it costs to operate that business and keep it maintained. Um, employment relationships, um, not those kind, <laughs> just regular standard run of the mill, be, be a friend, be a business associate. Employment status refers to the relationship between a salesperson and his, her, or their broker as an employee or as someone who is self-employed or under a contractual employment agreement. The compensation earned depends primarily on the salesperson's employment status. Yeah, generally salespeople classified, that's a lot of empty information here. Generally salespeople classified as employees earn a salary and a salesperson categorized as self-employed earns a commission. Real estate agents are kind of known as contractual employees. No, letting you know that you are self-employed, um, but you have a contract of some type of document. Um, often new self-employed licensees negotiate a 50-50 commission split with their broker. But let's be honest, it's usually the broker saying, you're a noob, we're totally not going to go above 50% until you, you get comfortable with the job. So let's see what this example says on 251. An employing broker must withhold income taxes, withhold and pay social security and Medicare taxes and pay unemployment taxes on wages paid to an employee, very true. However, brokers do not generally have to withhold or pay any taxes on payments to, uh, to self-employed workers, which is most agents. Um, when reporting income to the Internal Revenue Service of the IRS, the broker will use IRS Form W-2 for employees and IRS Form 1099 for self-employed individuals. Uh, very true. And it just depends on your broker. You might actually have a broker that allows you to get your W uh, to, to have you do W-2 versus a 1099. And what I mean by that is you will sign when you sign your contract with them. So if it's like Keller Williams or somebody else, um, you might find that they're willing to put you as a W-2 wage earner, meaning that they will help calculate out the taxes every time you get a commission. But usually with when you become a W-2 wage earner, um, promoted as a W-2 wage earner, you get paid on the 1st and the 15th, or you get paid on the last day of the month and the middle of, uh, of the month. You don't get paid as soon as the commission comes in. And most people want to go and keep that 1099 relationship so that they can um, just get their monies and worry about their taxes on their own time. So the legal status of a licensed salesperson. So for the purpose of the California real estate law and regulations, a salesperson or broker salesperson is considered an employee of their broker. Yeah. So in California, um, they, they definitely are um, considered, and we're going to keep right, we're going to break down this information. Um, you don't really have to go through the, the rest of that, but IRS classification is important. Um, an associate licensee or just a salesperson that that's what we are, right, is not considered an employee for federal income tax purposes nor does the IRS consider real estate licensees independent contractors. So in fact, in 1982, real estate licensees have been classified by the IRS as statutory non-employees, but the state of California does not see things in the same way. So IRS sees us as independent contractors. So the general use by the IRS is that an individual is an independent contractor if the payer has the right to control or direct only the result of the work and not what will be done or how it will be done, uh, meaning get paid, right? The IRS does not consider real estate licensees. I thought that, oh, the California does. Uh, the IRS does not consider real estate licensees as independent contractors. Um, probably because we have broker influence, but independent contractors are what the California Franchise Tax Board thinks of us. So statutory non-employees. So licensed real estate agents are classified by the IRS as statutory non-employees. If an employing broker has and real estate salesperson meet the following test, the broker is not treated 
as an employer and the salesperson is not treated as an employee for federal income tax purposes. So we should have a list, statutory non-employee. So basically we don't, we don't need this right here, this independent contractor because the general rule, the payer has the right to control or direct only the result of the work. So you can see how we don't get to control the result of the work. We hope for the best, right? But we, I mean, our broker, our broker will take care of it. So according to common law rules, some independent contractors are treated as employees by statute if they are in certain categories. So what would those categories be? So under common law rules, anyone who performs services for a company is the company's employee. So that's the common law employee. If the company can control what will be done and how it will be done, then it's considered common law employment. Um, the real estate law requires that every broker must have a written employment agreement. And you're like, Kathy, have you said that like four times in this unit? Yes. So you're going to need to know this for the state exam as well as for the open book exam. An employment agreement is required in order to work under another broker's brokerage. When it comes to worker compensation insurance, this is where things get a little strange. And this is why the federal and state governments both, we must comply with both federal and state governments. So for federal and state income tax purposes, sales associates are considered self-employed. However, due to their employment um, status under the license law, a broker must provide workers' compensation cover to all of the sales associates. So earlier, like four slides ago, when we were talking about the, the cost of having people work on, in that brokerage and how you might find that some brokers are like, well, in order for us to um, be able to function properly and be efficient with our money, you're going to need to close two deals a month. That broker knows that when you walk in and get employed by them, that they're going to have to have some type of workers' compensation coverage over you if there's an accident on the premises um, with regard to you, whether you're a contractual employee, a W-2 wage earner, or any and all of the like. All employees of said brokerage will have workers' compensation insurance coverage over them. And I think that that um, I was talking to Dorothy about it because I always break things down with her because there's, there's a whopping three of us, right? Her and I and another agent. And um, she said that uh, she got an estimate of $17 and I had gotten an estimate of $25 a month. And so I, we were talking about how we can see now why um, a lot of these larger brokerages don't just say you have to come in with two deals a month, but there might be a desk cost of $25 a month for the right to come in and use the fax machine and the copy machine and the, the, the conference uh, room and different stuff like that. Um, compliance with workers' compensation. Hi, sorry, somebody's breaking in. Hi, and what I mean by that is love. Hey, are you okay? We're, we're in class, sister. Okay, compliance with workers' compensation insurance requirements is enforced by the Employment Development Department or EDD. And I will tell you right now, I know of a broker that's no longer in the industry and he was slapped with a half a million dollar fine because he can't prove that he paid workers' compensation for his company and they came after him in like 2015 and they were asking for um, proof from uh, him having uh, workers' compensation from 2004 or something like that. And he's like, I don't even know where any of the documentation would be. And why would he? Because you only keep records for three years, right? And we're talking a good 10 years later, 11. And because he was no longer in the business of being a broker, the compens the worker the work the workers comp insurance he had he would have been able to get back to that person or those people because he still would have it so it's a it's a tough situation to be in so he's been slapped with a half a million dollar fine that he didn't have it and he might not have had it I don't know but I just thought it was an interesting um, story so there's a lot of this regulation stuff that will come back to haunt you if you do not follow it failure to provide workers compensation coverage for real estate sales agents could result in fines of up to a hundred thousand dollars or half a million like Kathy shared um this could be part of what is considered a desk or office fee so we talked about that too um when it comes to training you can kind of understand now maybe now that we're on this side of things why a lot of brokers when you're a new agent will expect there to be some type of training and why the commission split would be low because they're going to be watching you take every step or they're going to have you shadow someone. So a 50-50% commission split 
um, sounds pretty standard and, and that doesn't mean that's what you get. That just means that you could see why the commission split would be so low because they're doing a lot of investing in you. One of the things I would ask you to do when you do interview a broker is ask what the commission split is. Is there any training involved in that? And is the training in addition to the commission split being 50-50? If it's in addition to the commission split being 50-50, you might want to get a second opinion. I know a number of agents that have gone through real estate um, brokerages and interviewed them and found that most of the reputable brokerages out there, the commission split is 50-50 and the training is associated with the commission split being where it is. Um, so how are commission splits um, broken down? So if the commission, um, if the commission is 6% of $425,000, that would be $25,000, $25,500. If we're looking at a commission split of 50-50, that $25,500 is going to come into your broker's office and however they do accounting, they are going to um, divide that in half because the, the broker gets half the money, the brokerage gets half the money, not the broker, the person, but the brokerage gets half the money and then you get the other half, which means your commission split would be $12,750. Oh, sorry. So the commission, let, let's start over again. Sale of the home is $425,000. It makes sense, but let me break it down just a little bit further. Your broker um, was the agent for the buy for the seller. And that way it'll make more sense. Okay. So the set the sale of the home was four hundred twenty five thousand dollars in your brokerage. or your brokerage, and let's say that you were the dual agent or your broker was the dual agent and you were working with both the buyer and the seller, the 3% on each side would be $25,000 total. So $25,000 comes into that brokerage. And then your check is 12,750. If you were the agent for just one side, just the buyer or just the seller, then the money's coming in the door would have been 3%, right? For your side of the negotiation. That would have been $12,750. And then the commission split between your, you being the agent on that side with your broker would be half of that, which means you'd be walking away with 600, sorry, Okay, and then that way it's it's broken down a little bit further. So we could say if our broker, if we were dual agents on the on both sides of it, and we had the buyer and the seller, or if we were just so it's fifty percent of whatever comes in the door to your broker's office. So we already know what the um, activities of, of of a brokerage are, but let's review the five uh, separate areas. Securing listings, finding buyers, negotiating transactions, arranging finance, and closing transactions. So how do we get that done? Well, we prospect, we find people that are interested in, in, in buying homes, right? And we do it through the means of a few different things. We might cold call, but how many of you take phone calls from numbers you don't recognize? Um, it might be the do not, uh, in, and if you're not following the do not call list or the do not fax rules, um, you're going to be in trouble. Those, 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 you can't just call willy-nilly anybody. There is a process that has to be gone through. Um, if you're going to be doing telephone and cell phone call negotiations or fax and advertisement, there um, the regulatory system is set up in such a way that you need to know what the law is. One of the questions on the unit exam and maybe on the book exam is, in general, both real estate licensees and unlicensed assistants may make cold calls, providing the calls are made between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Obviously, it would be Pacific Standard Time, right? Um, uh, when it comes to fax advertisements, along with the do not call list, the FCC adopts a do not fax uh, call as, uh, list as well. And I don't think you can technically um, advertise through fax. Uh, and I don't know a lot of people that are reading faxes that are coming in for advertisements. So, but there are regulatory systems set in place. Why don't you guys take a break? Take a 10 minute break. It's a 10 minute break. And we'll keep going.
Oh, for sure, Rodolfo. Um, the split could be lower. Um, well, technically, the, sp the split usually isn't lower than 50-50. So as an example, if, um, so we listed, hold on a second. So let's do this. Sales person commission. I'm gonna put class convo on here, right? So that we know. So when it comes to a salesperson's commission on a real estate property, so let's break that down. We'll go like this. And you guys, it is break. So feel free to go to break. We're, we're, I'm not trying to take your break away, but let's talk about it while we're not on. Well, I mean, let's just talk about it. So let's say we're selling a house for $500,000 or we have a house listed, listed price. And it's also the sales price. So somebody came in and made a mirror offer, which is like, whatever it says on the listing, we want to buy that house for, okay? Um, the uh, listing agent gets, yeah, 5% commission. This is something that only the listing um, agent knows. Um, so the, the owner of the house And listing um, agent knows this is not public record. This is not. This is not public. Okay. So because that's not public, um, the the selling agent, which is also it's basically we call them the buyer's agent, but they're the uh, the buyer's agent. Ooh. I'll, I'll, I'll mute you, don't worry. So the buyer's agent is the same as the selling agent. And people are like, no, they're not because the, the listing agent is the one selling the house. Actually, the person bringing the buyer in is getting this house sold. So they're the selling agent. The um, advertisement, um, I guess you could call it, or advertisement listing states that the buyer's agent will receive 2% um, commission. So let's break that down, okay? And you're like, this is weird, Kathy. No, actually, this is very realistic. This, we, we always think that if we see in an advertisement that says that the buyers, that, that if you bring in the buyer, that the 2% you're getting is the same as the listing agent. But sometimes the listing agent has a totally different amount and that's not public record. That's not something known to everybody. The only one that's public is the, that if you bring us the buyer, we'll give you 2% of the purchase price. So let's look at these numbers. 500 times 0.03 is $15,000. And then, um, and we'll come back to it in just a moment. Buyer's agent, uh, what is the buyer's agent getting? 500,000, I'm sure it's easier than me doing it this way, but we're gonna run with it, it gets $10,000. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we happen to we happen to find out that um, the the commission with their broker is um, seventy thirty. What that means is when that $15,000 comes in, that agent is getting 70%. So $15,000 times 0 0.07 
Yeah. Sorry, 0.7. I'm like, what? 10,500. So if we look at it from here, we let's look at it this way. Broker is 50, 50. So, well, I don't think I have to calculate $5,000. So that means their commission would be $5,000. Does that make sense? So our commissions are set based on our contract. The listing agent is getting 5% because the owner that's letting them, let's say we're the agent listing this property and the seller of the property is like, ah. Oh. Like, I'm just so tired of this house. If you'll just take care of everything, I will give you a 5% commission. And you're like, oh, okay. So two and a half for me, two and a half for the person that brings the buyer. And the, the owner of the house is like, no, I will give you 5%. We can give the other agent that brings the buyer too, but there's a lot that needs to be done in the house. And I'm willing to pay you 5%. So that's why I use weird numbers. I'm not going to stick with three. And I'm trying not to stick with 50, 50, because those are like standard operating um, information and that might not be what you're dealing with with not only your broker but you might not have a client that that you're dealing that's dealing with that stuff either does that make sense you guys are still on break for those of you that are like aren't we supposed to be on break Kathy yeah we're on break <laughs> we got like three minutes okay so Rodolfo commission can be confusing with these book exams because you're like wait is it the commission that the client is paying me to help me find them a house or the listing uh, or the seller of the property to help me list their home. And so we, when we talk about commission in here, I try to separate them, but um, because you, you got, you get a commission to sell the house or your brokerage gets a commission to sell the house. So you get two or 3% of the purchase price if you're the listing agent, maybe. Right. And then what happens is that money goes to the brokerage and then your contract you have with your brokers, like, this amount of money. Now things can get a little bit more, more whirly twirly because let's say you're an agent that you're at a 50, 50% commission split. So let's say this is you guys, you're a new agent, you're at 50, 50. Uh, you didn't know that the other agent was getting 5%. You're like cooking with gas, like 2%. It's, it's money in the bank, right? That $10,000 comes into the bank. It comes into your office and your broker's like, Hey, we know that your, your commission splits 50, 50, but we also know that you've been shadowing another agent. And because of the time they've invested in your, uh, sale, they actually are going to get 10% of the monies that would come from you. So what is 10% of $5,000? 5,000. I should know this off the top of my head, but ladies and gentlemen, we're do not. And so $500 out of your money is going to go to the person that you were shadowing because they were helping you walk through the door and get that process done. So you can kind of see where some of this stuff could be a little bit like, um, you'll almost feel like you're being nickel and dime to death. So then you're like, Oh, I got to pay that guy $500. I got a desk fee. I got the, 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 the association dues that are coming out on a monthly basis or annual, depending upon how you're going to do your association dues. I've got this, I've got that. I've got the lockbox key. I've got the, you know, and, and then you start calculating out the number and the money. And you're like, I don't want to shadow anyone else. I need to find a broker that'll do a 70, 30 split or an 80, 30, 20 split or where you're making more money because you don't need to shadow anyone in, anymore. And so when we talk about shadowing other um, agents, I don't want you to feel like it's a forever thing. It's kind of like that next step in your educational experience because you're getting hands-on training. You're paying for that hands-on training. And then if you don't feel like you're paying for it, if you feel like you're paying for nothing, then maybe you need to go to a broker that's going to give you what you're looking for. Um, okay. I was going to say with that, oh, whoo. Our break is up. Just so you guys know, you were on break. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let me get a sip of the juices of the energy drinks. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Let's keep going. 
So the activities of a brokerage are varied, securing listings, finding negotiations and all the things, right? You can cold call people. You can pound the pavement and do thank you cards to every door in your neighborhood and say, I just want you to know how much I appreciate being your neighbor. And I'm new to the real estate field and I just got licensed, but I'd love to sit down and talk to you about what you would like to see in our community as uh, real estate agents um, uh, and how we can benefit you and find a way to communicate with them. And that's all book two. Like we will talk about marketing like nobody's business. I will work on that stuff with you guys because that's fully my wheelhouse. But prospecting is like mining. It's like um, the, the 49ers or the gold miners of, uh, of, of 1848, 1849, 1848. The people that were here already knew before that, that there was gold here. They just only used what they needed. Um, and then the California happened, the gold rush happened. But um, all of that being said, when people arrived here, they weren't immediately miners. They were prospecting for gold. So I'm asking you to go out and prospect for the gold that is your community or in your community. I need you to find those nuggets, find those houses. Those will be the nuggets, right? Cold calling is very much so getting a list of names that's supposed to be scrubbed against the do not call list. And then if you're going to fax advertisements against that as well, but I can tell you right now, they, they, I don't know that it, it might be a thing now, but I, I would venture to say it's not a thing. Um, unless you can market like the 80s are back, y'all, we're going to be faxing advertising. Mean, I don't know. Like you could spin it. Uh, there are people in this class that could sell glasses to a person um, that couldn't use them even if, you know, like anyway. So I'm just saying. Okay. When you do telephone calls, you need to make sure, the only question I want you to be sure of for page 253 is that you are aware that you can only call people between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. But if I get a phone call at 8.45 in the evening and it is not a family member, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not taking that call because I don't know who it is. And it could be phishing. It could be any of the things. Everyone's like, oh, the digital era and drama and drop. People are not gonna necessarily answer the, the phone. So how are you gonna get those prospects to become something more? at your principal. You need to know about the Can Spam Act of 2003 because it became in effect at the beginning of the next year and it regulates commercial email messages. And why does it do that? Well, because there's a bunch of commercial, once people got email addresses, everybody starts getting slammed with advertisements. And then it's like, how do I get rid of these advertisements? And then the netiquette of the time was to email them back and say to whom it may concern, I'm not interested in receiving information from you. And whoever was on the other side of that email, if they decided to be hostile, could totally cause your email to be filled with an onslaught of questionable emails from questionable companies. And I will leave it at that. Um, the Can Spam Act defines the commercial email message as an electronic mail message, the primary purpose, purchase, sorry, the primary purpose of uh, which is commercial advertising. And the emails are regulated now where they have to be, they have to let you know it's a solicitation and there has to be an opportunity for you to opt out. Unsolicited email messages sent by real estate agents to people on a mailing list of for the purpose of offering the agent services is considered a commercial email. And so how do you get that information done? Well, once you become a member of the association, once you get licensed by the Department of Real Estate, you're going to get pummeled with agents and brokerages saying, we want to hire you. Well, because your information and your address are now public record. So you're going to get advertised all day, every day on that kind of stuff. When you become a member of the local association, you're going to start getting messages from ADP. Is ADP, is that the alarm company? And other things. And I remember I got this one email that was like, you need to make sure that you verify your information. You need to get back, get, get a hold of us. ADT, thank you, Erica. And I messaged them back and I said, I need you to clarify where you receive my information because I don't have um, anything with you. And this is questionable practices with regard to commercial email messaging. And I'm telling you, man, those people were on that really quick. And they're like, no, it's not because you signed up. I said, I did not sign up for ADT. I know that I didn't. And they're like, well, we're a subsidiary or a sister company of the yada yada. And I messaged back and said, I did not. And, and the thing is, it was not to like my regular email. It's this, it, it wasn't to my, sorry, let me start over again. When I sign up for stuff, I put it in my junk email address. I, this was, this is my business email. I, I'm like, no. No, I, and the thing is, they kept sending messages like, well, you probably, and I said, no, I didn't. You need to tell me who you got my information from. And my, part of the reason that I do that stuff, because you're like, Kathy, you're such a hard no. Part of the reason I do that stuff is I need you guys to, I need to be able to use it for a tool for teaching, 
But I also want you guys to understand that there are people a lot harder than I am. And they'll just reach out to the Department of Real Estate and say, hey, Kathy's been emailing me and I have proof of emails that I didn't ask for and they are commercial related and you can lose your license over, over this kind of stuff. And so my message back to them was, hey, I don't know how you got my information. I will reach out to the different companies that I have that have my information and confirm with them. But it is possible this is going to have to be reviewed um, because it's questionable email practices. And and um, they were they were like, okay, well, we'll 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 make a note of the that you didn't want it. And I'm like, you can, but part of the reason I'm doing that is if I'm teaching it, we've got to figure out if this stuff works, right? It's all hypothetical in theory until we we implement it. And there was a there was a little bit of a pushback initially, like, well, you and I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I teach, I didn't say that in the email, but I teach this stuff. Like you guys can't just use those excuses. Anyway. Um, I haven't gotten any more ADT. I'm not saying ADT is a bad thing. I just don't know where they got my email. I want to know where they got my email address. That's all. Marketing and advertising is really important. And there are legal ramifications to the way it's done. Successful real estate businesses pay careful attention to advertising and marketing for their firm because they can lose their license. Your broker is not willing to lose his license, his, hers, or their license over a marketing technique, nor any other legal reason. Not that marketing isn't legal, but that's like a slap on the wrist versus like breaking the law and stealing someone's home. Um, advertising guidelines, real estate advertising is regulated by the state and federal agencies that expect real estate companies to be truthful. Just so you guys know, we gotta be on the up and up. Um, and how do we do that, Kathy? Well, a real estate broker or firm must disclose its licensing status on all advertisement. It's all of the advertisement. Well, what is advertisement uh, with regard to it? Any type of solicitation material under the sun. And if you question whether it is or it isn't, it should. A real estate licensee must disclose his, her, or their digital eight digital license identification number on all solicitation material and on the real estate purchase agreement when acting as an agent on those transactions. Um, and we'll talk more about that later on, but that's why one of the questions to have with a broker, some of the times when I say things like you should talk to your broker about this or that, I'm not saying it so that, uh, I'm saying it so that that broker is like, oh, you're aware that we need to follow regulatory systems with regard to marketing. And so that is a question to ask the broker. Hey, so how do you, do you guys have a standard template for advertising? What's the right way of doing things, um, with your company and how can I help promote that? And then your broker will say something along the lines of we have a template for all of our marketing ads on digital media. We have a template for all of our listings and the flyers that are in front of our office, at our, our houses that are for sale. And we have this for any of our multiple listing services. This is how we want things set in, in play. And they'll share with you um, exactly. And that broker is going to go, I think I want, you know, um, this person in the off in, in my, I want to work with, um, Alexis. I want to work with Anthony. I want to work with Avery and Darrell and, and Diego and Erica and so on and so forth. Uh, they understand that these are the concerns that are coming to play, um, for the standard operating practice. And I'm not going to have to bring them in my office. And because we found that there was something that was solicited that didn't have the eight digit license identification number on it. And it's not just that there's like a, there's a few words that have to be put, but this is just an example. So we have to be careful. So solicitation materials. Um, do you need to know what solicitation materials are? I think you guys know what they are. If you want to note page 255, you can, but it's basically business cards, stationary websites owned or controlled um, by the licensee, the broker, anything that's being advertised and the list can go on. Just so you know, if the commissioner in any way, shape or form feels that there has been some question about advertisement, they will do a deep dive on all of the social medias associated with that company. And hopefully they come up dry, meaning they don't find anything. Um, what about use of words? Real estate ads should not have words that state or imply a preference or limitation with regard to race, color, religion, handicap, sex, familial status, national origin, the type of dog you prefer to have in the house, the type of cat you prefer to have in the house, the type of car you prefer to have in front of the house, the color of the interior of the car, the type of shoes, the toenail paint, whatever it is, it cannot show discrimination. And you're like, Kathy, toenail paint? Yes. You, maybe you wouldn't be surprised. For and I'm not, your broker's going to be like, she said toenail paint. I just want to share with you discrimination or bias um, in any way, shape, or form, for any reason, isn't big into the O, okay? So for example, stating housing for older persons is acceptable, provided that that property is being rented to an age-qualified resident. So 
if it's a senior citizen community, it will need to say something on there like, uh, if y'all aren't 65, you can't come knocking on the door. I think it's 62, um, but, or 55 or this or that. You can, I, you can do that because that program or that business or that entity or that, that apartment complex is associated with being federally regulated and funded for that age. Um, court cases regarding advertising practices. There have not been a large number of court cases that in, illustrate advertising um, using a, a, a <laughs> offensive phrases, but part of the reason for that is, is the day is young. No, um, you don't have to say it in it, but let's see what we've got as a court case here. Housing Rights Center versus Donald Sterling Corporation. In Los Angeles, California, several tenants sued their landlord, Mr. Sterling or Donald Sterling Corporation, because the landlord preferred Korean tenants over non-Korean tenants. Uh, it, I don't know if this was in Koreatown, but it's okay. The landlord actively discouraged other ethnic groups from moving into apartment buildings. The lawsuit was based on the name of the apartment building. So for example, the Mark Wilshire Towers were renamed to the Korean World Towers and another building was renamed to include the word Korean. A federal district court told the Donald Sterling Corporation that they could not use the word Korean in the name of the buildings and had to stop demanding information about national origin to rental applications or in rental applications. But if it's in, so I don't know how you guys are in the areas that you're in, but we've got Koreatown, we've got Chinatown. When I lived in the Silicon Valley, we had um, like little Saigon and it could be just the names of what we knew them to be the names um, of areas. And so I could understand why uh, the Donald Ster Sterling Corporation, if it was in a part of town, would put that in the name because if that, that part of town had a large group of one particular nationality. Does that justify the actions? No, I'm just saying that um, for, when you're on the outside looking in, it makes complete sense. But when you're in it and you're like, hey, well, this is a primarily Korean area. If it's a Korean um, in the name of it, maybe, maybe it'll push us to have an influence. But you'll see right here, it says, the lawsuit was based on the name of the apartments. The, um, the landlord discouraged other ethnic groups from moving in. And there's your sign right there. You, you might be uh, considered um, to have some type of a discrimination if you're like, oh, hey, uh, Kathy, you can't be here because of whatever. I'll tell you with my last name though, I have gotten hired for jobs because people thought I was a certain nationality um, or that I had a certain ethnic background. Uh, uh, um, and uh, I'm okay with that. Which sounds probably weird, but um, I was hired to work on a film and it was all in Punjabi. And I'm like, oh, I don't speak Punjabi. They're like, your last name, are you sure you're not Indian? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm not Indian, but I, I'm, well, I'll do the job. It was fun. So they gave me, a, they gave me the script in English and I'm like, I don't know what page you, like, I didn't even know what page we're on. It was crazy, kind of crazy. Okay. They hired me sight unseen, like the Ann, the Ann and George. No, that was a different story. Okay. We'll talk about that in the next book. All right, when it comes to real estate signs, you guys need to be aware of what you have the right to do. The ability to display real estate signs has some protection under the United States and California constitutions as a form of free speech, which is so true. Sign regulations, a city and county may ban all signs on publicly owned property. So you can't go if you have got like a local dog park down the street, you can't put a for sale sign with an arrow in the ground. But if you have like open houses, you can put up one of those um, A-frame things going, hey, come and check this out. So that's not the same as putting a sign up. That's putting a, a bill, that's like a, like a note going, hey, today we'll have open house. A city or county cannot ban signs on privately owned property. Very important. A city or county may impose reasonable restrictions on the time, place, and manner of displaying signs regardless of whether it is in privately or publicly owned property. So there could be some regulatory systems with regard to the, the time and even the placement, especially like on a planned unit development or a CID community um what does the cid stand for you guys will help me i'll have to look it up but like a plan unit development gaining community there are places because there's ccnrs associated with those properties where um signs can and cannot be placed um joining trade and professional organizations it's really important for you to join your local association um and what is that a trade association is a voluntary nonprofit organization of independent and competing business units engaged in the same industry or trade do you need to know what a trade association is? It might be a good idea to know the term. I don't think it's on the book exam or on the state exam. 
a real estate board or association is made up of the members who share an interest in that business, right? So a member of the NAR, the National Association of Realtors, is known as a realtor and must follow the National Association of Realtors rules and the code of ethics. Um, you need to know that you must be a member of NAR, National Association of Realtors, to be a realtor. That is a question. I don't know if it's going to be on the book. I know there was a question like that in the book exam, but the, you will be asked about the realtor with the copyright, the little R thing at the top. Um, for regulatory reasons, you're going to be asked a question with regards to being a realtor on the California Department of Real Estate exam as well. And it, they just, it just, uh, you need to be a member in order to have that logo. Ethics is a set of principle or to be ethical is, is it's with regard to a set of principles or values by which the individual guides his or their own behavior. Um, and by observing them, you're promoting goodwill and harmony. So do you need to know what the word goodwill is? I think you guys know that one. I think you guys know ethics too, but it is good to know them because most of the state exam and even uh, parts of the books of, of each of the book exams, but, but mostly the state exam is going to make sure that you understand ethical behavior with a license. Did we give you this license and are you able to follow the law and protect our consumers uh, in the manner that we need you to? And so that would be ethical behavior. So that's why I brought that up. All right, so let's talk about the federal laws. Do you need to know all of these? No, but I want you to know where they are in the book so that if you have a question on the open book exam, you can flip back to page 258. So in 1866, that's the Civil Rights Act. In 1868, the US Supreme Court case of Jones versus Meyer prohibited discrimination based on race. Um, the Fair Housing Act is a big deal and you'll hear more about the Fair, Fair Housing Act. Um, so Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 and the Fair Housing Amendment Act of 1988 have taken together constitute the Fair Housing Act. So please note that on 258. Specifically, the Fair Housing Act provides protection against the following discrimination, discrimination regarding housing practices. So you cannot discriminate on race, color, religion, color, handicap. I said color twice, twice right? Race, sex, religion, color, handicap, familial status, national origin. Actions prohibited in the Fair Housing Act, refusing to rent with regard to these discriminations, refusing to sell, treating applicants differently dependent on the uh, discrimination list at the top, treating residents differently after they've moved in, advertising a, a, a discriminatory housing preference or limit. We prefer that nobody with more than five children rent this house. That's discriminating against people that have six or more, right? Providing false information about the availability of housing. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, well, there's a house and then a particular group of people walk in and you're like, sorry, the house is no longer available. They leave, another group comes in, you're like, oh no, no, the house is available. I just didn't wanna rent it to them. Harassing, coercing, or intimidating people from enjoying their uh, rights to the property to live their best life, right? Blockbusting, which is persuading an owner to sell or rent house uh, or renting housing by saying that the people of a particular uh, nationality or religion are moving into the neighborhood, imposing different loan terms with regard to discrimination, denying use of or participating in real estate services such as broker organizations or multiple listing services with regard to that, which is so terrible. Um, so Kathy, what are you saying? You can't discriminate guys, final answer at all. You can't discriminate for age, nationality, all of the other ones. And then you can also not discriminate for anything that will be coming down uh, the pipe, if you will, at the, from this point forward. Because all of that, if it comes up, if it quacks like a duck, it, talk, it walks like a duck, it's a duck. Discrimination is in and of itself its thing. And it'll come across that way. So we need to be able to protect the people with disabilities. The American Disabilities Act or ADA protects anyone who has a handicap and includes mental illness, AIDS, blindness, hearing impairment, mental retardation and mobility impairment. Um, more than anything, I'm finding now that ADA is, is associated with um, people will discriminate because they don't think there's a handicap because they think, oh, well, you don't have a handicap. You look fine. Well. Handicaps are not necessarily visually seen. So I want you guys to think about that. Housing for older persons. In response to the concerns for senior citizens residing in retirement communities, Congress provided exemptions for housing for older persons, which meet certain criteria. And Erica shared with us last week in class 
about how um, Tyler Perry was paying the taxes and then he's he's forward pay he forward paid the taxes for the next 20 years in a particular area and community and the majority of the people that lived in that area were um, older people so instead of building buildings and moving people out of the home that they've lived in for the last 40 or 60 years or 50 years he made it so that hey I'll do what the government's doing but I'm going to do it on my time the way I want to do it and he said it so that these people don't have to worry about property taxes on their properties and they can live within their means and then hopefully they'll also be able to keep those houses maintained because they're not worried about paying their taxes for their, their the silver years of their life um so senior citizen housing exemption so a house is provided under the state or federal program specifically designed and operated to assist elderly so the, if it's there to assist elderly that means there's been federal funding so those houses are retrofitted for specific people of a specific age. Um, the housing's intended for um, uh, and occupied by 62 years or older. The houses are intended and operated for occupancy by at least one person that could be possibly 55 years um, or older. And then 80% of the units are occupied by at least one person 55 years or older. So it is 62, but sometimes people marry a little younger. Uh, <laughs> So um, housing has significant facilities and services to meet the physical or social needs of other persons. The policies and procedures demonstrate an intent to provide housing for persons of 55 years or older. So California Fair Employment and Housing Act. The California Fair and Employment Housing Act is derived from an earlier law. So it's the Rumford Act. And we don't have to dive too deep into it right now. It's that the Rumford Act will be covered really strongly over the course of the next two books. Um, this dealt with specifically with prohibiting discrimination in the sale, rental, or finance of practically all types of houses. And it should be all types, but the reason it says practically is associated with what we were just talking about, senior citizen housing. Um, we're not discriminating when we tell the 25-year-olds they can't move in because you have to be at least, it's for 62 years or older, but you can be 55 depending upon the type of retirement home it is. Um, I remember I never saw the show uh, I, I, in real time. I think it was on reruns, but there was a show with Tim, uh, Tom Hanks, and he and his friend um, were cross-dressers. I think it was an 80s show. And the reason they were cross-dressers is they found that the apartment complex that was that could only have women in it was, was more cost-effective for them as men to live there to be able to continue in their lives and their careers. So they um, war, they they both looked really great. I can't think of the other actor's name, but I think of things like that when I think of these senior citizen homes and things where people are trying to get into these places because they're cost effective. So we just have to figure out how to build in our community homes that are cost effective for people um, that need something that's uh, that's that's more at their financial level. Um, so let's talk about the Unruh Civil Rights Act. Um, this was enacted in 1959 and it covers illegal discrimination in all business establishments, including real estate companies. The act specifically outlaws discrimination in housing and public accommodations based on sex, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, disability, medical condition, marital status, and sexual orientation. And, and yes, sexual orientation was something they talked about back in 1959. Um, there's no, we can't steer, we can't block bust, and we can't redline. You're like, Kathy, what does that mean? So we can't steer. It's the illegal practice of only showing buyers certain houses in certain areas. We can't block bust, so we can't cause panic selling because somebody of a different nationality is moving into the area. And we can't redline, which means that it's the illegal use of the property location denying financing. As lenders, we can't go, all the houses go into foreclosure on that side of town. Well, maybe all the houses go into foreclosure on that side of town because the dam breaks every year and all of those people walk away and they're like, well, forget it, we're done. You know, who knows? We don't know what the reason is behind it, but we can't redline anyway. The Housing Financial Discrimination Act or the Holden Act prohibits all financial institutions from discriminating in real estate loans um, based on geographical locations. So California, let's talk about, and we already kind of went over that. So we're gonna jump over to California Civil Code. The section of the civil code prohibits discrimination for renting, leasing, or sale of housing, um, whether they're blind, whether they're handicapped, whether they're deaf, um, no matter what the situation, the discrimination can't be there. So we've got to be careful. Oh, there we go. All right. Everybody's muted. Perfect. All right. So commissioner's regulations. So the commissioner over the Department of Real Estate 
make sure and has areas that are covering each of the areas that we kind of touched on. So we're going to go a little bit further with it. So the California Real Estate Commissioner has made it very clear that a person's real estate license will be restricted, suspended, or revoked for any violations of the fair housing laws. And I don't know that we have to go through them. I just want to note on 259 that you can't refuse to list or show properties to anybody. Process applications faster with one group or, or another. State to some people that property is no longer available. Use special codes on an application. You're like, Kathy, what are the, the special codes? You can't put that the couple is of a particular nationality. You can't code things. Um, but I'll put things like, um, I do code stuff on my files. I'll put like APR, like this has to close by April. So, but it's, you know, like you can code stuff on your files, but you can't code for, from a perspective of discrimination. Charging more for cleaning and security deposits on some, some people over others, assist others. Um, oh, you can't assist other people to break the law or discriminate. So, and you can't block bust. So licensees are prohibited from creating fear, alarm, or transmitting written or oral warnings regarding the presence of prospective entities of one or more persons of another race, color, sex, religion, ancestry, marital status, or national origin in an area or neighborhood. Now, if we have a zombie apocalypse and a, a zombie apocalypse, it's okay to run screening through the streets, but, but you can't discriminate for any reason under the sun, if Godzilla is coming out of the ocean to attack Los Angeles or wherever, like you can say something about those, those are true situations, but block busting is not actually a true situation. This is um, causing there to be fear to get people to sell their homes. Um, there's not a lot of people that are going to be selling their homes if, um, if Godzilla is coming through uh, the neighborhood though, let's be honest. All right, let's jump over to unit 14, guys. We are on the slippery slope. All right, review, no, we do not have the same pages anymore. Aren't you guys glad you don't have 600 pages? There were 600 page books before. All right, real estate specialization. And you're like, Kathy, you haven't already gone here? Yes, we have, we're gonna, we're gonna swing back by. Usually the majority of real estate transactions take place in re the residential market. And I think we've all talked about that. A lot of people said, I wanna go into residential, but there's other things. There's commercial real estate. You could do mobile home brokerage. Um, there are other types of business opportunities. You might want to work with Edison or PG&E. So in unit 14, what do I want you to be able to walk away with? Obviously not falling asleep. Recall areas of real estate in which the licensees may specialize. That's really all this is. So 273, what are the differences between a mobile home and a manufactured home? Well, that would be the date on the property, on the, on the personal property itself, mobile homes and manufactured homes are technically personal property because they are moved onto a property until they are hardwired in or secured in. They are personal property. A mobile home is a factory built home, uh, factory built home manufactured prior to 1976. That's the term. There's the definition. Manufactured homes are built in a factory after June 15th of 1976. Those are the differences. The federal standards that are regulating manufactured homes now have obviously far surpassed what they were back in the 70s. It's been almost 50 years, right? Well, 45 years, 43 years. So the strength and durability, transformability, fire resistance was a really, is still a really big deal with mobile home parks. Energy efficiency and quality have definitely changed and the type of materials used. So the HUD code, um, so the HUD, So the Manufacturing Home Construction Safety Standards, which are the is the HUD code. Let's put that over here. So each home or segment of a home is labeled with a red tag. So when we're talking about mobile homes, they, mobile homes back in the day used to be a single wide, a, a double wide or a triple wide, and they came in single wide segments to be moved into properties. And now they are, they all have, and they, they also had some type of a, it was almost like having a permit, um, almost like a registration for a car. If you think about a mobile home, it had, it was a little bit like going to the DMV. There was, it was, it's considered a wagon. So it's because it's mobile, right? A mobile home. 
So it had um, a type of um, regulatory sticker that was put on it. So each home or segment of a home is labeled with a red tag. That is the manufacturer's guarantee that the home was built and, to, and, was con and is um, conforming to the manufacturer's home construction and safety standards. Um, today, many manufactured homes are attached to a permanent single family foundation and are considered real property, but they have to have a permanent single family foundation in order for them to be considered that because mobile homes are manufactured in a factory. They are personal property and remain personal property until they have been converted to real property. So a certificate of title is going to transfer ownership of a mobile home owned as personal property um, into real property. If the mobile home is real property, a clearance of tax liability must be signed by the county tax collector. And you're like, Kathy, what does all this mean? If you're interested in going into mobile home sales, it is important that you go and take a class because mobile home sales is likened to selling cars because you're selling, they are, they are considered, or before this, they were considered wagons or they were called wagons. So there's a, a process and a method to that building being put on this property um, um, that isn't your standard build the house uh, foundation uh, from the foundation all the way up. So transforming a mobile home to real property, there must be a building permit. The mobile home must be set on a permanent single family residence foundation. A recorded document must be filed stating that that mobile home has been placed on the foundation. So basically, what it's saying here is you've taken the axle off from underneath the house. It cannot be, it's no longer mobile. A certificate of occupancy must be obtained. So after transforming a mobile home to real property, the Department of Housing and Community Development must cancel the registration of the wagon because it's no longer a wagon, it's a house, right? With regard to mobile home parks, in any area or tract of land where two or more mobile home lots are rented or leased or held out for rent or lease to accommodate manufactured houses or mobile homes used for human habitation, it's considered a mobile home park. The, rent of, the rental of lots in a mobile home park is regulated by the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Do you need to know what HCD is? I think it's a good idea for you to know that, that um, the Department of Housing and Community Development um, abbreviation is HCD. You might have that on the, on the open book exam. I think uh, one of the unit reviews in the vocabulary side did have HCD as one of the options to put in for them, but I don't know if that answer, if that was one of the answers. So it's not a bad idea to just dog ear page 273. The mobile home's desirability of, to a buyer may be affected by the rules of the park. Very true. And what do you mean by that, Kathy? Well, you might buy that mobile home, par that mobile home for $180,000 but you're finding that that space rental is going to go from $400 a month for that space rental to $1,100 a month when you buy it. And that's part of the reason why the people are selling it. So there might be some rule in that park that's causing you to not want to buy that mobile home park. So it does say there's an example on the following page. So let's see what their example is. I'm just thinking about stuff I know people went through. Many parks have a minimum age requirement that at least one of the buyers must be of age, um, which is 55 or older, which is really true. There may be strict rules about animals, where they may be kept, and how they must be supervised when outside. And you guys know mobile home parks, if you've ever driven by one, they are stacked really close together. So you can kind of understand why no dog over this over the weight of 15 pounds, or, or you can't leave your dog outside without, uh, without them being on a leash or some of that other stuff. You can kind of understand why that stuff is, is set the way that it's set. Um, when it comes to marketing mobile homes, mobile homes, uh, mobile home parks cannot prohibit for sale signs within the mobile home park. But I don't know if you've ever driven through a mobile home park, but those mobile homes feel like they're right on each side of your car. So you can have a for sale sign in front of the building, but you're in a better place putting it in one of the windows because that's going to be a little bit higher than eye level from a car. The signs can be displayed in the window of a mobile home on the side or front of the mobile home facing the street. Signs can be uh, at least 24 inches wide and 36, 36 inches wide and can state the name, address, and telephone number of the mobile home owner or the person that's helping them sell the property. You can find examples in the unit as well. This is if you're wanting to go into it. Um, mobile homes, houseboats, some of this other stuff is very specific. So if you live in Tahoe, you might, you might be into doing real estate um, that has houseboats involved. If you're in Monterey, California, you might do that as well. I know a person that, a couple people that have 
houseboats there and that's their second home and they have their home other parts of california and then they go to monterey and just chillax for the weekend or whatever Houseboats, houseboats are a common site in Richard Bay in Salcedo, and they have been since the 1900s. Um, I've seen them in Tahoe. I've seen them in San Francisco Bay. I've seen them uh, in Monterey Bay. I'm sure Santa Monica has some stuff like that too, um, Long Beach and so on and so forth. The houseboat is basically a barge that is designed and equipped for use as a dwelling. And that's pretty much all you need to know about houseboats. Do you need to know it for the book? Nope. Do you need to know it for the state exam? No, it's just good to know it. Um, we've talked about timeshare properties in the past. A timeshare is a common owner. It is the common ownership of a single piece of property by an association of people with which each owner has the exclusive right to occupy for a specified time per year. This is the second time we've talked about this in the book. So you might want to just note what a timeshare is, but I don't think that you're going to need to worry about it. Um, for the book exam, for the state exam, it's good to know what a timeshare is. I think you guys know what a timeshare is. You, if you review it a couple times, it'll be like on um, the back of your hand. When it comes to agricultural properties, agriculture is an, is an essential part of the economy of California. We talked about this in the last unit, right? I was talking to you guys about apricot uh, trees and, and the difference between having that as a commercial um, uh, property versus a residential property. It's an income producing property. Agricultural property is defined as property zoned for use in farming, including the raising of crops and livestock. A farm produces plants and animal products like grains, milk, eggs, and meat. A ranch is land that is used for grazing livestock and the picture on the ranch dressing, uh, salad dressing container. Um, livestock includes domestic animals. So that would be cattle, horse, and sheep. Um, they also use, they're used for, uh, for, uh, for food, breeding, or um, draft purposes. Um, I think I've talked, if it wasn't your class, it was one of my other classes that one of my dad's friends, he lived in Clovis, California and his whole backyard was a particular type of flower. And um, this is pre Martha Stewart, um, Snoop Dogg, pre Martha Stewart going to jail, pre Martha Stewart having her own channel um, uh, on cable um, or show on, on cable. Um, but he, he did specialty flowers for her that were seasonal. And they look like squash, but they were very fragrant. And um, that was his thing. And so would you consider that to be agricultural property? It, it, he farmed them. He had that gar he had the garden. Anyway, so we you need to look outside the box. You can actually do this kind of stuff on your property too. It doesn't have to be on a large piece of um, acreage. Now he doesn't do it anymore. Um, and that was, uh, that was uh, back in the day, but I thought that was real fascinating. So business opportunity brokerages. So a business opportunity is any type of business that is for lease or sale. There's your term, there's your definition. It also includes the intang intangible but sellable asset of goodwill, which is the expectation of the continued patronage of an existing business. So when you're selling your business, you're like, the person that's buying, it's really nice. You guys are going to love working with them. That's the goodwill. The sale of a business is considered to be the sale of personal property. Steps in a business opportunity sale. So this is for those of you that are like, I might do commercial. Okay. If you want to do commercial real estate, that's cool. Um, you've got to list the business. The, the special business opportunity deposit receipt is completed when a buyer is found and, and brings in that money. The offer then is presented from the buyer to the seller for approval. My brother wanted to buy this really cool old uh, piece of property that had an old uh, restaurant and different things on it but the seller of the property really felt like they could make more money off of it. And I shared with my brother, I was like, they, if they don't take your offer, cause he gave them a really good offer. I'm like, they don't take your offer. They're going to lose that building. And they didn't take the offer. And the building is now in year four of being empty, which means the value is even less than what my brother had offered a couple of years ago. And he's like, ah, maybe I'll give him another offer in about seven months. I'm like, okay. Because the longer that he waits, the lower the, the, the sale is going to be, unless they're just going to let it go, uh, I don't know, burn to the ground. I don't know. So once an offer is accepted and uh, by the by the seller in the same way with real estate, escrow can open. Um, if there's any type of um, personal property that's been purchased for that business and there's creditors associated with it. So what I mean by that is like if you ever go into a salon and you see a bunch of shampoos and products on the wall, 
a lot of times those are credit. They're, they're not paid in full yet. They're net 30 or net 15, meaning that the product's been, been handed out to the salon and they have 30 days from the day it's been delivered to pay it off or pay towards um, what is owed on it. So if, for instance, a salon is being sold and there's a bunch of product on, on a particular wall, there that those might not be paid in full. They may not be clear. So any creditors associated with any additional personal information in that business, any any kind of product. And I always think of like a salon. Uh, I don't think of a nail salon uh, as much as I think of like a hair salon where there's different types of serums and soaps and conditioners and um, uh, moisturizers and all of those things. A lot of those are actually on quote unquote loan from the creditor. Um, so those, when you do a commercial property, all of that stuff would have to be listed with regard to what's owned and what has not been paid for. And the creditors are notified of the sale of that property and that that stuff's going with it. And if it is, you know, that whether or not they're going to get paid or not is secondary. A financing statement um, is filed with the secretary of state and the recorder's office, according to the requirements of the uniform commercial code once this all goes in the way it needs. If there's a liquor license as part of the sale, a liquor license is completely separate. So for people to go, I'm going to buy that business because it's got a liquor license with it. Well, you've got to get approved with the liquor license. Uh, you've got to go um, Department of Beverage and Alcohol or uh, the Department of um, Alcohol Beverage Control or ABC. You need to know this. Oops. You need to know this abbreviation is ABC. Um, you've got to be, you've got to know your ABCs in order to get a liquor license. That's the abbreviation, Department of Alcohol, Beverage and Control. You will be asked a question about uh, the abbreviation AB, ABC. So just so you guys know that those, so please note that. Um, arrangements for the assignment of the transfer of the lease. Um, so if you, if you buy a building in a, in a business and there's other businesses in it, there might, you might have to make sure that the people that are leasing the building are going to stay there now that you're the owner. Copy of the seller's permit and the tax clearance receipt, meaning that no taxes are owed against the property. Everything's paid in full when you walk in the door. Information about the employee's salaries, benefits, and employment insurance tax, as noted, if you're going to keep the people that are there with regard to the business. A lot of times people just sell their business, like if they have an insurance business or another type of business, and the employees don't go with it. And then an inventory is taken of the stock fixtures and any other personal property that will be transferred by the sale and the sellers um, uh, executes a bill of sale. So there's the purchase of the building and here's the, uh, here's the bill of sale for the personal property and the personal information. So once that property goes up on the market, if there are any creditors that should have been paid for products that are in that building, they're gonna be like, hey, uh, they owe me like $100,000 in product. I need, I'm gonna go pick it up or whatever they can't just the seller can't just sell without um out under out from under um a creditor page 276 perfect thank you all right sometimes the chat is not coming up and i do apologize for that okay so regulating the sale of a business opportunity. So in order to complete the transaction, a real estate agent must understand the requirements of the Uniform Commercial Code, the Bulk Transfer Act, and the California Sales and Use Tax Regulations, as, as well as the Alcohol Beverage Control Act, or ABC. I want you guys to understand something. If you're going to go into, and I'm pretty sure you guys know this. I don't think I'm like saying something you don't, you don't, you don't feel is a, is a very apparent. If you're going to go into commercial real estate, I want you guys to talk to Eve Capital. They are in Southern California. Um, uh, but Lauren uh, talked a lot about why they do the training they do and why they go through the process they go through and why the commission split is set lower and incrementally gets higher as you've been in the industry, because there's a lot of hands-on. Because for those of you that are like, oh, I pro well, I'll probably be okay with the Uniform Commercial Code. And then there's the Bulk Transfer Act and there's California Sales and Use Tax Regulations. And then there's the Alcohol Beverage Control. To get your real estate license, you don't have to be aware of how those work. You don't have to understand the paperwork involved. You just have to understand that it's there for you if you decide to go this direction. And if you decide to go this direction, there definitely needs to be training in this area um, because you don't want to make any mistakes. Uh, and, and you don't want to cut your eye teeth on the mistake. I'm, I, I was, I was taught by old school agents are like, yeah, Kathy, you'll cut your eye teeth on the mistake. We don't have those opportunities. Like I was given I'm, as I go through this with you guys, I think about all the times that, um, I just happened to get it right. But what if I'd gotten it wrong, you know? 
Uniform commercial code. So whenever money has been borrowed for the sale of a business opportunity, it follows that someone has a security instrument in personal property belonging to the business. So we need to make sure that that is understood. Um, when it comes to bulk sales, the purpose of a bulk transfer act is to protect the creditors of a person who sells a business. When a business is sold and most of all of the inventory supplies and other material are transferred with said sale, public notice must be given. The public notice is there to help the creditors realize that whatever they have given to this business on credit is going to be sold with the property or they can come in and take what's what what needs to be taken. Any bulk sale that takes place without complying with the requirements of the bulk transfer law is considered valid between the buyer and the seller, but fraudulent. This is why. And void against the creditor. And you're like, what does that mean? Well, the seller's like, okay, Kathy, I sold the house to you. Sucks to be you. Or, or the commercial uh, property sucks to be you. I'm, I'm leaving the Cayman Islands. You dropped $2 million in my account. And you're like, what? Okay. So then what happens is the creditors come knocking on the door. They're like, hey, we totally understand that you bought the, 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 the that you bought this business, but in no way, shape or form, are you allowed to keep $150,000 worth of uh, product? We're coming to get our product and we're going to sue you or we're going to take you to small claims court, or we're going to, you know, like the, it's, it's fraudulent and void. The sale of those products were not the sellers, even though you paid free and clear, you, even though you paid good money for them, it, it doesn't work that way. All right. Um, so security transactions in personal property and fixtures, Division 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code sets out the requirements for regulating security transactions in personal property and fixtures. When money is borrowed, and we talked a little bit about this on Tuesday, a promissory note is signed, just as in the financing of non-business property. The note is the evidence of the debt. So at the same time, the borrower executes a security agreement that gives the lender an interest in the personal property. So a security agreement is the document commonly used to secure a loan on personal property. That's the definition. And that's the term, 274. All right. So let's go to security transactions in personal property and fixtures. So for, to protect or perfect, as it is called, the interest created by the security agreement or prevent the security from being sold by someone else, a financing statement must be filed. So a financing statement is merely the document used to record the debt. It is not actually evidence of the debt. It's just like, oh, hey, here's what's owed. These are the things that are not uh, completely um, paid off as of yet. Okay. So California sales and use tax. Um, the sales and use tax law protects a buyer from liability from unpaid sales tax owed by the seller. So the sales tax is collected as a percentage of the retail sale of the product by the retailer. The owner of a retail business must obtain a seller's permit to collect the proper sale tax from customers and pay it to the state board of equalization. Uh, so if you have like an Etsy account or something along those lines where you're not, you're, your side hustle is still a side hustle and it's not your main hustle, um, there's documentation even in an Etsy account where you have to break down uh, the and sales tax will be, uh, will be pulled for the state board of equalization, uh, making sure that the property taxes are pulled out. A business owner who purchases tangible personal property for resale should obtain a resale certificate. That makes sense, right? So that any property purchase for resale is not subject to the sale or use of the tax. So before assuming the ownership of a business, I'm gonna highlight that. A buyer should obtain a copy of the seller's permit and a tax clearance receipt. You're like, what does that mean? They've been paying their taxes, y'all. We need to make sure that they have because they're not just like taking our money and, and skedaddling. So use tax is a tax imposed on the buyer who purchases goods from an out of state supplier for use in the state. And if you ever 
um, if you've ever done any Etsy's or any other type of like side hustle, um, run your own thing, you can seek use tax in, in, in its uh, entirety. But if you've never, um, if you've never done that, it wouldn't make sense. So I want you to know that's the term in the definition on 276. Alcohol Beverage Control Act or ABC. Whenever transfer of a liquor license is involved in a business opportunity sale, a buyer must not assume an automatic transfer of the liquor license because it's a different department on a different day. The Department of ABC, sorry, the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control issues liquor licenses and regulates the transfer of a liquor license from a seller to a buyer. So it's a whole entire new experience. Um, it looks like I'm having a, a moment with my thing. Hold on just a second. It might crash. If it crashes, we'll come back. Let me, let me check something. Nope. It's good. Okay. We'll get back in it. Sometimes it does weird stuff. I apologize, guys. Okay, so we're talking about liquor licenses. A buyer must apply for a license and may be turned down for any reason. So you don't, and and this is important because uh, one of my nephews just, they just closed on um, their, their franchising, their uh, place. It's called um, Poor Decisions, P-O-U-R. Um, in Hollister and they're they're basically franchising. So they've put in uh, like their second place. It's like somewhere up in the Silicon Valley. But um, even though companies, uh, they're able to buy companies or they're able to do these kind of things, those companies, the license, the, the new building, the, the alcohol license didn't come with the building. The opportunity to apply for it did. A sample of a notice of public safe, uh, of public sale can be viewed um, at the end of this unit, but that, Oh, it's okay. We'll leave it there. So it's important to know the information that it's not something that's just a, a quick fix. And I've had people say that all the time. Oh, we're going to buy this place because it comes with a liquor license. That's a separate, that's a separate process. So why invest in real estate? Let's move away from all that stuff and let's go jump into an, being an investor. We've talked about being an appraiser. We've talked about doing re residential uh, uh, sales. We've talked about commercial sales. We've talked about mobile or wagon sales, right? mobile home sales. So why invest in real estate? Historically, real property has shown a consistent growth in value and remains the best hedge against inflation. Um, some investors purchase properties that are ready for occupancy called turnkey properties. The four main benefits of commercial real estate, uh, with, which is not like a turnkey business, but you might find it to be a turnkey business if it already has like a CVS or a Walgreens on it are not just the pre not just the income, but appreciation, equitable buildup and tax benefits. And how do we know what the tax benefits are? Well, we've got to talk to our tax preparer with regard to that. Um, the benefits of appreciation and equitable buildup are available to a patient investor. So it's not always something that happens quickly. Appreciation is an increase in property value with the passage of time. There's the definition, there's the, there's the, um, there's the term. Unearned increment is the increase in value of a mortgage property, generally accruing to the benefit of the trustor. There's the term and the definition. Um, equitable or equity buildup is the gradual increase of the borrower's equity in a property caused by amortization of loan principal, meaning that um, equitable buildup is associated with the fact that they're paying down the principal on the loan. Um, when it comes to income, most invest investors look for a return on their investment relatively quickly, right? When a buyer invests a small down uh, with a small down payment and attains a loan to purchase a property, he, she, or they are using the lender's money to finance the sale. This is known as leverage. And you'll find with Robert Kawasaki, right? The rich dad, poor dad, he always talks about leveraging property with other people's money. The use of borrowed capital to buy uh, real estate um, is what is, is leverage. So there's your term, there's your definition. So what, what do we know about the tax benefits of income property ownership? Well, we don't know a lot because we're not the tax preparers, but I'm sure if you were to go talk to a tax preparer, they'd be able to explain to you what the benefits are 
for income producing property. Another benefit of investing in real estate is the tax benefit. Many times the tax implications will seriously affect a sale and cause a buyer or seller to realize that because of the taxes, full value of ownership may not be possible. Um, always consult with the tax specialist. Realtors are not investment specialists. So we need to think about, dial that back and think about that, right? Um, depreciation, page 280. One of the most important tax benefits of income property ownership is the depreciation allowance. So what is the depreciation allowance? You've got to talk to a tax preparer and your accountant with regard to that. Depreciation in the book is a tax advantage of ownership of income property. And income property is a property that's like an investment property. If you have a multi unit, um, if you have a single family residence that has four houses on that property or four units on that property, it is an income producing property and your primary residence because three of those residences are probably being rented out. Depreciation for tax purposes is not based on actual deterioration of the property, but on the calculated useful life of the property. A common method that can use uh, can be used to determine the dollar amount per year that may be deducted with regard to depreciation is considered the straight line method by which the same amount is deducted every year over the depreciation life of the property. And we talked a little bit like about the straight line method in one of the other units, either Tuesday or today. Um, do you need to understand what the straight line method is? I would encourage you to dog your page 280 and note what the straight line method is because we it was rep represented in the book three or four times and uh, repetition usually means it's in the open book exam. When it comes to capital gains, you'll find people that are investing in properties um, or even just their personal residence, like I don't wanna pay property, gain, pro property gains tax. I don't wanna pay this. Don't... Okay, no problem. Go to a tax preparer, go to a tax um, uh, um, specialist and ask them how to walk through that process. We can't give them advice because it could be considered giving them licensed advice and we can't do that as agents. A gain on an income producing property is calculated much like that for a personal residence, except any depreciation that has been claimed over the years must be subtracted from the cost basis. Um, and you can look at the capital gains, um, a calculated capital gains on the sale of income property um, breakdown can be viewed in this chapter. But we're gonna draw, we're gonna jump over to installment sales because we only are going to lightly touch on some of this information. An installment sale is one in which payments are made by the buyer to the seller over a period of more than one year. Um, this is one way capital gains and tax payments owed can be spread over a period of time. So when a buyer buys a house, let's say they buy a a $400,000 house and over the next four years, they, instead of giving $400,000 to the seller, they give them a hundred thousand dollars this year and then a hundred thousand dollars the next year and so on and so forth. The uh, taxes um, on the amount of money that was given that year would be associated with the taxes um, that could be um, taken from that on that year. And so you, that might be a situation where somebody is trying to lower their overhead taxes instead of receiving a chunk $400,000 this year, receiving $100,000 over the course of the next four years might financially benefit them from a tax perspective. Part of the tax liability can be deferred by the seller taking back a note and a trustee on uh, or on all inclusive trustees or an AITD or contract sale with monthly payments. And you could have that monthly payment be, you can pay all of them, uh, pay once a month, or you can pay a lump sum at the end of the year or something like that. Um, a 1031 tax deferred exchange is really important. And um, the reason this is important is this is where a client, and I think I talked to you guys about this earlier. We had a client who had um, a portfolio of properties and he liquidated some of those and put the money from that into a 1031 exchange. And he never touched that money so he could buy out a larger property, a more expensive property. So let's see what the book calls it. But because you do need to know what a 1031 exchange is, you will have a question with regard to the 1031 exchange on the state exam, not necessarily on the open book exam. The 1031 exchange, sometimes called a tax deferred exchange, is a method of deferring tax liability. It allows the investor to exchange a property for a like property and defer the gain until the new property is sold. Basically what that means is because he never touched the money because it's a tax deferred exchange. He liquidated this part of his portfolio and, and then expanded it to a different property over here. 
In a starker exchange, the investor must identify the replacement property within 45 days from the date of the relinquished property um, that has been sold and must go to settlement on the replacement property within 180 days from that previous sale. So the 1031 exchange isn't a situation where you can just sell your house and let escrow sit on the money. There's, there's time sensitivity to it. Um, you need to, uh, you don't actually, you don't need to necessarily know about the Starker exchange. It wouldn't exchange. It won't hurt you to know it for the state exam. You don't need to know it for the book exam though. Probate, however, 283 is the legal process to prove that a will is valid, right? Or that the will is being brought into question whether it was valid or not. A probate sale is a court approved sale for the property of a person who is deceased. So they're liquidating their, their, um, their assets. The purpose of a probate court is to discover any creditors of the deceased and pay them out of the state of the estate of the person who died. Um, the estate tax is a federal tax on the taxable estate of a descendant's assets at the time of his, her, or their death. All assets, real estate, stocks, bonds, all of the things held by the decedent, the person passing, are included in determining the decedent's taxable state. So California does not have an inheritance tax. Um, you might be asked that for the state exam. You might be asked that for the open book. I don't think so, but it is good to know that we don't have inheritance tax. Inheritance tax. An inheritance tax is a tax imposed on the privilege of inheriting property paid by the person receiving that property. But you do need to know what a gift tax is, not for the state exam, but uh, not for the book exam, but for the state exam, it's good to know that when owed a gift tax is paid by the donor. So a gift tax is a federal tax imposed on the transfer of a property or other assets, but it is paid by the person gifting the property. So your grandparents might gift you a property and the taxes owed on that would be paid by the grandparents before gifting it to you. Um, so urban sprawl is something that you guys do need to be aware of. I don't know that there's going to be a question about urban sprawl in the open book exam. Let's review it anyway. Urban sprawl, urban sprawl describes the unplanned and often haphazard growth of an urban area into adjoining areas. So smart growth planning tries to reconcile the needs of development with the quality of life. Smart growth focuses on revitalizing older suburbs and older city Center. So what's the principle of smart growth planning? Creating a range of prices and types of houses using compact building designs to make the best value, uh, but the best use of that land. So if you have, like I was talking to you guys about, um, I think it's Pier 43, maybe it's not Pier 39, it's further the Pier, the Pier, I'm like visually looking down towards Pier 39, and it's going the other way where the, um, and this would have been, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, but they they turned um, a canning uh, warehouse or industrial building into um, lofts and they were beautiful. Um, and they were kind of like architecturally, it was all like clean, uh, very modern looking, it was really cool. So they used, they found best use for that land or for that property. Uh, creating walkable communities where people can live, work and play. And in this particular area, that canning um, the canning lofts or the lofts, the canned lofts, I think is what it was called, something like that. Um, they had like um, a BJ's, that franchise restaurant um, right there and a couple other places. They had like a really great coffee shop there as well. Um, but it was a mom and pops. They were just had like, they made, uh, they, they helped build up that local community. Creating communities that integrate mixed land uses into planning, very true. Because they had residential, they had commercial, they had retail, they had all of it right there. Uh, preserve open spaces, farmland, and natural beauty. I didn't see that in San Francisco, but that is in other areas and encourage development in communities. Uh, mansionization, you do need to know what mansionization is. Um, basically, it's the process, the process of mansionization is in response to incredible land costs. So a home, uh, be, homes being remodeled and construction is emerging in older neighborhoods where, where small and medium-sized homes are, developers and homeowners are tearing those houses down and building larger, more extra extravagant homes on that exact same lot size. Um, so they call it mansionization. Um, you don't necessarily need to know what FAR stands for, but floor area ratio is a planning tool used to regulate a building's mass in relation to the size of its lot. You do need to know that information um, for the state exam. You do need to know what FAR stands for. 
Um, I don't believe that you're going to be asked about this abbreviation on the state exam, but you do need to know what the floor area ratio is. So um, infill development is simply the development of vacant parcels in existing urban and suburban areas. Infill developments are not, are not only keep green field, uh, fields green, they are able to take advantage of proximity to a larger pool of potential employees, transportation, and utility infrastructures. So more infill development taking place where um, there also has been a greater backlash towards such developments from neighboring residents known as not in my backyard. You might be asked questions about the NIMBY. I don't think you're going to be asked that for the book exam, but you could be asked for the state exam the not in my backyard stuff because it's associated with the, uh, in, in some forms um, uh, types of discrimination. Like we don't want that happening in our neighborhood, that kind of thing. So you could see where, yeah, there could be that issue. Go down there. Hold on just a second. Go down there. He's drinking my coffee. So just take off. We're jealous. We want to drink the coffee too. Okay. So brownfield properties, uh, let's jump over to 284. A brownfield is an abandoned commercial or industrial site or underutilized neighborhood where redevelopment is complicated by actual or perceived contamination. Um, the EPA's 2002 Brownfields uh, Revitalization Act is a program designed to empower states to change the way contaminated property is perceived, addressed, and managed. Um, there was a piece of property over in the Silicon Valley off of Santa Teresa and Bernal Road on the way to 101 that actually was um, a, a piece of property that had been contaminating, uh, contaminating the neighborhood and it actually caused problems. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, 281? Really? How is it that I'm? Well, that's okay. We'll run, we'll run with it. Um, so uh, that property laid dormant. And I think I've talked to you guys about it or one of my classes in the past where I drive by now and there's a gas station and a McDonald's and other stuff. I'm like, I will never get gas there and I will never eat at any of the, I will not patronize any of the stores there because I know that the soil that that's sitting on when back when I was a kid was contaminated. Doesn't have to make sense. It's just like my own mindset kind of weirdness. I was like, those French fries have a secret. Uh, anyway, um, okay. Successful land revitalization in Hawthorne. So the low enterprise real estate group successfully redeveloped the exchange. So in 39 Northrop, so let me give you a little background on it. Northrop um, had manufactured military and commercial aircraft parts. The Hawthorne facility, which manufactured electronics for the defense industry was closed at the end of 1997, leading a loss of 530 jobs. By, by uh, a byproduct of the manufacturing operation was hazardous waste that contaminated soil and groundwater creating the brownfield. Um, by solving the problem with the soil and groundwater contamination, Lowe was able to create 1,800,000 square feet of office, retail and industrial spaces through renovation of extinguished of existing buildings and new construction, meaning that they um, took some of these large warehouses that were used for manufacturing and they renegotiated uh, the interior of them to turn them into office spaces and such. Um, An AT&T Internet Data Center was the exchange's first tenant, taking nearly a 300 square foot space. And you could, I mean, why not? Like once things have been corrected, the soil's been corrected, the water's been corrected, you can kind of see why that would be um, a positive thing. So property management, we've talked about, have we, are we starting property management now? I think we are. The property management of a property on behalf of the owner is called property management or just the management in general is called property management. An individual property manager is usually a real estate broker who owns his or their own company and manages properties for various owners, especially like if you're in an area like Monterey, California, Pebble Beach, um, Carmel, you might find that doing property management in those areas is a good side hustle. Um, you can also do property management in other areas, Fresno, Clovis, um, Santa Clara, San Jose, South San Francisco, um, Oakland. There are areas that need property management because people are coming to town to visit their families. There could be Airbnbs and other things that are available. The building manager may be employed by a property manager as a direct, as a, or directly by an owner. So sometimes you can do property management. You can be over a building. Some people will even find that they would go into residential management um, these are employed by and they manage apartment complexes and sometimes um, as an apartment manager, uh, you can get a discount on your apartment rents. If not, it pays it in full. 
A management contract shows the terms of the agreement between the owner and the property manager. That's the term, that's the definition. Um, management fees are negotiated between the owner and the property manager. This may vary from 3% on large structures to a, as high as 20% on individual houses or smaller buildings with regard to the amount of rent that's coming in per month. So what are the functions of a property manager? Stay within the letter of the law, right? The property manager must be a jack of all trades because the duties are many and varied. They also might just have a phone uh, hotline to a plumber and to a pest inspector and some other things. Um, they have to report to the owner. The owner relies on the information provided. And if we don't let the owner know what's going down, we are going to lose our job, right? So we need to manage it properly. Um, managing property subject to rent control. There's rent control all over the state of California now, right? So rent control or rent stabilization is a collection of laws in some communities that limit or prohibit rent increases. That's the term. That's the definition. And um, there is, um, I'm trying to think it's over by, it's like coming to a Costco near you. I have a friend that lives, um, not just a friend, a colleague that, that does curriculum with me. And she was sharing that her building is rent controlled and that they would love it if she would get out of it uh, because um, she's been there for 40 years. And she's like, I've been here so long that, that they really would love to have me get out of here because she has the best parking and she has this and that. I'm like, well, you've been there the longest. It makes sense. Um, you can't, uh, so you've got to be careful with rent and you cannot just evict people for any reason. Typical provisions of rent stabilization regulations include control the amount that may be charged for a rental unit, determine the amenities and services that are included as part of that rent and provide for only good cause evictions. So that you've got to be really careful with the eviction notice, but you can evict people because you're, you've got to revive, you've got to work on that, um, on that property, you just have to check and see what the regulatory system states. These regulations work together so that the landlord cannot circumvent a rent limit by just evicting a tenant. So there's got to be a reason for it. Um, rent control has been in effect in a number of major cities for many years. The best examples known are New York City, very true, which still uses the same rent controls from the 1940s. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? So I don't know if it's broke. I don't think it is. So stabilization of rent, although regulations differ from city to city, rents usually can only be raised once a year. The amount of the increase is decided by the rent stabilization board of the city, the maximum allowed rent or MAR. Do you need to know what MAR stands for? I'm going to say no, but if I owe you, the, I'll owe you a cup of coffee if I'm wrong, but I can almost guarantee, I can almost 100,000% guarantee you're not going to have a question about maximum allowable rent. This is the maximum legal rent that a landlord may charge for a controlled rental unit. Or you might be asked, but I'm pretty sure you guys can get that answer right. All right. Lawful evictions. Bum, bum, bum. Rent control laws are specific on tenant evictions. A good cause eviction includes fall, uh, failing to pay the rent, violating an important condition of the rental agreement, like not blasting ACDC out your window at 10.38 p.m. or a.m., depending, you know, you've got to let your neighbors have um, the same rights that you do to live your best life. Um, causing a substantial nuisance, uh, ergo, um, I'm not saying I don't like ACDC, I'm just saying, like, I like it on uh, surround sound, uh, might be an issue. Okay, no fault eviction is a type of lawful eviction in which the tenant is not at fault. This would include things like the owner wants to occupy the apartment or go out um, of the rental housing business. And you'll find that people will be evicted as an, at a no fault eviction. And it's because the uh, people that are wanting to run the, are wanting to either flip the property or they need to do work on it. Um, a list of property uh, management duties and uh, duties of a property manager with employees can be viewed at the end of this unit. And just like that, ladies and gents, let's jump over to unit 15. All right, getting and keeping your real estate license. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not only gonna get your real estate license, you're gonna keep your real estate license, right? All right. Early real estate transactions were very simple. So back in the day, I'm sure your grandparents, your parents, you probably said this to your kids, I've said this to children and other people, things were a lot easier back in the day. As life became more complicated, the need emerged for some kind of regulation and practice. Um, um, to be implemented. Unethical people are taking advantage of the average citizen's lack of knowledge 
and have been found guilty of doing so. And because of that, we get to talk about Unit 15. Um, I want you to be able to identify the steps for getting started in California, recognize provisions of real estate law, identify the requirements for real estate licensing, specify actions that enforce the real estate law, recall violations of the real estate law. So let's jump over to page 295. The nation's first real estate license law was passed in California in 1917. As time went by, the law was codified and organized into two parts of the business and professions code. The real estate law, which we will be discussing in this unit is part two and it's entitled regulations of transaction. The real estate law, sometimes referred to as the license law. So you'll hear me talk about license law a lot. It's designed mainly for the protection of the public in real estate transactions where the licensee is involved. When you hear the term, Real estate law, it means the law that affects the licensing and conduct of real estate brokers and salespeople. And what does that mean? Just follow the letter of the law, y'all. That's all you gotta do. The real estate commissioner or the commissioner appointed by the governor, right? Determines administrative policy and enforces the provisions of the real estate law and the subdivided lands law, which we talked about two units ago to ensure that the public is protected when dealing with licensees and when purchasing subdivided real property and you're like subdivided real property so when a subdivision is being built or something along those lines anytime that property has been split uh but it doesn't have to be split for uh for them to be protecting the consumer it is the agent beware right it's no longer consumer beware so responsibilities of the real estate commissioner are screen and qualify applicants for license or the entities that work under the commissioner because that'd be a lot for one person to do issue restrict suspend or revoke real estate licenses examine complaints against licensees pursue formal action against licensees where appropriate monitor real property security transactions regulate prepaid rental listing services regulate specific aspects of the sale of subdivision and anything that is not here in the list they've got to make sure that we stay within the regulation of what is required of us as agents so there is um there's a couple different things out there for people that have been taken advantage of all fees charged and collected from the licensing of persons or from the regulation of transactions are placed in the real estate fund what does that mean there's a percentage of the money that we pay for our license and for our application fee that is put into a fund because there's a guarantee that uh, there's a percentage of us that are not going to follow the law and those monies are going to go um, to help people that have been taken advantage of the money is used by the commissioner to carry out the provisions of the real estate law part of the fee is collected in the real estate fund is set aside into two separate accounts for education and the other part is for recovery. The commissioner may credit up to 8% of the fees collected into a separate account called the education and research account. The education and research account pays for the advancement of real estate education in California universities, California state colleges, California community colleges, and this wonderful private institution that you guys are chilling with me in today, as well as those that are here that are at the college level. Um, meaning LECCD. Any of my students that once that, that are here are here, right? So the consumer recovery account, this is the part where if people do something squirrely whirly, the consumer recovery account is a separate account found through collection of up to 12% of licensing fees collected. So think about that. Currently, the amount paid uh, would be $50,000 per transaction with a possible total aggregate maximum of 250,000 per licensee. So this fund assures the payment of otherwise non-collectible judgments against licensees who have committed fraud, misrepresentation, deceit, or conversion of trust funds in a transaction. So when people come and uh, uh, take us to court for doing anything questionable or think we're part of that and we're not, because we're not, you guys are awesome agents, um, if somebody is found guilty and they don't have any money, there's this um, consumer recovery account that has, has monies set aside for concerns like this. So 12, think about it, eight and eight, 12 is 20. So 20% of all the monies that go in to um, pay for your licensing and your application and everything that you put in, 20% of that money is going, 8% is going to education and 12% of that money is going into account because somebody's going to break the law and get in trouble and whoever they have hurt um, is going to um, get refunded in some respects, if you want to call it a refund, from the commissioner um, for um, for the 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 fraud incurred or the the concerns incurred, the criminal activity incurred. 
All right. So real estate licensing, because real estate brokers and salespeople often act as an agency uh, or in an agency capacity, the state places strict requirements on the form of real estate licensing on those who wish to practice real estate. So types of real estate licenses. There's two. There's the brokers and there's the salesperson. And that's all there is. It's important for brokers and salespeople both to understand the obligations and the restrictions for having that license. A real estate broker is someone who holds a broker's license issued by the California Department of Real Estate. The license legally permits the broker to perform any acts for which a real estate license is required. In a real estate transaction, a broker is the agent of his, her, or their principal. I'm going to keep going. I know it's three. I'm not that worried about it. Um, so it is important that you guys understand that the broker is the agent. This is a question in the book exam and the state exam. Um, we're on slide 12. There's 65. It might take 30 minutes. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. If you guys want to jump ship, I know it's three because we usually jump uh, end at three, but let's take a tenner and um, yeah, let's take 10 minutes and then we'll just finish out unit 15 and then we're cooking with gas. How does that sound? Let me know if that sounds like a good idea, guys. Does that sound like a good idea? Oh, I got a chat. Okay, sweet. Perfect. We'll do it. 10 minutes it is. And your 10 minutes starts now. Uh, look, we got little misses like, um, what? Yeah. Yeah, this is only nap 15 of the day. How we doing? Huh? How we doing? You don't want to talk to me. I love you. Okay. We will be back in, in a tenor, guys. I hope that is okay.
All right, all right. We should be cooking with gas. But I wanted to, um, I looked up the, I still haven't heard back from Mitchell. I'm really waiting on Mitchell with regard to the VA stuff. But the 10 things while studying and then the 10 things, can, can 10 concepts you must know um, for passing the state exam. I want to make sure that I get that on our Google Drive because that was one of the things we talked about that we were going to do um, after the uh, Tuesday class. So I want to make sure I don't forget about that because um, tomorrow hitting the ground running, getting these walls sanded and stuff. So I want to make sure I cover everything. I'm like going through my notes on our breaks. Um, let's go back up to prep agent. Prep agent info here. And I know you guys can't see it, but let me, um, we will. No additional training. So I'm going to put this here. So prep agent, and then if you want, I actually do have a, a prep agent code for you guys for referrals. Um, prep agent information. So I'm going to put this in. Um, I'll share this in the chat under the prep agent information, but we'll have it set up under um, it's in the videos folder or in the live session stuff. That way you guys have it and then I'll try to get it in the PowerPoint as well, but I want to at least give it to you guys in a couple different places for right now just so you guys have it and then. Um, Okay, cool, cool, cool. And I can also add it somewhere else, but I want to make sure we got that. Now, when I get the VA stuff, I actually haven't heard from um, Marguerite either, but I know that Marguerite's, of course, oh my gosh, uh, Marguerite, because she just bought her house. Boba. I just hear her doing a bunch of crazy jumping and stuff. She's a, she's a, uh, one of those, uh, 20, she's got to do with like uh, 6,000 um, uh, steps a day to keep her, uh, um, to keep her tired and she's got like maybe 400 steps for the day. She didn't want to do the walk this morning. So, okay, let's jump into um, this last uh, uh, unit. Oops, coffee. Let's put the coffee down. Um, hmm. All right. So we should be talking. We're still talking about real estate brokers. A broker is an agent for his, her, or their principal. Yeah. So the broker is the agent period in final answer. What do you mean, Kathy? Okay, so let's say we bring in a client and, they're, and they want us to list their house. Well, we list their house and yes, we are the agent. We're doing all the work, but on, from a contractual standpoint, the, the, a, the agent is the broker. And that's a question you will get on the state exam. That's also a question you're going to get, um, not necessarily in this book exam, but one of the book exams will ask you that. Um, you aren't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to know that a broker associate is somebody who hangs their license under another brokerage, but part of the reason it's kind of good being a broker associate is you could actually be uh, running one of the branch offices. So let's say your broker, my broker is in San Diego. So, uh, or my colleague, she is my broker though, is in San Diego. That's the main office. I could, after getting my broker's license, could technically have a branch in Los Angeles because that's where I live and uh, be the branch manager because I'm a broker. I can't be the person that does it just as a licensed agent, but there's nothing wrong with being just a licensed agent. A licensed agent is the first step, right? Um, individual brokers. A real estate broker license allows a licensee to run a brokerage under his, her, or their own ownership or under a fictitious business name. What's a fictitious business name? I think you guys know what a doing the business, business as or a DBA, right? A licensed real estate broker may obtain a license um, with a, a business name or a fictitious business name. So there are, um, there are DBAs that are not available. There are ways that to get your fictitious name or doing business as um, name um, um, kicked out and they won't let you do business under it. So if it's misleading or constitutes false advertisement, if it implies a partnership or corporation, a partnership or a corporation does not exist or cannot exist because not everybody's a broker, 
um, including the name of the real estate, uh, uh, DBA is including the name of a real estate salesperson, um, a DBA in the name formally used by a licensed uh, licensee whose license has since been revoked. It's just, if, if someone's license has been revoked, you might not wanna have um, your brokerage in their name because um, that would constitute bad business um, practice, whether or not you have bad business practice or not. There's a really cool movie that came out. I think it was cool. I was a kid that came out. Um, Eddie Murphy was in it and um, he, he ran as a politician. He had the same last name as a politician that had died in that area. And he just used the, the posters from the previous um, politician because they had the same last name and he won because people are just used to seeing the name of that person on the marketing key, um, on, on the marketing ticket or on the, on the voting ticket. But the reality of the situation is um, if people know a name that sounds like honest or they see a name and it's an honest name. So as an example, um, if your last name is Smith, so it's like one of the most generic last names of all times, so that would be mine, um, my hyphenated name. Um, but if the Smiths in your town are known for being reputable, you might want it to be Smith real estate. You might want it to be something like that. So you can kind of see why um, the opposite would also be in play of a licensee that was revoked. You might not want it to say Smith, Smith brokerage or, or John Doe brokerage because John Doe just lost his license. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> it's a good last name. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, on the Vietnamese side of my family, um, everyone's last name is Nguyen, N-G-U-Y-E-N, and, or th the majority of the family, if you will, started that way. Um, and it's really funny though, because um, I used to joke about how, well, you know, Smith, it's like the, it's like the, the general, it's just like the average, whatever. And so my brother uh, was, but my brother started, he's like, oh, my last name is Nguyen, it's like Smith in Vietnamese. And I always thought that was kind of a funny way of looking at it. And then now my, my married name is Smith. And so it's kind of that, uh, oh, wow, I guess, you know, anyway, I don't know. I, I think of this kind of stuff. It's for marketing purposes. We'll talk about it in book two. So when it comes to partnerships, the California Department of Real Estate does not issue a partnership license. So you might be asked on the state exam, um, what kind of license the Department of Real Estate issues for partnerships. And the first answer is a salesperson. Second answer is, is brokers. Third is they don't issue sales, uh, they don't issue licenses for partnership. That would be the answer. So some of the questions might seem a little bit, and you'll hear me say they're tricky, but they just need to know that you know the law. A real estate business may be run as a partnership as long as every partner through whom the partnership acts is a licensed real estate broker. The broker is the key. Bubba, it's mine. It's mine. It's all mine. She, she loves coffee and peanut butter. And I just put a little bit of peanut butter on the edge of my coffee because it just sounded like a good idea because I was giving her peanut butter for our snack, um, snack time. And now she's like, well, that's my snack. Nope, that's my, that's my snack. Sorry, guys. Okay, let's get back into it. Corporate real estate licenses. A corporation may be licensed as a real estate broker as long as one officer of that corporation is qualified um, as a, a real estate broker, meaning that they have a real estate brokerage license. If that person leaves, however, thanks. If that person leaves, however, uh, and there is no broker's license to be had, that company is no longer a corporate real estate licensed business. So these are those uh, kind of hiccups or concerns that, that may come up and arise. So if somebody does leave, they're going to need to bring someone in that has a broker's license. They can continue to have that corporate real estate license business. Um, Salespeople may be employed by a corporate real estate brokerage, uh, just like any other place that has a broker. You don't have to, um, it could be a corporation, but again, there has to be a broker involved, a real estate broker involved. A real estate sales salesperson is someone who holds a sales license issued by the California Department of Real Estate. There's your term and definition. You're like, I think I know that one. Good. That's one. You guys are doing great. The salesperson must be employed by a real estate broker in order to perform any and all the work. True. We can't just be licensed agents. We have to be under a brokerage because the broker is the, is the umbrella license to do business. We can sell homes. We can do all of the things, but the reality of the situation is we have to be under a brokerage. And on top of that, you can't even go and be part of an association without having your license hung under a brokerage. Your license must be hung under the brokerage because the broker has to be um, a member of that association as well. 
Real estate sales associate is a term used to refer to employees of a broker. Very true. A sales a, a salesperson's license is required for people employed as salespeople under the supervision of a licensed broker. Okay. A team name is a professional identity or brand name. And you might find real estate offices out there that have a team name. This is the identity or uh, the brand name used by salespeople and at least one or more other licensees to provide real estate license services. And I've seen that happen a lot where people have a branded name and they're part of like Keller Williams, but they're the such and such team or something like that. It doesn't have to be that, that it, like generic. It's, it's more than that. Um, requirements for a team name. The team name is issued by two or more real estate licensees who work together to provide licensed real estate services or who represent themselves to the public as being a part of a team group association um, or the like. The team name includes the last name of at least one of the licensee members of the team, the group or the association in conjunction with the team associates group or team. The team name does not include any terms um, such as real estate broker, real estate brokerage, broker or brokerage, or any other term that would lead a member of the public to believe that the team is offering real estate brokerage services that imply or suggest the existence of the real estate entity dependent on responsible, uh, dependent on the, the responsible broker. Are we, or we just have peanut butter in our mouth? Sorry, I'm like, I don't know what she's licking. She's still doing the peanut butter thing. So let's look at the example that we have on 298. Team names that meet the requirements. Tamara Thompson, Janet Brown, and her brother, uh, Brandon Brown are members of the team. Names that could be used to meet this requirement would be Thompson Group, Thompson Team, Brown and Associates. Um, I've actually worked with brokerages that I didn't know it was their team name and I'm thinking about it now and they actually were, uh, they have failed <laughs> in it. So team names that do not meet the requirements. Um, Tamara's team, Brown Brokerage Group, because they use the word brokerage, right? Um, these would violate the law. And I'm thinking about it now going, oh, I think there's some people that need to, oh, thank you. Uh, there are some people that are going to need to edit. How am I, I'm a page ahead instead of a page behind, what? Okay, cool. Um, mortgage loan originating license and endorsement. So a lot of times we will talk about things and we did on Tuesday where it's like, okay, you're not loan originators and I'm talking to you guys like you are and I'm trying to dial it back because I'm used to that industry, right? Well. Since January 2011, a mortgage loan origination license endorsement must be obtained before a real estate licensee can solicit or originate a loan application. Kathy, what are you saying? You're going to have to apply for an MLO endorsement. And in order to apply for an MLO endorsement, you're actually going to have to go through the ML, uh, you're going to have to go through the um, NMLS um, prerequisites, just like you did with us and get a, a, go take that national license. And once you have that national license, you have your real estate license, right? We're cooking with gas on that side. Then you go take your NMLS prerequisites, take the state, the national exam, pass that. Then you've got to put in an ML, uh, you've got to put in an application for the MLO approval for endorsement. Let me check. This is 298. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. In order to receive the MLO endorsement license, agents must complete the MLS course prerequisites and pass the state exam. Oh, I have it right here at the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so restricted licensees or a restricted license, you're in trouble. Please don't do this. The commissioner will sometimes issue a restricted license because somebody did something wrong. The commissioner doesn't have time for this kind of madness because that's what it is. It's like, bro, you totally just did all those prerequisites. You're doing your continued education and you pass the state exam and you what? You know what I mean? A restricted license is a type of um, probationary license issued when a licensee has been, uh, when a license has been or had their license suspended, revoked or denied after a hearing. Note that it says after a hearing and that hearing usually happens before people that work for the commissioner with an explanation of what's going down. And I don't know if I said this in your class or if I've said it in one of the other, I know I've said it in multiple classes, but I knew a broker that was in the midst of losing his license. And because he was, um, it was right around the crash and he was working so hard to try to keep the, his, his head above the water and um, basically had an alcohol um, addiction. And you'll find in every job that there's something that, uh, that helps people move forward or encourages them to talk to people. It could be anything. It could be coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. 
it could be sugar. It could be all of the things. And I just remember he had to go before the commissioner and he was like, it's okay. So he showed up in Sacramento and then he couldn't handle the stress and went and decided to have a, a couple of drinks before he went in and found himself four hours later and had missed it and lost his license. But the reality of the situation is that in the hearing, they didn't have anything necessarily on him. They just knew that something possibly questionable was happening. They needed him to answer for it. And to this day, he looks back at, and, and now he, he does things that helps people get out of addiction, which is really cool. But um, these kind of situations, just because you go in into the hearing doesn't mean you're in trouble. It, they're wanting to hear what's going on. They're wanting you're there. It's, 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 it's like, it's like going to court. They need to understand what the situation is and it, are any laws being broken and so on and so forth. So when a license is required, so when would a license be required? So let's skip away from the drama of the real estate licensing and let's jump over to additional real estate licensing. When a license is required, a license is always required when it comes to any type of purchasing, leasing, renting of real estate. So obtaining a real estate license is a prerequisite for performing any type of real estate work. A real estate license is a prerequisite for performing. Um, and you need to know that that's the prerequisite for doing this job. You can't just go, hey, I'm going to go into real estate or I'm in real estate. I haven't finished and taken my state exam. I'm still going to show houses and do all the things. You can shadow another agent but you can't say that you're already a licensed agent. I always say that I'm bringing the future into the present and I'm calling you agent because I want you to have that mindset that that's where you are. But I hope that you understand that that is as far as this learning process is going. Um, you need to pass, and I know you'll pass the book exams. I, I don't have a, I'm not concerned about that side of it or the state exam. I know you guys can do it. Acts requiring a real estate license are all of the following, soliciting sellers, buyers, negotiating sales and leases, solicitating for tenants and rentals. Um, you know, the solicitation for tenants or rent, it, there might, that one's a little bit of a gray area, but just make sure you have a license, negotiating sales contracts, negotiating loans, negotiating a promissory note secured by real property, and then negotiating exchanges. You're, there's an exchange going on between, we're going to exchange this for that. Um, if you are an unlicensed person, unlicensed people may receive payment for, uh, sorry, no unlicensed person may receive payment for any act requiring a real estate license. The fine for paying a fee to an unqualified person is $100 for each offense. Now, in these kind of situations, the moment your name gets on the radar, if you will, with regard to doing things without a license, if you decide, oh, maybe I should go get my license because your information is already with the commissioner, the commissioner might go, hey, I'm glad you went and got your education and experience, but because of your previous unlicensed choices, um, we cannot um, allow you to have a license because you were handling things inappropriately prior to having one, which you should have known that you would have. You don't know, like chances are something like that would happen. Escrow holders require proof from a broker that their license status uh, of their license status prior to opening escrow. And you're like, do they really? And it's like, yeah, I never thought about it. I was reading some information last week and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it never occurred to me, but Julie did always go, hey guys, how you doing? You know, I see some information. Hey, did you know that, you know, she would talk about the broker. Did you know that so-and-so, do you know if so-and-so did their continued education, it looks like their license is going to be up soon. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a problem. We'll take care of it. It never occurred to me until after reading through some of the stuff and some of the assignments by some, some of the students from another, uh, from other classes that, um, that escrow is really kind of checking on this stuff, but they do, they want to make sure that everything's on the up and up. What are the exceptions to the license? You can review the real estate license exceptions all in this unit um, after page 298, because that is something I want you to do on your own. Um, I don't think there are any exceptions. So I don't wanna review exceptions. Uh, you have to have a license, final answer, you have to. Um, steps in getting a real estate license. Before the, applicants, uh, the applicant for a real estate salesperson or broker license may be obtained, he, she, or they must hang out with Kathy on any given seven to eight days a month and take their prerequisite courses. After completing the educational requirements and passing the examination, because that's the next step, right, everybody? Additional documentation is necessary to apply for the license. And you're like, wait a minute, what else would we need? Well, there are some things that you need. You need to be, um, before applying for your broker or your sales license, a prospective licensee must meet certain eligibility requirements. You've gotta be at least 18 
or emancipated, and that in itself is its own paperwork and the commissioner will ask for it, provide a social security or a tax ID number, be honest and truthful, just in case you weren't aware you had to do that up to this point, complete real estate courses, which you're doing now, apply for the and pass the state exam, which I know you guys are gonna do. And then once you pass the exam, then you can apply for the license or you can apply for the examination and the license in one fell swoop. It doesn't have to be two different um, parts. Um, when it comes to the salesperson, you must submit proof of those three approved real estate courses. We're doing principles, right? The next book is practice. And then the last one is an elective course. We're actually going to do um, legal aspects because that legal aspects court course covers a multitude of things. And your state exam is going to be on all of the things. So I think that that elective course is the best course of action for education. An applicant um, for an original real estate um, license must meet specific educational experience standards. If it's a broker, there's eight approved real estate courses that they have to take. In addition, a broker candidate must also have two years of full-time licensed real estate experience within the past five years or something that's the equivalent. What would the equivalent be, Kathy? Well, it could be teaching um, because I haven't sold a lot of homes in the last five years, but I've been teaching at three different schools. You could see where um, that would be considered the equivalent. And there could be other equivalencies as well. What would the other equivalent be? Well, you might have uh, I've just graduated with a four-year degree in finance or four-year degree in real estate. That's another equivalent. And there's additional equivalents you can find on the Department of Real Estate website when you fill out the application. So when it comes to required education, you must submit evidence in the form of transcripts or certificates that you have completed the statutory license courses. And that's what you guys are doing right now. Unless the California Real Estate Commissioner has granted prior approval, no private vocational real estate school outside California may grant credit for the required pre-licensed courses. But we are in one of those schools and we actually have the approval. The required number of hours for a statutory course is 45 hours, and you'll see that on the information that you have been um, reviewing on your student portal or your student platform, is that these courses are 45 hours each. The purpose of the real estate license examination is to make sure consumers are protected. That could be a question on the state exam as well as the book exam, and that is the answer. It's all about protecting the consumer. It has nothing to do with protecting us as licensed agents. When applying for the examination, an application and fee schedule for both the sale and the broker's license examination can be obtained on the Department of Real Estate website. And we'll go over that in book three. And I, you're like, Kathy, what's book three? I'm just saying we're in the first, we're at the end of the first book. For those of you that are doing um, principal, for those of you that are in practice, you're at the end of the second book. And for those of you in legal aspects, you're in the final book. And in your live session classes specifically, we will uh, go over that information, okay? When applying for the license prior to passing the state exam, you, must, you will need to submit one set of, clar uh, of classifiable print uh, fingerprints. So you're going to do um, a live scan and you're going to fill out the form with the Department of Real Estate and take that into the live scan at the, your local police department or sheriff's department or whomever is doing the live scan. And that document that they will um, that they're going to do your digital fingerprints, and then that information is going to be sent off to the DOJ, Department of Justice, and sometimes the FBI and both. And that information is uh, they're going to the police officer that does your fingerprints. Usually, it's the police office that does live scans. You can have there's other places too, right around schools that that do live scans as well because you have to get your fingerprints for schools as well. They'll fill out the information and they'll put a note it, but they'll note it. But I will tell you this, unless um, the live scan, uh, the form, unless it details uh, that particular company, it has to be a company that does live scan fingerprinting. It can't just be anybody under the, the sun that does fingerprinting. It has to be a specific program. That form that the police officer is going to fill out and hand back to you needs to be printed or scanned, I should say, and then uploaded and saved as a PDF and then uploaded to the Department of Real Estate website. The Department of Real Estate website will only take PDFs. And if you're like, no, I see on their information, they take other things. I've had more students come back and say that there have uh, recently, uh, that, that they have had issues with the upload and the Department of Real Estate's reaching out to them directly saying, there's something wrong with this upload. Can you please send it to me through an email as a PDF only? So I'm gonna tell you, it's gotta be PDF, final answer, please do PDFs only. Fingerprint requirements. An applicant for an original real estate license must submit one set of classified fingerprints. And how do you do that? It's got to go through live scan. 
it's not something where you can just like send in your fingerprints on a piece of paper to the Department of Real Estate. It's got to go through that process. When it comes to social security or tax identification requirements, um, the legislation finds that it is in the best interest of the state of California to allow people who are not lawfully present in the United States to obtain a real estate license in California. Therefore, the California Department of Real Estate cannot deny licensure or giving someone a license um, based on his, her, or their citizen status or immigration status. So it's either your social security number or it's a tax ID number or some type of requirement that can be used in that position. So you'll see on the application, it will say SSI or tax ID number. If you are an out-of-state applicant, California has no, recipro no reciprocity with any other state to allow a waiver of any of the requirements to obtain a license. So if you have a license in Tennessee, there's no re reciprocity. You can't just go, hey, I'm licensed in Tennessee. And California's like, congratulations, that's cool. Please go take those three courses here in the state of California and let us know how that goes. And then take the state exam. You can't. And in the same respect, we, I don't know about Tennessee, but there are states in the United States that there is reciprocity with California because we're so stringent on our rules and regulations. Um, you don't have to live here. Um, it's not closing time. You don't have to go, but you don't have to live here to uh, in California to get a license, but you definitely have to be here to take the state exam. When it comes to renewing the real estate license in general, both types of licenses may be renewed by submitting the appropriate fee and application along with the evidence of your 45 hours of continued education, but it has to be with an approved uh, Department of Real Estate um, educational company or um, a continued education place. There aren't a lot of state colleges or community colleges that have that continued education as of yet, but I'm hearing in the wind that that's going to happen. Um, but for the purposes of this class, uh, if you are if you want to go to Al, uh, Calibri or Allied Schools or um, Real Estate Express or Rockwell or um, any of them, um, do it. You've already gone the, through it from this point forward. You're going to be comfortable doing that independent study experience. Any anyone that's done independent study um, online education in any in any form can easily do continued education in real estate. You have my Google voice number. You have my email as well. Reach out to me and go, who should I go with? Well, these are the companies that are probably beneficial. Non-renewal or suspension. Well, did you know that if you are delinquent with your child support and or your property, not your property taxes, your income taxes, you can have your license suspended or revoked. If there are delinquent child support payments, a four-year license will not be renewed or issued. The California Department of Child Support Services prepares a list of people called obligers who owe child support payments. A child support obliger may be issued a 150-day uh, temporary license, and during that time, that person must show the Department of Real Estate proof that the delin delinquency is cleared up or that there have, they have been removed from the list. And I know people, I've worked with people that um, have child support claims had come against them and they actually were just in a really messy divorce and they actually did pay. So these are kind of the kind of situations and concerns that are a problem. Oh my gosh, I'm not even worried. Have a great day. For those of you who've got to go, I'm just going to keep going till we get to the end of the chapter. We're recording this, baby. We got this going. We're good. I totally appreciate you guys. Not a worry. Um, so non-renewal or suspension. What it, so we talked about child support. Now let's talk about delinquent tax list. The State Board of Equalization or the BOE. Do you need to know what the BOE is? Nope. Yeah, you do. You need to know it because you need to pay it. But the Franchise Tax Board, the FTB, and the State Board of Equalization, the BOE, provide California Department of Real Estate, the DRE, with certified tax lists that list the names of the top 500 tax debtors who owe $100,000 or more delinquent taxes. Okay, so as a side note, let's talk about personal stuff like Kathy owing taxes. Um, I remember I got a, a letter in the mail saying that I owed like, I don't know, it was 85 or $87,000 in back taxes. And I was like, oh, this isn't right. Well, the thing is I was taking care of my parents and both parents are on chemo and I'm going to the ER every other night. I'm going to chemo. Um, you know, if, if it's not every other day, it's like um, radiation, doctor's appointments, general doctor, general practitioner, oncologist. Like I, I, my parents always did things together. And this is one of those things I really was hoping they wouldn't do together. And yet here we are. And I remember getting this tax debt and going, I don't understand. And so then I read in there that it said, 
based on the income level of real estate agents, uh, the income level was like eighty-seven thousand or $78,000 a year. And based on that, and how much you should be have been making over the course of X, Y, and Z, we see that not only are do you owe us 87, thought it was like it was under 100,000, but you owe us this much money because the average salesperson is making this much. Hence, you are lying and like hiding that you're making this money. And I'm like, if I only had time to sleep, how did I make this money? So you've got to be really careful with delinquent tax concerns. And so for those of you that are like, but what if I don't make anything that year? All you've got to do is note that you didn't make any, you didn't sell any properties. And you're like, oh, it'll be fine. We'll figure it out. No, 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 no. Do me a huge favor. As a person, it took me 10 years to fix that tax debt. It took me 10 years of personally fighting. I paid people to help me. And all they did was take the money and there was no follow through. It's like, well, I tried. It was like, man, I don't have a lot of, you know, I don't have a lot of thousands. I don't have another $5,000. I have another $4,000 to get help. And I remember um, one of my brothers that does tax, my brother that helps people this and that, and da, 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 he's like, Kathy, he's like, well, why don't you just fill out any of the, any of the forms they say they're missing, any of the tax returns they say that are missing, go watch Google. I mean, go watch YouTube. So I filled them out and I put a cover letter saying I, to the best of my recollection and my receipts, I show that this is how much I made that year. And I actually submitted uh, tax returns for each of those years. Um, and when it was all said and done, like they, at that point, they had started um, pulling money out of my uh, payroll and um, then they returned all of it. And, um, and for that year, they, they literally had pulled over $10,000 out of my income and, and it was put back into my account. It was like Christmas in August. So I was like, hallelujah. So when I talk to you guys about real life experiences, I don't want it to seem like, oh, well, this is just like theory. This is reality. Oh my gosh, totally. I totally get it if you guys got to go. So we need to talk about delinquent taxes. We need to make sure we stay on top of our taxes. We need to make sure that when we give a gift to our clients of like part of our commission to help them close on a sale or something that we have all of that documented evidence. So then when we go into our tax preparer, our tax preparer is like, okay, how much did you give out this year? You can only give out XYZ percentage of your income for yada, yada. And you're going to be able to break down that information. And again, when, when I'm trying to give you guys every opportunity for success in this industry, and I'm trying to not give you the type of experience that I had as an agent. It was like, oh, don't worry about your taxes. If you owe it, they'll tell you. Like, that's not the way of handling things. If my parents only knew some of the stuff I thought was reality. Um, so anyway, all that's being said, there's a list for people that owe taxes. There's a list for people that owe child support. And there's a list for other things as well. So we've got to make sure that we just stay on top of it. You can pay quarterly. You can pay annually. Talk to your tax preparer on the best way to handle your, um, your, your um, self-employed income. So when it comes to e-licensing transactions, we're not going to talk about this because e-licensing is associated with book three. And what I mean by that is you can go on the dre.ca.gov website and go through that whole entire process of putting your information in your name, your date of birth, your social security, some other information and upload all three of your certificates. But I can talk to you about this in theory versus reality, which would be the end of your third class. And we can walk through the e-licensing transaction together there. You can do everything online with the Department of Real Estate. Um, late renewals, this is the second time, if not the third time, it's been presented in this book that you have a two-year grace period. That's when your license is suspended. You had four years to get your continued education done, right? Then you have an additional two years for you to go, should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I do this? Should I not do this? And that's during that time. Uh, continuing education is important. Each uh, time brokers and salespeople renew their licenses, which would be every four years, they must present evidence of completing that required information to the Department of Real Estate and up upload those certificates, just like you're going to do for your application process with us. Um, meaning we'll walk through it together. That initial renewal is that is the most important though. Real estate brokers and salespeople renewing an original license for the first time must complete 45 clock hours of department approved um, uh, continued education or CE courses. What's the difference between that and, um, and um, the ones before? Well, these, my neighbor, my neighbor's honking. 
The required courses are three hours each, but it needs to be agency, ethics, agency, how you run your agency, how you are an agent, ethics, are you doing things on the fly, fair housing, discrimination, right? Risk management, is this a good idea to work with these people? And trust fund handling. And you're like, yeah, but maybe my broker's not gonna have a trust fund account either. Well, if they're, if the continued education is on agency, ethics, fair housing, risk management, and trust fund handling, chances are the reason they're asking for you to review those informations is, is that those are the areas that are still be, being presented as issues with, with complaints with the Department of Real Estate or going before a court of law because someone has, has treated someone inappropriately. In addition, 30 more um, uh, continued ed education hours must be completed of which 18 hours must be in consumer protection categories. So all I'm telling you is we need to make sure that the client's taken care of, our clients are taken care of, and that we stay within the letter of the law. We take care of our fiduciary duty to our clients, as well as follow the laws written not only by the commissioner with the Department of Real Estate, uh, the commissioner of the Department of Real Estate of California, as well as we need to stay within the ethics of the National Association of Realtors, California Association of Realtors, our local association, and make sure that our broker understands everything that's going on with regard to our clients. Because technically, the broker is what? The agent for all of the clients. They The buck stops with the broker. Uh, the license law is only effective if it can be enforced. And I'm going to tell you right now, the commissioner can enforce it. The commissioner enforces the provisions of the real estate law and has the power to restrict, suspend, or revoke. And how do they have those rights? Well, they've been given their position by the governor and the governor's like, this is the person for the job. If sufficient evidence of a violation is obtained, an order to desist and refrain is issued or a complaint is brought and the parties are prosecuted in a court of competent jurisdiction. So when I talked to you guys about a broker needing to meet with the commissioner, it was in regards to a deceased or a refrain. It's okay, that's just the neighbor, they're playing lots of music, you're okay. So advocacy programs, a complaint that involves simple disputes or minor issues between consumers and licensees is usually handled by the advocacy program. And what will happen is it actually goes through the advocacy program first. And if they find that there's a problem, then it gets to the bigger guys. But it's still something that needs to be dealt with. So types of cases handled by the advocacy program are, are not limited to the following, but here are some. Consumers who needed copies of their documents and had been unable to secure a response, which does not ever happen in, in your offices or mine. It just happened to happen in, I guess, somebody's that the copy machine wasn't working or something. I don't know. Consumers who needed assistance in contacting their agent or broker because their agent or broker weren't taking calls from them anymore. Consumers who needed information about uh, that they had been um, able to be obtain from their agent from escrow lender inspectors. So basically, the first three are consumers um, that uh, can't get a hold of their broker and don't have any way of finding out what they signed or any of those other things. And we've talked about that over the course of this class, that when you have a client sign something, you always give them a copy of what they're signing. And on top of that, if you do it digitally, you can send it through um, 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 DocuSign, and then that digital copy is there. So when the client goes, hey... I don't think I have a copy of any of that stuff. You can go, it's right here. Or if you have a client that goes, I see that you put that in like this folder thing that's on my computer. I don't know how that works. Then you just hit print and you drive over and hand it to them at their, at their house or have it deliver confirmation delivery so that they really, really have it. Um, if a consumer is trying to cancel a transaction and a broker's like sucks to be you, you can't. Or a consumer is trying to cancel because a broker's doing something 100% inappropriate. Consumers who want to know where their earnest money is, ooh, earnest money deposits always come from the buyer. And if the buyer wants to know where their money is, there's a problem. Consumers who were asked to sign documents or do something they did not understand or did not feel is appropriate. Consumers having homeowner association issues. Mm. Wow the DRE still has jurisdiction over a subdivider and they do, the commissioner has a jurisdiction over HOAs. Licensees questioning whether offers have been presented to sellers or lenders um, with, with regard to real estate transactions. Um, man, that's a tough one. Um, and that's just like a few of them, but I'm reading them probably with a furrowed brow for a few reasons because I'm, 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 I'm tired of reading, but also 
when a client feels like they're not being communicated with and they contact the Department of Real Estate, it goes to the first level. And then that level is like, okay, can you guys confirm that you've been communicating with this client? And it's like, yeah, I have notes here. You open the file. They will come into your office. We have been audited before. Not this brokerage, but one of my previous ones. So when it comes, but they usually, if there's smoke, there's fire, but we, we were good. We're cooking. We're cooking with gas, but not in a bad way. It was, everything was fine. So citations and fines. The commissioner can issue citations and fines to both licensees and unlicensed persons for minor violations of real estate law. And the violations, you don't ever want your name on any of it. The citation describes the basis of the complaint and contains an order to correct the violation and a reasonable time period in which that should be corrected. As in like right now, today, stop trying to sell properties without a real estate license. It isn't rocket science, but that's as, that's what it means by reasonable time. The commissioner may issue an administrative fine not to exceed $2,500 per citation. And part of the reason they say per citation is they might find that someone who was an unlicensed agent has been doing this for a while. So it's, and they have like 15 or 16 items. Let's say 15, 15 times 2,500. You guys probably know it off the top of your head. 15 times 2,500, 15 times 2,500 would be $37,500. So you could kind of understand why they're like, hey, we'll just hit you with the 2,500 per citation and see how far this goes. Former hearing, formal hearing process. The commissioner must follow the established legal procedures found in the Administrative Procedures Act to dispute licensees under the formal hearing process. Some violations may result in civil injunction. Some of them are criminal pr prosecution or substantial fines. Back when the crash happened, people were taken to jail. The FBI went into a title escrow and title office, boxed all of the files up and took them out and chained that office up. That happened in Morgan Hill, California with the title and escrow office that was connected to in Tarot Real Estate off of Main Street. I, I remember, I wasn't there, but I saw the chains. I'm like, what the heck happened? Um, investigations and accusations. Usually an investigation of the actions of a licensee is based upon receipt of a veri verified written complaint from someone who believes a licensee while acting as an agent has wronged them. Most people feel like they've been wronged and they will contact the Department of Real Estate and the Department of Real Estate reviews every single action that walks in the door. A formal hearing is held according to that Administrative Procedures Act. The accu accusation or statement of issue is served upon the affected licensee. In the hearing, the commissioner is the complainant and brings the charges against the licensee. The licensee, known as the respondent, may appear with or without an attorney. So when I talked to you about the broker that I knew that like was going to appear without an attorney, he was fine with that. The commissioner's counsel presents the case to an administrative law judge who issues a proposed decision based upon the findings. And they can say, hey, we know that this broker is uh, doing some questionable practices, but based on what this broker was sharing with me, there he was so anxious about going in that the, the need to, to drown his tears was far greater than the, than going in and, and finding that they could find something against me he was afraid he was going to lose everything he lost everything and his broker's license because he didn't have the nerve to go in and and you can see emotionally from a human perspective that that is people don't want to be accused of stuff even if they aren't doing it they and you're like well if he wasn't guilty why didn't he just go in i don't know i i don't have the answer to that but it is a good idea to go in and try to figure those things out but i've worked for really good brokers that have sat down and said kathy if you have nothing to hide, let them audit you. If you have nothing to hide, let them question you. And sure enough, and I mean, I'm telling you, I remember being questioned by uh, this one agent and he was just like, I know you're stealing. I'm like, from who? Like, please, you know, like the, the sky was falling in all aspects of my life. I'm like, bro, if I could just jump, I didn't say it out loud, but screaming at the top of my brain, if I could just take all this money you think I've stolen and go live in the Caribbean, I would do it. Like my life right now is so, I'm struggling so hard. But the reality of the situation is there was nothing to be found. And so when I talked to my broker, I'm like, dude, they treated me like a, I was a criminal. He's like, they're just, they're just, they're just um, shaking to see if anything, shaking, trying to shake you to see if anything will fall out. I'm like, I just, I like, there's no, you can't get blood out of a turnip, bro. And so he was like, don't worry about it. We'll be, it'll be fine. And, and having a good broker that walks through that process with you, it never even occurred to me that his license was under scrutiny as well. But the reality of the situation is he saw that it was so emotionally hard on me that he didn't bring that up. 
And later on, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He's like, oh, he's like, we didn't have anything to worry about. He's like, that's going to happen. There are people out there that are breaking the law. Um, Section 10, 175 violation when acting as an agent in real estate transaction, the commissioner may upon his or their own motion and shall upon the verified complaint in writing of any person investigating the action of any person engaged in the business or act in the capacity of a real estate licensee written um, so he, she, or they may temporarily suspend or permanently. So basically like if anything's being, ha if anything's happening in a questionable fashion, they're going to suspend or revoke your license. Um, if you've done any type of misrepresentation, that would be 10-176-A, 10-176-B is false promises. Did you lie through your teeth to get that deal closed? Um, uh, section 10-176-C, uh, continued misrepresentation, i.e., you misrepresented one guy and was like, I got away with it here. Let's misrepresent all these other, be the representative for that person, but, but misrepresent them in a manner that would financially um, take care of us and then not take care of our client. Section D, dual agency. It's got to be told. Licensee did not inform all principals that he, she, or they was acting as the agent for both the buyer and the seller. And you and I both know that dual agency is right in the agency uh, disclosure that you guys, and if you didn't know that, it's right in that first disclosure that you sign with your clients and they are, excuse me, well aware of it. So this is one of those situations where I don't want you to get put in a position. You know what I mean? Section E is co-mingling. Don't take your client's money, put it in your account. Final answer. Don't be a Girardi or a, or a um, Mal, or a, don't, I can't say that name. Uh, Murda, don't do the Murda or the Girardis. Don't follow in their footsteps with regard to financial fraud. Um, section F, definite termination date. Licensees failed to specify the termination date on all exclusive listings relating to transactions for which a real estate license is required. What that means is any type of listing that you have with your client has to have a deadline. Like how long do you want to be in the process of trying to sell your house? And a client might go, I don't know, 90 days. You're like, cool. We'll put that. We'll put 90 days from today as in yada, yada. And we'll come back and revisit. We might do a new listing in 90 days and re put this property back up on the market. Section G secret profit. You can't be getting money under the table. Listing option licensees with both a listing uh, listing and an option to buy on a property fail to inform the principal of the amount of the profit. And you're like, what does that mean? Well, let's say that Sonia is selling her house and Sonia is selling her house at, and uh, at, or she wants me to sell her house. Let me start over again. She wants me to sell her house and I have the option to buy that property. I need to note not only the commission I'm going to get from selling the house but I also need to, uh, any and all other monies that, that are associated with that need to be written down. And she needs to sign off on that, on that understanding that as the agent with the option to buy that home, how much money I will make of, of, of profit from commissions and any other things with regard to that process. And that's, you can see why someone might make a mistake on that one because they don't think about it. To be honest, they don't think about it. Uh, any type of dishonest dealing. I don't think we need to break that one down any, for, any further. Signatures of prospective purchasers. Licensees failed to obtain the written authorization to sell a home from a business owner before securing the signature of the prospective purchaser. This, that stuff, you can't make it up. It happens. Failing to dispute, um, disperse mortgage funds. What does that mean? Well, you can't hold on to the client's money. Licensee Fail to dis disperse funds to in accordance with the commitment to make a mortgage loan that is accepted by the applicant. And you're like, how does that work? So back before you had to have your NMLS license, we could we were a private mortgage institution, right? And they're still out there. And let's say the client needs half a million dollars to buy the house, and we do the loan, and we have the money sitting in that in our in that trust fund for the client, and we don't give them the half a million dollars, but it's theirs. But it's there. It, it's theirs, but it's liquid and it's in that account. So we're failing to disperse it. We're failing it to failing to send it to escrow. That's a big deal. Delaying the close of a mortgage loan. You can't delay it. Licensees intentionally delaying a close of a mortgage loan for the sole purpose of increasing interest. Cost fees and charges against the borrower is a big end to the O. Violating other laws. And you're like, well, what would those be? Anything that has not been put into law at this point in time. Real estate transfer disclosure statement violations. If the real estate transfer disclosure statement 
is not signed, is not filled out properly, has not been itemized and detailed, you could be going, uh, you could be in trouble. Um, and then the violation when not necessary acting as an agent. So a commissioner may suspend or revoke the license of a real estate licensee, delay the renewal of a licensee, um, or may deny the issuance of a license to an applicant who has done any of the following or may suspend or revoke a license of a corporation, delay the renewal, and so on and so forth. If an officer, director, or person owning or controlling 10% of the, the corporation stock has done any of the following, but not limited to page 302, obtaining a license by fraud. How do you do that? Well, that was a big thing in the 90s. Um, We'll talk about that at a later date, but basically people were paying other people to go take the license for them. And uh, and the Department of Real Estate is at fault because they didn't look at the person and the ID close enough. They do now. Um, if you've had any type of conviction in any other way in the state of California, false designation, licensees misrepresenting or made false statements about their education, their special education, their credentials or professional designation, Violations of other types of sections. So you're like, what sections would those be? All of them. Licensees willfully violated any of the other sections of the real estate law, the regulations of the commissioner, and the subdivision law. Um, misuse of trade name, con conduct warranty denial of license, negligence or incompetence, uh, failure to supervise salespeople. The broker can't just not do his job, their job. Uh, misuse of government employment. Licensees misuse government employment to gain access to records in a manner that violates the con confidentiality nature of the records. How is that going to happen? Misuse of government employment. I, I've got to tell you right now, unless you are working for the IRS as your side hustle, I don't know how you're going to get that government information, but it could be an issue. Um, dishonest dealings across the board. Final answer. Dis restricted license violations. If your license is restricted and then you go and do something stupid by Having someone notice it's not only restricted, but you're not following within the restricted guidelines, you don't need to have a license. Inducement of panic selling. If they can prove that you did some blockbusting or panel, panic peddling, violation of franchise investment law, violation of corporation code, um, failure to disclose conflict of interest, violation of corporate securities law, violation of foreclosure law, suspend a license obtained by fraud. Mobile home sales violation. That one might be a little easier to get in trouble on. If you don't know what you're doing, don't go in that area or expertise without having the um, training. Misrepresent price opinions. Referral of customer for compensation could be an issue. You can't refer clients and expect compensation. And that in and of itself, I'm just gonna say is the answer. And I don't wanna go into the gray area of that stuff, but as licensed agents, there is some type of commission or a kickback or something. But again, I just said kickback and commission. You know what I mean? It's terminology driven. Uh, mobile home sales violation, uh, misrepresent opinions. Did I just do those ones? Oh, we got two of the same page, sweet. Uh, fraud in a civil action. If you've done anything and you've got to go to court because you've done, you got, you've broken the law. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the start because now we go on to other violations, meaning uh, the things that have not been specifically covered so far, employing or paying an unlicensed person to work with you. And you can do that, but again, it's terminology driven. False advertisement, lying about a property, the name of the broker on, advertise, on advertisements offering to help a person file an application to purchase or lease a govern, government owned land must include the name of the broker and he, she, or theirs license within, with regard to California real estate brokerage. So name of broker has to be on all advertisements and their license number. Disclosure of license status in advertising, advertisement placed in newspapers and all of the other things requires a real estate license to be included in the designated closing. Um, and uh, the person actually has to have a real estate license. They, it can't be suspended. Selling price disclosure because it wasn't disclosed. Recording the trust deed has to be <laughs> recorded. Notification of escrow activities. Delivery of an agreement, meaning that their documentation for that contract, right? Um, document retention. They've got to keep for three years, right? A broker must retain the following documents for three years from the date of the closing of a file or the transaction not closing 
from the date that the listing was taken. Monetary penalty in lieu of suspension. Broker must report a discharge of salespeople for violation. Uh, and what that means, we're going to read this one. When any real estate salesperson is discharged by his her, or their employer for a violation of any of the provisions of the real estate law, a certified written statement of the facts with reference with therein shall be filed forthwith with the commissioner. The Basically, your broker is going to have to go, um, y'all, we kicked Kathy out because she's crazy. And these are the proof. Well, not just because I'm crazy. That it would have to be that I like violated something and then they have to contact by law. They have to. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I totally get you guys got to go. We only have one slide left. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, reinstatement examination as a condition to the reinstatement of a revoked or suspended license, the commissioner may require the applicant to take and pass a qualifying examination, which would be regarding uh, questions about ethics and violations of certain um acts and things so that 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 say that qualifying examination is probably going to be so really heavy on the ethics side of things and then violations um are misdemeanors any person including officers directors agents or employees of corporations who willfully violate or knowingly participate in the violation of this division shall be guilty of a misdemeanor punishable by a fine not exceeding $10,000, imprisonment in the county jail not exceeding six months, or a fine and imprisonment. And ladies and gentlemen of the, of the jury, thank you for staying. Uh, do not go fast. Do not go slow. Just know that you got to go. No, you don't have to go. So how do we feel? That's all 15 units of the, part of the principal's book. <laughs> okay, good. How do you feel on this side of it though? Oh my gosh, of course. I don't, I don't mind doing you guys. It's e so why don't we talk about this? I want you guys to take this evening. Um, if you want to go, let me see. Um, I, I have a lot of songs in my head, so I really, I really, uh, um, I really apologize. So what I need you guys to do is go into the real estate folder. I want you to go into the principles folder. Okay and see if I can do it. I've got a lot of stuff open. The book, the PDF book has its own folder now, review material for principles. And then we have unit outlines, which is what we just went through. You have the PDF versions of the unit reviews. You have the PowerPoint version of those unit reviews that I did. I made sure that we updated that information and I hope it's locked in. Please Jesus, take the wheel, right? Quizzes, new and not completed. Um, uh, meaning that the, I haven't finished. I only have the first two units. We have Quizlets by Elisa. And thank God one of the students in your class put in a comment because it looks like the link to the first one was missing or had been edited. So I put back in that information. Um, you have all of this at your fingertips. You have the PDF. Oh my gosh, of course. Uh, I'm trying, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want you to feel on your own, okay? You have this information at your fingertips. You've got the PDF of the book. What? That's not it. That's PDF version of the unit. So what I did was I changed it out. So um, for those of you, you do not have to have power um, Adobe. You can literally go unit one. Unit. Oh, nope. Don't do it that way either. You can do unit one definitions, an economic system in which most of the economy's resources are privately owned. What would that be? Well, that would be capitalism, e-capitalism and so on and so forth. So you can actually run through them a little bit more easily this way if you want to. So you've got you've got uh, unit one, you've got unit two, you should have unit three, fingers crossed, unit four, and so on and so forth. You guys have this information. Is this normal? No, of course it's not normal. Nothing in my classes is normal. But I want you to feel encouraged about taking the exam. The information's at your fingertips. Use your PDF version. And it's not control F, it's command F on Mac. It's control F or Windows F on um, like a PC or on uh, an HP or something like that. But take the day to just breathe. You're going to pass the open book exam. You're going to be fine. This, this is the first hurdle. And once you jump over this one, you just need an ounce of success getting through the first principles book. And then you're going to be like, oh, okay, I know what Kathy wants from now on. I know what, what's needed in these classes from now on, okay? But you've got it. Any questions or concerns? 
I have a question. I yeah. know that you've said this like a million times by now, but um, it was the, so the the reviews in the book, that's what we should focus on more this time. And then for, for the next um, book exams, we should focus more on the, on the quizzes on, on the website. Is that it? Or is it the other way around? No, you're right. It's the unit okay. reviews, but I've had two students. So we had um, uh, um, Farzana is in the class with us. Farzana already took the exam and said that, and I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, and said that it was a little bit of the, the behind, it was a little, this, this particular 2023, that a little bit of the unit reviews at the end of, of, of each of the reviews, and then a little bit of it was the online quizzes. So part, partially the book, partially um, the online quizzes. So um, uh, if, if Farzana, not that you have to jump in and, and, and chat a lot, but do you want to share with everyone what, what it was like? Because that means you took it. Sure. So uh, yes, uh, uh, most of the pre-licensed quizzes, so uh, they go chapter wise and you can take each, uh, each chapter, you can take multiple quizzes. So I think around 70 to 80% of those quizzes was in the exam. So it was literally verbatim. So you, the same question you could, I mean, I could remember the questions and it was the same thing in the exam. Oh. Uh, even the choices were the same. So doing uh, those pre-licensed quizzes that uh, really helps uh, just prepare for the exam. So we have a question. It says, when you say online quizzes, do you mean the quizlets? Uh, no, it's the pre-licensed quizzes uh, that are on in my courses. Uh, you have the pre-licensed quizzes uh, section. So it go, you can, uh, you have three, you have the pra principles, practices, and legal aspects. Uh, yes, on Colibri's website. So you just go there, you go to pr principles, and it goes through each chapter. Okay. Okay. All right. How's everyone feeling? Farzana, thank you. What a blessing. I appreciate it. Okay, good. I want you to feel better. It, like the unknown is the worst part of it. Oh my gosh, you totally have a shot. Like maybe I have a shot. You got a shot. Especially when I got the message I got from the, the person from not to throw Mindy under the bus, but I'm going to throw her under the bus. I'll wear a cup of coffee. I'm fine with it. She literally messaged me um, in the middle of our classes and was like, I don't even know how to use computers. How am I gonna how am I gonna get through this? And she took it yesterday and she's the one that was like, I passed with 90. What? And I was like, huh. I was so excited for her because I was a little bit more nervous with the fact that because she doesn't have any background with or doesn't have as much background with computers, that she might go into the quiz and kick herself out or something. And I was like, oh no, you know, I was a little nervous for her. That's why she got on the phone with customer service and said, walk me through this process. Um, okay, we're good. Oh, wait, okay. Okay, after taking time, and my, I feel so much better. Good, I'm glad. The thing is, like, I I can tell you it's gonna be okay, but that's like your mom. You're that's like your mom going, "You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Just go. You'll have a good time." And you're like, "You don't know. I'm gonna have a good time." I feel kind of like the mom, you know, like the mom that nobody. You should. You're like, you're right, mom. I should listen to you. That kind of thing. Uh, okay, obviously, all your. Oh, oh my gosh. Hey, I really am here. And if you guys want to do this again. We'll stu still do the live um, things at night once a week, just so we can kind of like hit the ground running for specific things. But if you guys want to do um, a day thing after this, we can do that as well. Like we'll, we'll keep, but I, I have a very strong suspicion that after you take this one, you're going to be like, we're good, Kathy. We don't need to do that, but we'll just, let's get to the end of the next book and see how you guys are feeling. Okay. I am a tech. Oh, Kathy, you, yeah. Um Kathy, sorry. Um, you did put um in the Google Drive this morning. That was the link that you put in the chat this morning as far as the PDF files and everything that you just mentioned before class ended, right? That was the link that was in there this morning in the chat. Um, I think the link For this the morning. Drive. Here, I'll do the Google Drive right now. I think the link this morning was for the live um recording. Oh, okay. So it was but different. let me just I I I mean it's all relative, but let's do this just so that you guys have it. Sure. Oh my gosh, of course. I did copy. I'm, um, I did copy and paste it because every time you put something on the chat, I'll copy and paste it in my notes. Oh, but I didn't cool. open yet. <laughs> so then I have the file for next when I'm studying again. Oh my gosh, of course. Um, let 
Oops. So the Google Drive, let's just go in there. For those of you that are still here, I don't want to get off until you guys are feeling off the class okay, until yeah. you guys are feeling better. So this is the link that I gave you is for all of this. If you go into the principles folder, I tried to set it up in a manner that helps. So principles, uh, practices, or it should be practice, it's just one. Uh, legal mm -hmm. aspects, extra good stuff, and then live Q and A events. So anything we do live, any of our live account uh, live events will be here. Um, but if you go into principles, you should see the PDF books. I've I broke it down differently. Review material for the principles, and then the unit outlines are all the ones we went through together in a class. Okay. But this this uh, for review materials, you oh, have the, the PDF PowerPoint. version. Okay. Yeah, the PowerPoints, and then we have quizzes I haven't finished, and we've got Elisa's Quizlets in there as well. Um, but okay. you can, the the PowerPoint version of the unit reviews, and what I mean by that is, uh, we opened the PDF version, but this, the PowerPoints, these are the unit reviews at the back of the book, and I've set them up okay. in such a way, sorry, it's slow motion, not slow motion, okay, what is it called okay. in the computer? The computer and my teeth are not, are working in 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 tandem, and neither of them are working <laughs> well right now. And my tongue is tripping over my teeth, and so forth. It's taken a while to load. It's easier to go in through the PDFs than it is through the PowerPoint, but it doesn't. It's it's base. It's literally the same information. So you're just doing the you know economic system. We know it's capitalism. The value of all assets minus their liabilities would be which one uh, net worth because it's not gross because gross is before right the increase in market value and you can just keep going through and it gives you the answer and that's the definitions but if you go all the way on the bottom i also have the multiple choice in here and what i did was i okay. went back through to make sure that um you guys have the um um, so California economy is a large, is, is so large that it is actually, it actually completes with countries. California's economy is so large, that actually. And then you can see over here, it's only in California. There might be a, something here. We can go back in the book and review it. If you had a question about where it is in the book, I used to have the pages, but the thing is because we've had two editions since these were originally built. And then I had to build them again. <laughs> Um, I'm like, we're taking pages out and you can, you can look at the chapter re regard or the information in the chapter with regard to that, um, to try to benefit you guys and try to help a little bit further. I know it's a lot of information. Okay. Yeah, but I oh, think absolutely. we can do it. I mean, especially because it's open book and then Mark said the other day, being that it's open book, you review it more often as to, like you, while well, you go and look to see if, to verify your answers or to make sure they're correct, but at the same time. You, it's like repetitive reading so yeah. you can retain more well that's how I feel I don't know no, I others, I'm so, with you you know what I mean because oh, you no. see it and then you like I mean you write it I mean I don't know some people have to see it visually but then if you see it and then you're writing it and then reading it you're retaining a little bit from different directions to remember some of the information oh no absolutely and that's part of the reason why I'll tell it from my version because my version is mm -hmm. not going to be the same as the book version but mm -hmm. you, but again, it's that whole um, using all five senses to learn. Mm -hmm. If you go to the PDF, you don't have to download it. But if you do um, uh, uh, window, uh, window F, control F mm -hmm. or um, command F, you can put mm -hmm. in words like escrow. Oops, mm -hmm. that's if you don't know, escrow. Uh, yeah. Certain. If the question comes up and you're like, I don't remember what escrow is, but I need to spell escrow right. Yeah. And then that way, but but you might even find, why is it not working for me? Because Kathy's slow. That's why. No. no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. This is long like day already. Out. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't freaking out a little bit. But if you do Command F or Control F in the PDF, um, mm -hmm. and then put in um like a particular, you could even do a sentence like um close of escrow, and then it'll show you where that the way that's written is somewhere in there, and it might even bring up the exact same question at the answer in the answer key at the back, and you're like, oh, uh -huh. so it must be this question and the answer is right here, you know, um, mm -hmm. so um, that'll encourage you, but um, I don't want you guys to feel discouraged, and I really felt like Tuesday was discouraging, and I don't want you to ever leave my classes feeling that way, um, because it is important I, I need, I hope you understand it's important to me that you guys realize that, that I, that you're coming in and doing this, um, on some of you on your days off. And, um, I just want you to be, I want you to be equipped. So yes, thank you. Of course. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Um, thank you guys. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me today. 
I've, I've caught, well, the thing is, I don't feel like we, I met the, I met the requirements up to this point. So I want, I wanted to be able to, there aren't any requirements, but I know other people that have taken classes like that, where the teacher's like, well, good luck. Bye. You know, and they're, you're like, what, what, <laughs> what do you mean? Good luck. You know, and I don't want to be that kind of instructor and I'm not actually that kind of instructor. So um, what I'll do though, is if you guys have it, I'm going to stay until the last person jumps um, at, or leaves, I shouldn't say jumps. And, um, uh, uh, but I want, thank you. But I want you guys, any other questions, any other concerns? Is there an area we are feeling like, I don't know, or do you really kind of are like, Kathy, I'm going to need like an, a day to breathe. <laughs> I understand that too. Cause now you have that opportunity to take it and you've, you've experienced every aspect of the book, um, that could be asked of you for the exam. Oh yeah, absolutely. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. Those of you that have got to go. If you don't, okay, of course, absolutely. Thank you guys. You know, Farzana, holy cow, man, you came in the class after taking it and was like, okay, guys, this is what I got to tell you about this. Thank you. I think that was such a gift and a blessing. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, okay. I, I have a feeling that we don't have any questions. So we're gonna, we're just gonna end the day. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for chillaxing with me and uh, with um, Lovey. She wants to let you guys know that she's stretching. All right, tell them, tell them, tell them, say bye bye. Say, we did good. Can we do that? Do you want to tell them? What was the treat? Did you have peanut butter? Do you want to tell them? Oh, you just want kisses? <laughs> hmm, I know. Okay, well, guys, have, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do we tell them? We say bye bye. Have a good day. You want to tell them something for me? I'm getting all uh, camera shy. What's going on? Hmm? <laughs> all right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will see you all very soon. Come Tuesday next week or sooner. We can do a Zoom.